Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Chinese Studies Council here at Yale and U.S. College, I'd like to welcome you to our symposium on the history of overseas Chinese in Singapore. Let me first start with the obligatory reminder for everyone in the live audience to ensure that your cell phones are either turned off or muted. Today's event is a momentous one for us here at the college. In previous years, the Chinese Studies Council has organized many events focused on both Chinese history, literature, and philosophy, as well as on modern day Chinese politics, economics, and China's role in today's geopolitical world as an emerging superpower. Today, however, is the first time we've held an event focusing on the history of the Chinese and Chinese cultural influence right here in Singapore, thereby examining one of the major ethnic and cultural groups that have helped make Singapore what it is today. And it is an event, I think, that is long overdue. To that end, we've managed to assemble an exciting lineup of the foremost experts on the subject from across a number of institutions here in Singapore. And thanks to each of their gracious acceptance of our invitation to speak today, I'm confident that all of you are in store for what will prove to be a fascinating and memorable day of stimulating discussion. Today's event, as with all our events, would not be possible if not for the generous support of the Tanjin Tuan Foundation, which provides the funding for all the activities of our Chinese culture and civilization program here at Yale and US, and which is, a, is of course, uh, one of Singapore's leading foundations whose mission it is to provide for the achievement of measurable and sustainable outcomes in such areas as education and com community development not only here in Singapore, but throughout all of Southeast Asia. And I must add here that the foundation's founder, Tan Sri Tan Jin Tuan, was himself an integral part of today's story, a major figure in the overseas Chinese community here in the 20th century, having played a crucial role in establishing Singapore's Chinese banking and financial industry, indefinitely navigating that industry through the perilous times of the war in the Pacific, and through his chairmanship of innumerable committees in the service of both government and industry, in playing a leading role in making Singapore into the prosperous nation it has become. And as, as great as all of those achievements were, his incredible ph philanthropic worth, work uh, carried on today by his family certainly ranks right up at the top, and we are, remain ever grateful for their support. Finally, let me note that uh, in order to reach as wide an audience as possible, the working language for today's symposium is, is in English, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say at least a couple of words of uh, welcome in Chinese. So, we'll 在座及線上的觀眾,熱烈參與今天的討論。Now there are a number of other people that I need to thank for helping put today's event together, but as time this morning is short, I'm afraid I'm going to have to save those things for the end of the program. With that, uh, to turn now for some introductory remarks from someone who certainly knows uh, much more about Singaporean history than I do, and also because our keynote speaker, Professor Wang Gongwu, is such a towering figure, as to deserve an introduction by someone of greater stature than myself, I'd like to now hand things over to the president of our college and our own resident expert in the history of Singapore, among other places. Would you please welcome President and Professor Tan Taiyong. Good morning, uh, everyone, uh, and welcome to the symposium on the history of the overseas Chinese in Singapore. My Chinese is not as good as Scott's, so I'll only be speaking in English today. But this event is organized by the Yale NUS Chinese uh, Studies Council and supported by the Tan Chin Tuan Foundation. And I wish to acknowledge my uh, gratitude to the Tan Chin Tuan Foundation for its generosity in supporting the Chinese Studies Council's work in promoting the study of Chinese culture and civilization at the college. Uh, the council is headed by Professor Scott Cook, Tan Chin Tuan Professor of Chinese Studies, uh, who has been leading the charge in the promotion of Chinese studies at the college. Uh, one of his key initiatives is the multidisciplinary Chinese studies minor program uh, designed to foster an in-depth understanding of China, uh, both as a historical tradition, 
and as a modern nation with a wide ranging sphere of influence. While the Chinese studies courses and activities have served our students well, instilling in them knowledge, understanding and appreciation of Chinese language, culture and history, we feel that more can be done to extend the understanding of China and the Chinese world in relation to Singapore and Southeast Asia. This symposium aims to draw that connection by focusing on the history of the Chinese community in Singapore. In addition to an important discussion on migration, settlement, and the evolution of the Chinese community and its identity in Singapore, we hope to understand how identity and culture shape perceptions and in turn influence the tone and content of relations between Southeast Asia and China. We hope that this meeting will help us better conceptualize our Chinese studies program, making it more distinctive, valuable, and stimulating to our students. This is an ongoing effort on the part of the college to build something um, that is coherent, distinctive, and would leave a lasting impression on our students as they go through these courses and activities with us so that they can develop a deeper understanding of China, the Chinese world, and the larger context of relations between China and Southeast Asia. So I, I hope to uh, get your views, your advice, your insights on how we can do this better. And I wish to thank Scott and his colleagues in the Chinese uh, Studies Council for their ongoing effort in this regard and for organizing today's symposium. Well, it's good to see so many familiar faces in the speaker's lineup, and I'm truly grateful to all of you for giving so generously of your time today. We are especially honored by the presence of our keynote speaker, Professor Wang Gangwu. He needs little introduction in a gathering of this nature. In a long and illustrious career as scholar, teacher, and academic leader, Prof Wang has left very deep and lasting imprints in the broad field of Chinese and global history. He is guru and mentor to many of us, and all of us in this room are intellectually indebted to him in so many ways. As we know, Prof Wang is a prolific author, having written more than 20 books, and he doesn't stop writing. His most recent being Home Is Not Here, published in 2018, China Reconnects, published in 2019, and most recently with the late Margaret Wang, Home Is Where We Are, published last year. Prof Wang will be presenting his keynote address on Chinese in Singapore, Parallels, Continuities, What's New. Gives me great pleasure to invite Prof Wang to address us. Prof Wang, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tan Taeyong. I feel a little uneasy about uh, speaking to an audience for a change. I've been so used the last few months talking to a screen. So uh, forgive me if uh, sometimes I feel a little bit lost as to where I am. Uh, I'm delighted to be in this beautiful building. I've been here once before, but I've never had the privilege of uh, speaking here. And I thank Scott for inviting me and giving me a chance to do so. The subject, of course, is something that uh, is of great interest to all of us in, in Singapore. And the history of this question of the overseas Chinese in Singapore has been an intriguing one for lots of people for a long, long time. Indeed, there's a lot of history. And uh, the amount of the material now we do have about the Chinese in Singapore is really voluminous and it's gathering, uh, getting more and more all the time, contributed largely by some of the people in the audience here today. 
And uh, the focus that Scott has chosen to talk about things like education, identities, and in fact, way different ways of doing research, new ways of doing research on the subject, are both, all very intriguing. I don't uh, have the kind of expertise to go into the specifics of some of these areas, because uh, in fact, more people here know much more about the Singapore Chinese than I do. But I have always been fascinated by the place of Singapore in the region, the relationship in, between the Chinese here and the Chinese in China and the Chinese around the region for a long time now. And I would like to take this opportunity to look back a little and do some comparisons between the various communities. I'm struck, for example, by the fact that uh, we look, are looking at uh, a Singapore that has been identified as being quite unique. The only country in the world outside of the greater China area that, is, that has a Chinese majority and is run as a plural society. These are quite obviously distinctive features which cannot be found anywhere else and unlikely ever to be found anywhere else again. But given the fact that this is so, it is intriguing that the history of Singapore has never started quite like that. And the, the long history, of course, is, is, is well known now, but much better known than before. And we've taken mostly taken our history from the time when the British made it into the great port city that it has become from 1819. And that story itself of some 200 years is, uh, is extraordinary. But let me say that uh, the new perspectives that we now have of the period before 1819, I think gives us a little bit more depth to the place of Singapore in the region. The colonial and the Chinese accounts about how Singapore began, we now have a much better idea, although it was poorly recorded at the time and we had largely colonial accounts and then some very desultory notes about uh, the different groups of Chinese who had uh, turned up in Singapore. And it was not until the whole thing was pulled together by Song Wong Xiang that we have a, a larger picture and, with, and a continuous one. But that itself reminds us that the question of Singapore Chinese is linked closely to the question of the relationship between those who are settled and those who came to work here passing through, made most of them meaning to go somewhere else or going back to China. And that, that relationship between the settled, the local born, so to speak, and some local born for several generations, and those who came in and out and who came later. And the fact that the local born were overwhelmed by the mi migrants and the people who came later itself is a, was a unique feature of, of the of, of the time. So that period we have recorded and we have been, that been studied very well and we now might know much better about them than before. But then followed what was again quite extraordinary, but this is not unique to Singapore. This is what might be called the, the Nanyang perspective of a China that was equal, uh, that was finally conscious of the fact that they had lots and lots of Chinese spread out around Southeast Asia, the area they call Nanyang. Before that, of course, we all know the Ming and Qing dynasties uh, over some four or 500 years weren't terribly interested in the Chinese overseas. In fact, of course, officially banned them from leaving China. And those who left were only supposed to do trade and to go out and come back under very strict uh, supervision and control. So it was in that context where a new China conscious of the fact that there were Chinese spread around who could be useful to them, that they developed over a period of two or three decades, quite rapidly, a new Nanyang perspective of these temp Chinese who were temporarily abroad. And that period determined the shape of the Chinese who settled in Singapore, who were, came in, in and out of Singapore. Not many of them were really clear that the newcomers anyway, not many of them were really clear that they will stay in Singapore uh, and make their homes here. 
In fact, that was not at all clear until, in fact, until about 50 years ago, or about a little bit more than 50 years ago. And that fact alone creates a special relationship. The nine young Chinese decided that Singapore was the most central and valuable hub for the Nanyang community. And it, it served that purpose for, I would say, at least half a century. And it was a time when, of course, the question of education, identity, all these issues uh, were very much in the air. The Chinese who had settled down had to make choices. The ones who are passing through and who are just migrant here for, migrants here for work, uh, they, were, they didn't have to make the choice. They were Chinese and recognized as Chinese temporarily abroad. So that was clear. But that the, the, the pressure on the local born to make a choice and choose to identify with these new Chinese and a new consciousness of Chinese, China's position in the world, a new sense of nationalism, which was totally new to the Chinese, was a major pressure major problem for them. Incidentally, not only for those who are settled and local born, but even for those migrants who are here actively doing business or seeking, making a livelihood, even they had to make decisions then about involvement in what was happening in China. And the fact that events are moving so rapidly in China were forcing people to pay much more attention to China than they ever had before. Instead of just being interested in business, they now had to be interested in the political changes that were rapidly transforming China from a dynastic Confucian state into one that was a republic, modeling itself on the Western modern nations of, of, of Western Europe and the United States. And that stage, of course, being a Nanyang Chinese was a kind of new identity for the Chinese to, to look at and say whether they were or not. Uh, some were given no choice. In fact, by law in China, the national position was that everybody born of a Chinese father was a Nanyang Chinese. And this, of course, created a tension between those who had settled or those who did not intend to return that rapidly or to identify with the politics of China to have to make big choices and affected their acti activities. In, 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 in Singapore. The changes after the war was even more significant. Suddenly the colonial powers were gone. The Chinese were faced with new nation building efforts on behalf of local nationalists who had different ideas of what the, what the Chinese should be allowed to do and why and why not stay in, in their countries. The choices were, a different set of choices had to be made. And that, of course, was a period which uh, lasted for about half a century too, starting from just before the war to at least the 1960s and 70s, when the tension was still on. It was not until the question of the Cold War itself, the ideological war, which didn't, didn't involve the Southeast Asia that much directly, but was above their heads. And because China had become communist after 1949, put the Chinese in Southeast Asia in a very awkward position for quite a while. That part of the story, I think you're all familiar with. What is so interesting to me is that the decisive moment when Singapore changed its future altogether, all that time, and I mentioned it, all that period that we talked about, Singapore is just simply a port city, either under some local Malay, Johor Empire jurisdiction, the Dutch and the British arguing about where Singapore should belong. And then the British colonial rule, very successful rule, making Singapore an increasingly important port city in the region. But that period, always based on the idea that Singapore was part of something else, either a part of the British Empire, part of an Anglo-Dutch agreement about how to deal with the region, or part of Malaya. And this final stage of being part of Malaya, or British Malaya, from at least the late 19th century and through to the, up to 1945 and on to 1957, was the overhanging identity problem for the Chinese, uh, an identification with Malaya. And this is interesting that the Chinese were probably more ready to identify 
that Malaya that included Singapore than almost anybody else. They were very, very keen. In fact, I was always struck by the fact that the Chinese used the word Malaya from the 1920s onwards very cheerfully. And in fact, the first political party, really active political party in this part of the world was the Malayan Communist Party that the Chinese had founded. And that they used the word Malaya, identifying with Malaya from very beginning. But that Malaya always included Singapore. So Singapore in a way never was given a sense of its own identity all that time. It was meant to be part of something British and then something Malayan. And that period, of course, gave a particular coloring to the way the Chinese were settling in, in Singapore. The local born in their relationship with this concept of Malaya changed significantly, of course, because of Singapore itself, but it was even more significant vis-a-vis -vis the larger entity called Malaya. And the question again of this local born, their identi identification with Malaya, and the whole educational experience experiences of changing political circumstances became very relevant. For myself, what is really fascinating was once Singapore was separated from Malaya, the idea that Singapore was really quite different and Malaya had to go without Singapore and become Malaysia, something else altogether, then the question of the Singapore Chinese history actually changes shape altogether. The focus changes, the nature of that history itself began to change a sense of the Chinese in Singapore was a different story altogether from the Chinese of Malaya or the Chinese of Nusantara or the Chinese of Nanyang or the Nanyang Chinese. All those perspectives were shifted once Singapore became independent. But even more significant was that independence of a, of a new country, a new republic that had a Chinese majority, but did not want to be a Chinese state who insisted on being a plural society of migrant peoples, what added another dimension to the story, which led to, again, a completely new set of premises as to how this Singapore was to be. And it was interesting also for the first few decades of this Republic, there was an actual reluctance to study the history of the Chinese of Singapore. And the reasons for this are very complex. I won't go into that. Many of you here are familiar with that, but I just want to draw attention to the fact that this tension lasted for about 30, 30 years or so. It was not until the 18, uh, 1990s that you have a really fresh start in looking at the settled people, the local born of Singapore, a different lot of local born altogether. Not the local born that we now identify as Baba or Pranakan, but the local born Singaporean, a Chinese Singaporean, a, 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 People who are now have memories, but only memories of what it was like before. And then what we find so interesting is a fresh start to the study of the history of the Chinese in Singapore in a very different context. And I think we're reaching a, a tremendously exciting period now. I mean, we all noticed in the last few years, the history of the general history of the Chinese of Singapore, first in Chinese and then in English, both the two editors are here in the audience. And that is, to me, a sort of climax, a, mark, a new mark, as it were, as to where the history of the Chinese of Singapore has now reached. But it is important to remind us that this is a really a new start. It was really a different kind of history of the Chinese that we've, we read about before 1965. In fact, we had very little between 1965 and 1995, in my view. Very uncertain and uneasiness uh, around about how to deal with the question of Chineseness in Singapore. The recovery from that to understand that this new position is to stay and that this is a completely legitimate and not only legitimate, a necessary position for the historians of Singapore to take that the Chinese of Singapore is a different story altogether today is I think an exciting moment for all of us to, to bear in mind. What I have to say today about parallels, continuities, and uh, what's new uh, draws upon this background. And I let me just briefly say that by parallels, I really mean parallels, but different. Similarly with continuities, continuities in a new frame, so to speak. 
And finally, I'll ask the question, what's new? These are questions actually very much in my mind. So I, I, I'm not sure that all of you are interested in the same kind of questions that uh, I, I am interested in, but they, these are issues very much in my mind. So what I'm going to say to you is not because I've done the, all the work necessary to, to give you the answers. What I'm really offering is a, a sharing of my thoughts and the questions in my mind of how to deal with issues like parallels and continuities. Let me start with parallels. I say parallels, but different. And to make it easier for me to, to start to, to focus on the subject, I take on the question of the local born and the, the people who came, the, the newcomers, the Sinkha from outside. That, that relationship, I think, gives us a good start to recognize the parallels. Because this, of course, was not a peculiar to Singapore at all. All over Nanyang, the Southeast Asian region, the same thing was happening. Local born and the newcomers. And the relationship between the two can be found in each of the countries that uh, constitute the, the Southeast Asian countries today. And then there's, then the moment, moment you start comparing them, you realize that there were marked differences. But let me say what they start, started out more or less the same. In other words, they started out as people who had no backing from their own state, for their own country. They were all on their own virtually, as of different groups of merchants and with, uh, with, with some workers helping them to set up businesses around the, around the region. And they, they were particularly successful in gaining the confidence of local rulers, whether they were Malays, Thais, or Vietnamese and others, they served their purposes by linking their businesses with the business interests of the rulers. And they created something like a, a capitan system. I mean, we don't, they didn't use the word then, but it was a, a kind of indirect rule whereby the Chinese rule themselves with the fa in, in the favor of the, of, the, of the eyes of the monarchs, whether they were sultans, uh, kings of Thailand and so on. That relationship remained and that was the basis on which the Portuguese, the Dutch later on, created the Capitan system as a way of giving autonomy to a set of Chinese leaders who are made responsible for their own community, whereas it, they were quite distant and separate from the from direct rule of the rulers themselves. And I think the colonial government found that also useful. They didn't have enough officials to, to control everything anyway. And it was, uh, they did it for almost all the communities. Each one has its own capitan, so to speak. But with the Dutch, who were the most ambitious in creating a, a colonial empire, much more so than the, the Portuguese uh, at the time, uh, whom they were, they were rivals, they actually made that system into a much more important system because they were primarily concerned with developing a trade with China. They were very much interested in getting into the Chinese market and they found the Chinese community tremendously valuable for them and therefore gave tremendous authority to the Chinese capitans or mayors or lieutenants, whatever they call them, to look after their own community and make sure that their community all were on the same page as it were when dealing with the colonial and Dutch interests in the trade of Southeast Asia, as well as with China. And that was a very special relationship. I think we, 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 we have enough material now to say that that was itself quite different from anything that was happened before. But there was one difference, and then it goes to show that these parallels where Chinese were without backing from their own state and seeking new, as it were, leaders to follow, rulers to follow. And that was the case of the Philippines. And of course, the Philippines has always been an exception in our part of the world for many reasons, but largely because the was a Spanish that linked them up with the Latin American countries across the Pacific and pulled them away from the Southeast Asian region for quite a while. But when you look at it, then you can see that these parallels, because different people are involved, the Chinese themselves responded differently, behaved differently, and organized themselves differently. And in the end, if you take again the parallels of the local born, and you find, for example, uh, sharp differences between the Chinese in Thailand, who relate, related to the royal house, whether after, before and after Taksin in the Chakri dynasty, and in the Philippines, 
between the Spanish and the, the change over to the Americans. How the Chinese responded were very quite distinct from the rest of the region. But even from within the Malay world itself, the Nusantara area, all the, the whole of the Malay world, because of differences between the British and the, and the Dutch, there were also significant differences. But the most important difference, I suppose, one should recognize was the question of religion. And that is that in the case of the Philippines, the, the Philippines were actually run very much by the Catholic Church in, co in, co in cohorts with the Spanish governor. And that, of course, determined the way the Chinese responded to the, the local born Chinese had to become Catholics in order to own property. They had intermarried locally and they became closer and closer to the local community as mestizos, but different mestizos, not the Spanish mestizos, but the Chinese mestizos, but sharing some of the uh, legal rights that the, the Spanish uh, mestizos had. And in that way, distinguishing themselves from the local Indios, but nevertheless, still Chinese in the eyes of the Spanish and the, and the Spanish mestizos, but so different from the Chinese elsewhere. And if you want to bring in the question of comparative, uh, comparative religions involved, then you see that for the Chinese in places like Vietnam and Thailand and, and Myanmar, this was not an issue, but it was very much an issue with the Muslims in the Malay world. And that became the basis on which the Pranakan or the Babas of uh, Indonesia and Malaysia shaped its, its sense of identity, which is so dis distinct again, quite remarkably different from the uh, identities of all the other local born Chinese in, in other parts of Southeast Asia. We have even, these have different names. I mean, Chinoy in the Philippines, Lok Chin in Thailand, or, or in, the, in the case of the Vietnamese, they even had a very special name from the early Chinese who settled there. They called them the Ming Xiang, the Min Hyung, uh, which uh, for us today, they don't use them in the term anymore because they've all become Vietnamese. And indeed, in the case of Vietnam, they have become Vietnamese. In the case of Thailand, they have more or less become Thais. In the case of the Philippines, they have become actually identified with the Filipino. That is, uh, the, and that the newcomers, the ones who don't entirely uh, identify with the Filipino are, are latecomers who came in only after the 19th century. So the 19th century change in migration patterns, of course, did affect the, the, new, the future development of the local bond. The local bond became very different. But the first batch of local born, it's themselves local born, but to call them all Chinese could be very misleading because they do very, actually very, very, diff very different. I mean, it's impossible for us to say that the Baba and the, 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 the Filipino mestizos, the Chinese mestizos in the Philippines had that much in common at that time. And yet in every, in every sense, the self-identification as, as having been of Chinese stock or bearing Chinese cultural uh, heritage and belonging to the, the Chinese family of, and, and some link, they, however vague, with the culture in China remain distributed around in very different proportions. And this itself, the proportions of Chineseness and the nature of the Chinese uh, qualities that were selected to, to be retained and did actually succeed in uh, and continuing in the region is, is a tough, fascinating story. Only in the Malay world, particularly in the, the Malay states of, uh, uh, in, in this part of the, between Malaysia and, and the Sumatra Java area, that you have a, a very clear case of Chinese religion playing a major role in determining the, the local born's sense of identity with, with China. No language to speak of, no language spoken in the home, food, clothing, especially among the women folk were transformed. But what, retained, what was retained was certain Chinese religion features of the society, which did not survive in either the Philippines or Thailand, uh, Somewhat, some of it did survive in, the Vietnam, in Vietnam, but not for long. They, they were Vietnamized, as it were, very quickly. So that itself, the distinctive Chinese religion effect 
on local identity uh, made the story of Singapore different because Singapore was in the middle of it. And it was, in fact, as most people would agree, the, the Singapore began by having these local born, Chinese religion based, and not directly influenced by events or developments in China who were determining the shape of a new local Chinese community. Uh, Self-identifying as Chinese, very proud to be Chinese, and in fact, necessarily do, doing so because it was as Chinese that they were most useful to the Dutch and the British at the time. And, and their status in that, that these two areas became, in fact, strongly uh, supported by the colonial rulers themselves. The business interests also were changing, but I, I don't want to go into the details of that, but it's enough to notice how the Chinese operated in the Malay world, in fact, as very important uh, arbiters between the Dutch and the Malay, uh, Malay Javanese uh, peoples in the area, whereas elsewhere, this was not the case. Yeah, elsewhere in Thailand, they were really operating as agents of the, of the king himself. And of course, in the, in, the, in the Philippines, they were operating quite separately uh, or from, from both the Spanish mestizos and, and the Indios, and, uh, and had a special relationship with the Fujian, with their homeland in the Fujian, in Fujian, in Chuenzhou in particular, in a very narrowly focused area of Chuenzhou in particular, that was quite unique and cannot be found anywhere else. So these are parallels. They were all Chinese coming out of the same areas of Fujian and Guangdong, but performing very different roles, responding differently to their ruling elites, and emerging as different kinds of Chinese in the region. And I think this is important because Singapore then stood out slowly, gradually, coming out of all these differences, came out in a very special way, as I will now go on to describe. The Nanyang Chinese then became the focus of the new 20th century set of developments where, where both colonization and decolonization occurred. And in the nation building process, the challenge to the Chinese to somehow settle in this, in this area. Now, this is a, a story by in itself. I won't go into the details of that. Enough to say that it is here where the relationship between the local born Babas or straight Chinese and the newcomers, Xinka, who very soon outnumbered them, out business, out, out traded them, and became dominant in the whole commercial world. And therefore, gaining enough uh, leverage to ease the, the local born gradually away from their dominant position that they held in the late 19th century. And now we come to after 1950. These, the, once you reach that point when Singapore was on that tip between joining Malaya or not joining Malaya, this transformation, of course, affected everybody in Singapore. It did not affect the other people so much. Nobody cared at the time. It was, after all, a larger, larger story was about, was, uh, was about to unfold a Cold War involving ideological giants like the United States and the Soviet Union, and China was involved, and China's shift from the Soviet Union to the United States in the 1970s, all these had consequences, and I don't need to go into that. But I think what is important was the myth of a Nanyang Hua Chao community that the Chinese government wanted to present, that all these Hua Chao born of Chinese fathers who are one and the same people and, and should belong to China, and China was responsible for all of them, was really quite a myth. When you really look down at the, at the details, uh, each community was functioning differently. But interestingly enough, the most loyal and most openly supportive of closer relations with the government of China were those in Malaya and Singapore. The reasons were quite obvious. They were the only areas where the Chinese numbers were growing faster than anyone expected. And in fact, by the, by the uh, 1950s, 
what was alarming to the you know, to indigenous uh, aristocracies of the area was the fact that the Chinese population was, including Malay and Singapore, was half, in fact, possibly even more than half of the population. So that's a major change. And now take me finally to the con continuities. I would be very brief here because the new frames are obvious. First of all, we have now a set of self-identifications which are remain for the local born, but the identification by others as Chinese was now politically sensitive. Do we wish to be identified as Chinese in the course of nation building in the region? Uh, the continuities of being Chinese now dominated by the question of education, who is in charge of education? I know there are tremendous studies on education and the political sensitivities about education are, are really quite uh, extraordinary and, and very delicate subjects indeed. But the fact, the major point to bear in mind is that the private sources of education were slowly being edged out by the determined efforts of new nations to control the education programs. Singapore is no different. In fact, Singapore was probably the most efficient and most politically uh, determined to control the education process than almost any other country in the, in the region. And so, and that is a story by itself, and I could go on, but I think I'm running out of time. I won't go into that now, except to say that this question of who controlled the education, who determines what is Chineseness in itself? I mean, we, we have tremendous arguments about what is Chineseness. First, the Chinese have one view, other people have different views, but often it is forgotten that in each country of Southeast Asia, in particular, although true elsewhere as well, in each country in Southeast Asia, those people who self-identify as Chinese actually re, re, uh, re, re, uh, treat, uh, regard Chineseness very differently than the others. And that difference itself, I think, is worth looking at very closely. Why certain kinds of Chinese characteristics are valued more and valued less somewhere else is something that I think needs further study. And I wish I could have more time to, to talk about that. But I think I better leave it now to just bring, make, make, go back to my the point that I will lead to what is new. Number one, what is new is that wherever the Chinese are, if they settle, and, the, and now the local born are no longer the Babas or the Chinois of the past, but a really a different kind of Chinese who are modern, who are responding to the nationalisms that they have identified with in their new, new citizenship in the new nations, and what they see as Chinese in China. Because what we can't get away from is the fact that China was changing so rapidly. And the rise of China within a few decades to a position of being regarded as a superpower, economic superpower, or something nobody expected. And that itself has a, I would say, tremendous impact on how people are thinking, even though they may not articulate that, that problem uh, openly, but the fact that they're responding to the changing nature of China is no longer a weak or a traditional state. It is now a modern, highly scientific and technologically clued up, financially and economically, in, on par with almost almost all the powerful economies of the world, capable of, in fact, reaching out every, in every direction and tremendously focused now on something that they had never focused on before. And that is that China's security and economic and in fact, ultimately national interest was in the maritime uh, realm. The fact that they used to depend on continental power was no longer relevant. The fact that need to be a maritime power has become uppermost in the minds of the Chinese planners. That itself has got fundamental impact as it were on the whole region and not least on those who still see themselves as Chinese one way or the other or who are seen by others and not least by the Chinese government itself in its programs of influencing and relating to the countries in the region as identifying those Chinese in the region, no matter how they see their Chineseness, as being essential part of China's relations with all these countries. That these Chinese who are new nations and these new nations have a role to play is without doubt. 
whether their role is to serve their nations first or to ultimately serve China is, 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 is a question mark now, being, a question being asked by many powers. I don't doubt that the localized Chinese who have identified the new nations will serve their nation first. But at the same time, to serve their nation, or the greatest service is to help their nations develop a good relationship, particularly a good economic relationship with China. And that task itself is so sensitive and so open to misunderstanding and misperception that it's always going to be a delicate task for the Chinese. And how this local bond, new local bond, not the old Barbas now, the new local bond, Singapore Chinese, respond to that has been studied by everybody. People are paying great attention, not least, in fact, I would say, the Chinese authorities in China, wondering what is the next stage for, for the region. So among these things, what again, I can make a long list of what's new, but let me limit myself to a few things. I emphasize that Singapore is unique in a Chinese majority state that did not want to be Chinese and want to insist on a plural society, global city approach to a new kind of nationhood, which nobody quite see how know how to define, that is the Singapore dilemma, as it were. Now, given that dilemma, the new coming relationships with China, whether it's from new migrations, new developments in business, new political relationships, diplomatic and otherwise, the nature of the region itself, all that has, co has come to play. Again, I can go on making a long list, but I will not go into that, but concentrate on now on the question of Singapore in the region. Up to now, Singapore has always been seen as one hub in the chain of hubs that linked up the global economic system and created, established by the British, adopted by the whole of the American world order today, that the international order today, and seen as being a very valuable position for Singapore to retain. Yet at the same time, the fact that the rivalries between the two competing powers today of the United States and China is focused so much on the South China Sea, on the, on the fact that they, they, they have now looked upon the, the dominance, the hegemon position in these two oceans of the Indian and Pacific Ocean places Singapore in a new position. It, it still remains part of that global chain of global hubs, as it were, of port cities, except that it is an independent, and, and an independent republic, somewhat different. But what is even more interesting is that it has also become the hub, not just of a chain, the hub of Southeast Asia itself, the so-called ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Here, I think, is a very interesting, mutually uh, existential problem between Singapore and the nine other members of ASEAN. For the first time in history, this is now seen as a region, never before. I mean, the other people looked at the region for their own conveniences, but today, the nations in the region look upon itself as a potentially powerful region that can have a role to play in all the new developments of the, of the 20, 20, 21st century. And here, the location of Singapore changes its, its nature altogether. It's more than just a, a, a part of a chain, one in the link in, in a part of a chain. It is the hub of ASEAN. And it knows that it can, use, it can be used to serve ASEAN extremely well if it wanted to be. On the other hand, it can only survive now by being part of that region. It cannot hope to survive simply by being part of a global chain. That, that used to be possible when the hegemons were in London or New York and the chain was global, that was possible. But today it is not because the, the, the power dynamics of the last few years have made it very obvious that the, the economic center of, of economic activity is now moving to the, to the Asian region. And therefore, the regional role of ASEAN has totally been changed. And Singapore's position has changed even more because of that, because its dependence on that regional success and the autonomy of the region 
becomes absolutely vital. In that context, the, the Chinese Singaporean now has to face a new set of potentially explosive issues, but potentially also tremendously vital to the future success of Singapore. Its unique position has actually increased. If, if one can make uniqueness even more unique, this is an extraordinary situation where the fact that Singapore has this particular uh, uh, groupings of peoples linked up with all the neighborhood, in the whole neighborhood, and yet at the same time with a majority interest in being Chinese and being capable of relating to everything that is Chinese and becoming part of this competitive force against the hegemon of the region, all these have now become issues which are troubling not only uh, the two superpowers, but also all the countries in the region. And how Singapore survives in that so much depends on the wisdom of the leadership of those Singaporean Chinese, or to put it even more starkly, Chinese Singaporeans who, who, played, who played that role in the future is a, a matter of tremendous concern to everybody. In that context, the history of the overseas Chinese in Singapore is not just a history of any overseas Chinese. It's a history of a particular group of Chinese who have become e increasingly peculiar to itself and has an increasingly distinctive role to play in world affairs. And this part, I think, needs us to better understand the long history of how the Singapore, the Chinese Singaporean evolved as a small local born community into the now something like three or four million local born community that makes Singapore today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wong, for a fascinating talk that really placed the, uh, set the stage for the entire symposium, and, uh, placing the Singapore, Singaporean Chinese within the long history of, of the Nanyang Chinese and bringing that right up to the present. I'm sure uh, you, all of you have uh, many questions you'd like to ask. We have about uh, a little over 15 minutes or so for, for Q&A. So I'll take some, uh, we'll take some questions from the audience, um, as well as uh, those of you who are watching uh, via Zoom can also use the uh, chat function to to send questions and we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, so I'll let me uh, now uh, open the floor for, for questions. Yes, please. Well, thank you, Prof Wang, <clears throat> for that uh, insightful address. Could I ask you to extrapolate here? <clears throat> you have surely on referred. I, I'm a bit hard of hearing. I rather you spoke without, the, so yeah, I can hear you properly. Yeah. Uh, earlier on, you talked about China's awareness pushing of this washout of Singapore of the Chinese communities in the region as unique and one whole. This washout. Uh, how would you see that today? Does Beijing still see <clears throat> Singapore? All of us Chinese in Southeast Asia as one one child community, or is Beijing aware, as you are saying, of the diverse and different uh, affinities, identities of each of us? One of the fascinating things about uh, the relationship between uh, the people in China, the leaders of China, and the Chinese communities outside, and not least in Singapore, is the fact that the Chinese leadership has always had difficulties understanding what the Chinese are like outside of China. Uh, I, this, is not a, this is not a criticism, it's simply the fact that they have too many problems of their own for, all, for too, too long. They have never paid much attention in the past. In fact, they paid no attention until the 20th century. And, and the attention they paid to the, in the 20th century or the second half of the 19th century onwards has been to make use of the Chinese know-how, their wealth, and their connections to help China develop 
So the concentration of all is on China's interests. Uh, there was very little interest in what the, the Chinese themselves were doing in Southeast Asia, except for among a few scholars. The political leadership did at one time pay some attention, but again, on how to make use of the Chinese expertise and networks to help China rather than be interested in what the Chinese were like out there. What is interesting is that in the last two or three decades, there has been really serious efforts for the first time among more and more in the, of the leadership, particularly in the provincial leadership in the South, but also in Beijing, uh, the expert, expert groups in Beijing, who now really do want to understand better what these Chinese are, are like in Southeast Asia. As they come to realize that the vast majority of them are now local born and identify with the new nations. And most of them are actually quite passionately loyal to their new nations today and are serving in various capacities in those new nations. How to identify these and, and pinpoint their interests and their willingness or capacities or ability to be of help to China uh, is a problem that they now take very seriously. And they realize that they themselves have not understood these Chinese well enough in the past. They took for granted that they were Chinese, therefore certain things you can expect the Chinese to do. They now realize that that's no longer true. And the local born Chinese are very, very different from the Chinese in China today. They're now re realizing that how different and how varied they are in the different parts of the region, they still have to grasp uh, more, 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 uh, more firmly. But that has led them to do something that they should have done way, way back. And that is to understand the countries in Southeast Asia themselves. They never bothered because it broadly, they were just colonized by the British, the French and the Americans and so on. But now that they're independent countries and each of them have different, very different goals, different national interests, have political systems that are very different. Um, some, some in fact, so different that on the one hand, like Vietnam, which is more like the Chinese uh, kind of system, to Myanmar, which is now, as you can see, back to a military system. Thailand has tremendous military impact. Indonesia is hovering between democracy and I think military uh, intervention too. I think we have to recognize that possibility. And the, and the very special position of the three British areas of Malaysia, Brunei, and Singapore. And yet, and Singapore in particular, totally different because of its large, huge Chinese uh, origin, uh, Chinese Singaporeans. So they are now beginning to realize they can't simply talk about the Chinese and dealing with the Chinese. They have to recognize the national interests of all these 10 very different countries and recognize that their beginning to be of any influence in the region does not depend on their relations with the Chinese as they used to think, but depend on their relations with those nations. And to enable those nations to trust their citizens of Chinese origin so that these Chinese, uh, ethnically Chinese nationals can serve their countries in helping to improve relations between them and China. The layers of understanding today, which were never there before in China, is now evolving and, and taken very much more seriously. And I think will continue to be very seriously uh, uh, developed in, in, in the future. And that is something, again, that Singaporean Chinese and others and, and the governments of Southeast Asia must take great care to understand what, what is precisely the China, what are the Chinese steps to try and re reframe their relationship with Southeast Asia with that understanding, the role of the Chinese, what they can and cannot do with those of Chinese origin in the region, something that I think they still have a long way to go before they can understand. Uh, thanks for that question, Professor Kwa. And uh, we'll take one more question from the live audience before we turn to uh, to the online audience. Yeah, Professor Lo, uh, Mr. Lo. Hi, Professor Wang. Uh, this is a question regarding uh, different types of Chineseness, uh, particularly among the uh, within Southeast Asia. So you mentioned that, and you also talked about how um, the self-identity of Chinese-ness is related to, or is linked to how the Chinese in Southeast Asia perceive China 
So my question is, uh, could you elaborate a little more about how you think the rise of China uh, in the past uh, few decades have affected the self-identification of Chineseness uh, within different Southeast Asian countries? That is a very big question. I, 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 I actually started to, to look at it some time ago, but it is much bigger than I, I can quote myself. I think we need a team of people to go around the region to have an understanding of that. It really stems from the fact that I think there is a, the, the conception of arguing about what is Chineseness was placed wrongly. They are always argued in trying to essentialize Chinese, to find out what is the core, the essence of Chinese. That is a very abstract, philosophical, anthropological kind of study. What I think really we're up against is how different groups of Chinese scattered around the world understand the part of China or the things that are Chinese, things Chinese that they still identify with or want to retain. And that varies enormously as I, just a few tests here and there, even around this region, I found that the differences are so great. I mean, what the, what the Chinese in, in Bangkok or Chinese in Manila think about what is, what parts of Chineseness that they, they, they should look out for is so different from what the Singaporean Chinese would be interested in. And if you, if you go around and realize how different they are, then you see that this whole debate about Chineseness has been based on certain false assumptions that if you identify the essence of Chineseness, then you'll be able to, to understand how people behave. I think it's, just, it's a wrong way around. It actually should be the other way around. How self-identification, what choices do you make? You have actually made, you have choices. Each, each one of us makes choices about how Chinese, in what way am I Chinese, how I relate to it. I may relate to it in terms of language and literature, of art and culture and other cultural uh, uh, artifacts, but other people might relate it in terms of political identity and the system of government or completely reject it. The opposite can, be, can happen. The regard that is totally unacceptable, not a way of life that I want to have anything to do with it. And yet I am Chinese and I identify with other parts of China. So the variations are just enormous. And I think this is something that still needs to be done. In fact, I do hope now new generations, they are, they are beginning to do this, but not so systematically that I can understand it. So for, I'm struggling to understand the variety of what people identify with as Chinese around the place. And it's quite interesting. I mean, take a very simple example. I talked just now about Chinese religions was what locked the Baba community into a, a sense of Chineseness for at least 200 years. And that is very peculiar. Chinese elsewhere did not do that. And what are the reasons for that? And why have they given it up? When they gave it up, they became Christians, Catholics, Protestants, or they became, a few became Muslims in some countries. Others have just become secular, totally secular, modern, science and technology, business, forget about religions, and of, if anything, more interested in the connections of secular material interests in, in wealth making and, and business, international, global, economic uh, institutions. So something else is happening all the time. And how you separate these, how, do, how that Baba identification of Chinese religions, once you broke free from that, the directions in which that community went is in itself fascinating. Not to say all the other new local bonds the new local bonds are those who are born in Singapore since 1950, let's say. And they are identified very differently. They don't have that Baba background at all. They never totally identified with Chinese religions. They're always a mixed crowd, including people who identified with the May Force movement, with, with progressive ideas in China, with socialism, communism, and all sorts of other things. And not even, uh, not even forgetting that there are small groups of them who still identify with Confucianism. Perhaps, again, even there, the complications are enormous. Those who identify with Confucius as a philosopher, those who identify with various Confucian practices, and those who identify with practices which can be described as Confucian, but really have nothing much to do with Confucianism. So the whole range. So if you start to dissect and look at each part separately, you realize this whole concept 
of identifying with Chinese and what is Chinese is really a very open question that we haven't even begun to fully understand. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Amberly, do you have any questions from the online audience? Hello. Yeah, um, we have quite a few questions coming in. So one interesting one is from uh, Lin Wong. Uh, Lin asks, what is the new role of Chinese clan associations now in remaining relevant to Singaporean Chinese and better position us in the world with two superpowers? I need some help. Can you tell me what it is? Shall I, shall I repeat it with my mask off? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, we have a question from Lin Wong. Lin asked, what is the new role of Chinese clan associations now in remaining relevant to Singaporean Chinese and better position us in the new world with two superpowers? Singapore Chinese associations. Again, uh, on, I'm very fascinated by how different kinds of Chinese associations have been uh, established, how some are revivals of traditional associations, but not very successfully in my view. And in fact, many of them do not attract the young people, are mainly holdovers from the past, some with great nostalgia, some for very clear uh, personal interests. Uh, there, there's a whole, again, the whole range is different. That the active associations that really matter today are quite frankly those that have specific goals related to either political or economic ends. Uh, and and some, in some cases, social, social, uh, social uh, contacts and social cohesion is a factor, but I think economic and political ends are the, are the major reasons why associations are being created today. And those most successful ones are those who are more focused on clear political and economic objectives. And in that context, how these associations behave in different countries, again, are extraordinary. Again, I was surprised to see the range of associations that were revived after Suharto was, uh, was removed. New democratic uh, uh, processes uh, were introduced in Indonesia and the Chinese reorganized, reorganized many of the old associations, but with different functions, with different goals in mind, using institutions which have historical roots, but using them for totally different reasons for how those associations used to have before. So again, I, I, this, I've not done enough work on this to know where, where all this is leading to. All I would suggest is that we, we know this is happening, and I think it's important for us to, again, trace all the different groups again, not just to take them at, at their word that they're just another traditional organization, but to see what they're actually doing today as compared to what they were able to do. I mean, the perfect example in Singapore, and I, I know it's a sensitive subject, but let me just mention it, is the Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. I mean, when you recall how powerful the Chamber of Commerce was in the 19, 20, from 1904 to, to 1950s and 1960s, and then you look at what it is doing today, totally different function. But in many ways, it is structured in familiar ways. It looks the same. It is a beautiful building and people gather there for similar reasons. But underlying it all, the nature of that association, its functions in the society, its economic role, its political connections with the rest of Chinese society, totally different from what it used before. So under the same label, the substance of what they do has changed quite radically in some cases. So I would like to sit, look at these associations, uh, I think more closely at what they really are doing today. They may have the same name, but I think it would be wrong for us to assume that they're performing the same function. So I, can't, I cannot generalize on that because I, I've only begun to pay more attention myself, but I do know some people have studied this and I, I hope what, in the course of the discussion, other people who know more about this will give us specific examples. We're just about out of time. If anybody has one last burning question they want to ask. Uh, okay, yeah, one last one. Let's make it quick and then uh, back there in the back row. Hello, thanks for four. Uh, I was always thinking about a question. Uh, it's like 
does the identity and the inner classification of the dialect group disappear? Uh, if so, how did the like the overseas Chinese people locate themselves? If not, how did the boundary transfer? That's my question. Dialect group. Dialect group. Well, as someone who who deeply regretted the uh, steady suppression of the dialect speaking peoples of Singapore, I actually welcome the affirmation of dialects uh, that is going on. Uh, to, but at the same time, I recognize that it may be too late for some families anyway. I met people of uh, maybe your generation who, who are fewer and fewer of your generation actually speak the dialect or even want to now. They can barely communicate with their grandparents uh, in, the, in dialect, and they are actually much more comfortable in Putonghua or for even more comfortable possibly in English, but they, they no longer wish to return to that. So I, all I can say is that I, I, I regret that uh, that happened. I, I actually wish dialects had remained, it'd be much richer to the, uh, to the languages, uh, to, the lang to the Chinese language itself in Singapore, and would have made it even more distinctive if there were major contributions from the various dialect groups towards a new, newly, uh, newly fr a fresh, China, Singaporean Chinese, as it were, to emerge. And this, of course, takes us a long way. The whole question of language and how it works it takes us a long way. I was uh, thinking very much of an, an analogous uh, position of how Baba Malay was regarded by the Malays, by Chinese who, who thought that these people who can't speak Chinese uh, are certainly really, uh, more Malay than Chinese and, and, and various opinions to the much simpler debate, but very fascinating debate over Singlish. Because in a way, Singlish is the equivalent of like Baba Malay in the, in the Malay world. Singlish is to the English, uh, the standard English speakers, uh, their, their attitude towards it. And yet uh, it, has, it has a role to play, but can it survive and how can it survive? And will it, will it have to be uh, something to be formally accepted, or it would just be allowed to evolve like all dialect groups or uh, uh, slang, slang languages, which can evolve naturally. As a linguist would like to say, this is a good thing, it's a natural thing, let people evolve and these words will become eventually part of a new vocabulary and actually enrich the vocabulary of English in this part of the world. Now, all these are fascinating things. I do not know how they will end up to. All I'm saying is that, Language should not be, again, imposed in a very strictly regulated, grammatically correct form at all times. That's all right for certain purposes, official purposes, and so on. But for natural evolution of language among people who speak it as a first language, particularly as a first language, and how they speak naturally, uh, should not be looked upon as either correct or incorrect. I, I'm on the side of the linguists here in saying that that is something should be allowed to evolve quite naturally and see how what it comes out at the, at the other end. It, it may not be what you like, but it may be very enriching to the imagination and the creativity of new generations of users. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm afraid we'll have to bring the session to a close. So um, let's let's thank Professor Wang uh, once again for a, a terrific uh, opening keynote lecture to, to start our symposium off. So now we're gonna we'll take about a 25 to 30 minute coffee break and reconvene at 10:45. Uh, um, those uh, presenters, please come with me we'll, we'll, for, for a brief photo. For the rest of you, I'm afraid there's not really any coffee in this coffee break um, due to COVID regulations and all. But um, anyway, we'll look forward to seeing you all uh, back in about uh, 25 minutes or so. Thank you. Oh, welcome back, everybody. Um, and now that we'll proceed with our, our first panel for the day today, which is on the theme of Chinese education in colonial and post-colonial Singapore. Um, uh, our first speaker in this panel, Professor uh, Kwa Bak Lim, is a figure who looms large in the subject of today's symposium. His research focuses on the history of the Chinese community and its pioneers in Singapore, and he has long been active in community service and deeply involved in promoting the cultural values and historical heritage of the Singaporean Chinese. 
Currently, he is council member, whom chairman of the research committee of the Singapore Federation of Chinese Clan Associations. And he also serves as board of governor for NTU's Chinese Heritage Center. And as a member of the National Library Collections and Programs Committee, the Singapore Chinese Cultural Center's Academic Advisory Committee and the resource panel of the Wan Qingyuan Sun Yat-sen Nanyang Memorial Hall. He also serves as a history consultant for the Chuanzhou History Museum of Overseas Chinese in China and as adjunct professor in Chinese studies at New Era University College in Malaysia. Over the past decade, Mr. Kwa has delivered lectures in China and Japan, both under the auspices of, uh, auspices of Singapore's National Heritage Board and at the invitation of the National, of, oh, sorry, the China National Archive in Beijing. He's been recognized by the National Arts Council and National Heritage Board for his pioneering contributions to the arts and heritage of Singapore and uh, received the prestigious Singapore Chinese Cultural Contribution Award for his contributions to Chinese culture in Singapore. He's the author and editor of many publications, including uh, most notably editor of the uh, original Chinese edition of the monumental and literally quite weighty work of uh, Xinjiang uh, Huaren Tongshi, General History of Chinese in Singapore, an incredible uh, achievement documenting over 700 years of that history, published in 2015 to coincide with Singapore's 50th anniversary of independence. And he's also the uh, co editor of the, along with uh, uh, Kwa Chong Kwan, uh, who will be speaking later today, of the English version of that work, published only four years later in 2019. So the title of uh, Professor Kwa's Talk today is an introduction to the Chinese textbook, textbook used by the colonial government for the civil service. So would you please uh, join me in, in giving a warm welcome to Professor Kwa Bakli. Hi, good morning. Professor Wang Kenu. Good morning, everyone. Two months ago, Professor Scott contacted me. He asked me whether I can present a paper in his symposium. I didn't reply to him immediately because during that time, I was still thinking what sort of interesting topic I can share with you. So after a few days considerations, I replied to Professor Scott that this is the topic I'm going to present. And he agreed. And introductions to the Chinese textbook used by the colonial government for the civil service. This is a textbook I'm referring to. Why this textbook? What is the significance? And who are the persons using this book? And what happened to this book now? This is basically the four major points I'm going to highlight and share with you this morning. Before I go further, can we look at this paragraph first? This building, I think all of you know, where is this building? But the important thing is that what is the connection of this building related to me, to my presentation this morning? So let me KIV the answer first. This is the map of street settlements. Chinese called San Zhou Fu. San Zhou Fu, in fact, is a political system implemented by the British government in 1826. It lasts for 120 years and ends in 1946. San Zhou Fu consists of three places, Singapore, Penang, and Malacca. Originally, the capital was in Penang. In 1832, 
the capital was moved from Penang to Singapore. This is the threat of street settlements. So after the setting out of Sanjofu, there are so many immigrants come to Singapore. And as the population is getting larger and larger, the British government has decided to manage this group of people. people. So they set up a Chinese protector, or called protectors of Chinese. And at the same time, the Qing government, which means the China government, also want to take care of these overseas Chinese. They set a Chinese council here. This is Pickering, the first Chinese protector sent by London to Singapore. This is his office, Chinese protector. This is a picture whereby I showed to you in the beginning. This Chinese, this building currently is used by the subordinate court in Haverhill. This is a Chinese council to Singapore. He's a career, he's a dep career diplomat, <coughs> and he stayed in Singapore for 13 years. Because these two persons are doing the same job, actually they are, they are dealing, managing the overseas Chinese. And due to the nature of their duty, the two used to conflict. So from the survey, we find that the conflict actually is the overlapping of portfolio. In fact, it's not. This is a political rivalry or so-called political context. They are trying to impose their influence and leadership over the Chinese community in Singapore. So in, in order, order to better manage this group of Chinese community, the British government or so-called Chinese potato rate has decided to compile a book to train the civil servant. This book, you see the title of this book is very long. A textbook of documentary Chinese, specially designed for the use of the civil service, member of the civil service in the street settlement and the protected native states. This is a protected, protected native state. Those currently in red, were street settlements. This is the original copy of Sanzhou Fu Wen Jian Xiu Qi in Chinese. And in Singapore, there's only one copy and it's currently kept by National Library. So these three volumes, they are all together, total seven chapters. The first volume, there are two chapters, petition and proclamations. Second volume also has two chapters, letters, letters, letters. The third volume got three chapters, forms, dispatch, and memorial. A total of 383 documents was collected and in this Sanzhou Fu Wen Jin This book was published in Singapore in 1894, which is 127 years ago. And the editor was G.T. Hale. You look at this, this book actually is quite a large book. Length is 29.5 cm, wide 23 cm, thick 4.2 cm. If you take a look at this book, Apart from the content page, which is in English, the rest of the book are all in Chinese. And you can see that all the Chinese texts are written in the classic Chinese, Wen Yin Wen, and it's in the complicated Chinese character, An Ti Zi, without any punctuation. In front of this book, there is a memorandum in fact, it's a force written by the editor. Basically, he said that what is the purpose for him to compile this book? It's because he feel that previously, for those material used to train the civil servant, actually is with no local 
relevance. So in so order in to enhance the knowledge of the civil service service here, and also to better understand of the Chinese community in Singapore, and the Chinese so important, so he want to compile a book which is local relevant to train the civil servants. This forward was written by G. T. Hay in May 1894 in Singapore. So we want to know who is this G. T. Hay. In fact, I myself know very little about him. Uh, I have searched all the material. I can only know that. <coughs> He was the assistant protector of Chinese. That is to say that he was the assistant to William Pickering, and he has a very good command knowledge of Chinese language. When he passed away in November 1906, there was a fundraising from the Chinese community want to build a memorial hall for him, but the project didn't turn out. Reason unknown. This is a press cutting of the Singapore Free Press dated 18 August 1891. Here there is some information about him, saying that he's in charge of immigration and then he was the registrar of immigrants. I tried to search his photograph, but couldn't get. But luck, one day I went to Malaysia and accidentally I found him. So he is a young gentleman standing at the bedroom. Hey, is GTA. <clears throat> so, what is the significance of this book? As I mentioned just now, this book is specially made to train the civil servants in the street settlements. The book covers a wide range of material including Qing Dynasty official correspondent, extract of local Chinese newspaper, petitions, office notice, commercial correspondent, misdemeanor. And this textbook, the purpose of this textbook is to enhance the knowledge of Chinese politics, economy, and society for the civil servant working in Singapore. So let me quote a few examples to Describe how important of this book. Take a look at this building. This building is called Tong Ji Yen, the Singapore Tong Chai Medical Institution. There is two schools of thought concerning its formations. One said that Tong Ji Yen was formed in 1867. The other say that Tong Chi Yen was formed in 1885. There is a difference of 18 years, which is correct, which means that these two years, which, were, which year is the correct year for the formation of Tong Chi Yen. <coughs> we make a check at this uh, Central Fu Wen Jin Xiu Qi. In chapter one, petition document number one, we found that there is a petition to the Chinese protectorate to apply for the formation of Tong Chi Yen. But unfortunately, this document has some preform. Why? Because the document is undated, without date. We are not able to know the actual date, the actual formation date of Tong Chi Yen. We can only know that the predecessor of Tong Chi Yen was Tong Chi Yi The original location is at 31 North Canal Road. The applicants were Ho To Seng and others. So, how to, how to find, find the, the actual, actual formation, formation of, of Tong Chi Yen? We make a check at another chapter. That chapter 4, document 34. In this chapter, it spells out very clearly the rules and regulations of Tong Chi Yen. You see, all are written in the complicated Chinese character. Unless we, you are very good in Chinese, otherwise very difficult for us to understand. In this document, there are four elements here to confirm. 
That means the founding situation of Hong Kiyan, the social background, and then the first since to station in Hong Kiyan. Importantly, the date of establishment is confirmed as 1885. But currently, Hong Kiyan say that they, they are forming in 1867. Even I told them it's wrong, but they never change. That's how we mentioned Pickling, the first Chinese potato in Singapore. Something bad happened to him. In one day of the year 1887, a carpenter, a Teochew carpenter, by the name of Chua Sui. It's not Ong Ah Sui, Ong Ah Sui is selling Bako Day. It's Chua Sui. He carried uh, a weapon which is an XASE, and went to Pickering's office and threw the X at Pickering. So Pickering was seriously injured. And because of this so-called terrorist attack, the British government was very angry. They think that the attack could be due to the connection of secret societies. Therefore, they imposed a ban <coughs> on the secret society. This one can be found in chapter 2, document 22, indicate that from now on, the secret society is a secret society until today. This document is dated 1st July 1890. So the 1890, the year of 1890, become a very significant year in our study of Chinese current association. This year is very remarkable. And four days after the announcement of this Bank of Secret Society, there was a government gadget. Then Pickering retired, went back to London, and subsequently he passed away because due to the uh, attack, the, the, the injuries. We, we know nowadays Chinese always Chinese celebrate, celebrate extensively for the summer moon. moon. Hungry Ghost Festival. In fact, this custom has been on for the past 100 over years. In this document, chapter 4, document number 37, it spells very clearly that 100 over years ago, how our ancestors celebrate the Summer Moon Festival. So it's quite interesting, actually, more or less the same. Today, we have Ke Thai, you know, singing song. 100 years ago, although there's no Ke Thai, but there's a Wayang Shu. The next question is that we will be wondering how come the civil servant, those are more under over years ago, they are so good in Chinese. Now we always complain that Chinese language is very difficult to study. Why those are more, they are so good and can study Chinese so well? We, we know that the British government has a very strict system in selecting the expatriate civil servants. So those people want to work overseas as an expatriate, they are very good in all the languages. They are more than bilingual. The first class civil servant, they say where they send to India. Only the second and third class people come to Singapore, go in Singapore and, and uh, Malaya. And these people are so good that after their retirement, they apply their knowledge, local, local knowledge, and convert themselves to an academic staff. And a lot of people, a lot of people after, after their retirement, retirement, they teach in the university and become a very famous scholar. Uh, I caught two examples here. The first one is Winstead. We have a Winstead loop in somewhere in Newton Circle there. I remember in early 1970 when I worked in HTV, there was a Winstead estate. Also, so many years you don't know, it's under my management. Therefore, I know Winstead very well. And Winstead was a civil servant. He first came to Malaya in 1902 as the main officer. And he's very good in the study of the Malay language and the Malay history and customs. After his retirement, he teach in the Uni University of London. His famous book, this is Winstead, his famous book is a Malay dictionary. So you can imagine the Malay dictionary 
It's not done by Malay, but done by the British. <coughs> Another person, Peter Purser, those, those who have who studied, have the, studied the, the Chinese, Chinese. I, think I think Peter Purser is not, not strange to, to you. He is also, also a public servant and work, working uh, in, in Malaysia. After his retirement, he teach in <coughs> Eastern History at Cambridge University. So today we know Peter Purser is not a civil servant. He was a historian, a very famous historian. This is Peter Purser. His book is the Chinese in modern Malaya, Malaya Horans. What happened to this textbook now? Just now I mentioned it. There are three volumes, <coughs> seven chapters, a total of 383 documents of character in this book. So out of these 387 documents, we selected 162 documents, which is relevant to Singapore and Malaya. And we come up with a new version. This project was carried out and done by the FACCA. This uh, office in Topayo. I am the uh, research committee chairman. Work together with a professor in the New Era University College in KL. Both of us, we took two and a half years to compare this book. This is the book here. I am not coming here to sell this book, but I just want to introduce that this is a very useful historical material. It's currently underused. So just to draw the awareness of this, this book, the actual size of the original copy is the same. We just don't want to change the original history. It's actually the same. But we have actually converted the complicated Chinese into uh, simplified Chinese. And then we enter on it. We put the punctuation there and type it out. Easier for you to read and understand. There is also an original copy put as an attachment of this book. And the Chinese newspaper are so happy to promote my, my book. There was a special write of the whole page last month. So this ends my presentations. I hope you all enjoy. <laughs> and for the next 10 minutes, I am going to present you a documentary. This documentary was taken in the year 1938. Well, 83 years ago, and when Singapore still under the system of street settlement. Let's see how the old Singapore looks like. Okay, well, we set that up. Let's give a round of applause to uh, Professor Quaffer. Anyone happy to do that? Thank you. Only a little over a hundred years ago, Stamford Raffles, a far-sighted official of the famed East India Company, realized Britain's great need of an important base in the Indies. For <coughs> and against and advice, advice and wishes of this company, Secured by agreement from the Sultan of Johor, an island off the extreme southern tip of the Malay Peninsula. And here, founded Singapore.
a settlement destined to become, within less than a century, one of the greatest commercial ports and the most strategic point of the British Empire. Singapore, but 77 miles north of the equator, is at the crossroads of Australia and India, South Africa and China, and as military base and home of the combined British Far Eastern fleet, is rightly considered the Gibraltar of the East. Garrisoned at Singapore are regular seasoned troops composed of European, Indian and Malay units. and most efficient air force in the Far East, both as to personnel and equipment, is stationed at Singapore, with air drones unrivaled in the Orient. The busy harbor and waterfront, the fine buildings and crowded modern streets, bespeak her importance as a free port and the greatest transshipment center in the East, where practically everything that is made can be purchased duty-free. With the result, Singapore East one of the cheapest shopping centers in the entire world. Much of the plan of the present city is due to its founder, Stamford Raffles, and the square which is the heart of its business life bears his name. On it face many banks, offices, retail and commercial establishments, and through it, during the business day, passes a steady stream of pedestrian and vehicle traffic. To protect motor cars against the direct rays of the equatorial sun, cloth covers are often used. Of Singapore's estimated population of half a million, more than 55% are Chinese. Though the majority are coolies and laborers, and their commercial interests are vast and of the greatest importance. Some originally immigrants from China, and others descendants of the pioneers who came to trade when Raffles established the settlement. In addition to the great percentage of Chinese, Singapore's population is also composed of numerous other Orientals and Occidentals all parts of the world. And it is claimed no less than 26 languages are used in conducting normal business. population works and lives together in harmony and religious freedom. In one street is seen an imposing Chinese temple, and within a short distance stands an elaborately carved Hindu place of worship. and there are many, bow toward Mecca beneath no white domes of a mosque of the prophet. <laughs> Dividing the city, Singapore's river presents an always changing scene of busy activity. Many small lighters and trading junks tie up at caves to unload or discharge their multitudinous wares. 
all lie empty in midstream, awaiting cargo. Chinese believe their boats must see where they are going, so large eyes are placed upon the bow. In pleasing contrast to the crowded oriental sections are the open spaces of the European areas, with wide, splendidly paved boulevards, tree-shaded avenues, and modern buildings. Paralleling the harbor is Connaught Road, one of the finest drives in the city, and comparable to any similar thoroughfare in Europe. At the edge of Raffles Plain, and fronting eastward to the sea, stands the imposing cenotaph, silent memorial to Singapore's World War dead. Overlooking the plain is the Victoria Memorial Hall, and nearby, the stately municipal building, one of Singapore's newest constructions. Adjacent is St. George's Anglican Cathedral, also facing the plain. All parts of the city are served and connected by well-paved roads, convenient arteries for those who live in the suburbs or in the beautiful residential section of Tanglet. The governor's mansion stands upon a hill commanding an unobstructed view of the entire city. Unpretentious, yet spacious and comfortable, are many of the homes built in an older architectural style, with great open arcaded verandas serving as living rooms in this tropical city. Social life in this thriving crown colony is always full and varied, with garden parties, dinners, races, sports meets, and dozens of other activities. A gathering place is Raffles Hotel, one of the most renowned hostelries in the East. At tiffin time, the midday meal hour, the veranda of this well-known rendezvous is always crowded with those who come to enjoy cooling drinks, fine music, and pleasant companionship. The colony proudly boasts of one of the finest and most modern swimming pools in all the East, the Singapore Swimming Pub. Children as well as adults bathe in the cool, filtered seawater which flows continuously through the two spacious pools. Devoted and loyal Chinese servants called Amas watch over and care for the European children. On the balconies of the clubhouse, or the terraces overlooking the peaceful waters, members and guests relax and enjoy the refreshing breezes which blow from the Straits of Malacca or the China Sea. Here on this tropical island, which was once but an impenetrable jungle, along the coast of which ships of the past sailed with timidity, 
England has built a great city and established for the trade of all nations a mighty guardian in the East. Well, it's certainly a, a very interesting glimpse and an interesting take on the uh, life in the early 20th century Singapore. We'll, we'll bring uh, Professor Paul back on a little bit later uh, for the um, uh, question and answer session. But now let's uh, move on with our second speaker in this panel, uh, another heavyweight in the field, Professor Huang Tianli. Professor Huang is Associate Professor of History at the National University of Singapore, and he's concurrently also a research, research associate at the East Asia Institute. East Asian Institute. And in uh, 2011, he was honored as uh, uh, the, the Kong Chen uh, NUS Stanford Distinguished Fellow in Southeast Asia. He originally earned his PhD in a Commonwealth Scholarship at Australia National University, where he some, now some time ago wrote his dissertation under the supervision of Professor Wang Gongwu. Professor Huang's research straddles two related fields, the history of Republican China from the 1910s to 1940s and China diaspora studies. He's the author or editor of several books, including his 1996, The Politics of Depoliticization in Republican China, Kuomintang Policy Towards uh, Student Political Activism from 1927 to 1949, which was translated in Chinese uh, in 2010. And more recently, his uh, 2008 co-authored work on the scripting of a national history, Singapore and its pasts. His co-edited volumes include Power and Identity in the Chinese World Order, and macro perspectives and new directions in the study of Chinese overseas. He's also published in a wide range of international referee journals, such as Frontiers of History in China, Modern Asian Studies, uh, Inner Asia Cultural Studies, Journal of Chinese Overseas, and the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies. The title of Professor Huang's talk today will be uh, Disappearing Chinese Vernacular Schools in Singapore, Post-World War II British Decolonization and Li Guangqian's failed struggle. Would you please join me in, in giving a warm welcome to Professor Huang Tianli. Hello, morning everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to share this uh, opportunity with scholars in this UNUS session. Uh, the topic that I've been sort of chosen to speak this morning is on the disappearing Chinese vernacular schools in Singapore uh, in the post-World War period and a lot to do with British decolonization process as well as focusing on the man, Lee Kong Chen's failed struggle. Uh, I'd like to give you first an overview first of the whole lecture itself within the, the 30 minutes. Uh, so today, as you look around, there are no more Chinese schools per se in Singapore with Chinese language as the major medium of instruction. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew and his ruling PAP government in 1987 had replaced all the vernacular schools with a national stream, teaching just purely in English as a first language. So second, Chinese remain, but only as a very small part of the curriculum within about an hour or two within the sort of day or so. Um, but my argument in this presentation is that uh, we should not just focus on 1987 and what the PAP government did to Chinese education, but the story of the disappearing Chinese schools actually, or the disappearing process should be traced to the much earlier years of post-World War II British decolonization. 
So we need to move backward to get a better holistic picture of things. Uh, so my presentation focuses on the difficult proce uh, process of negotiation between the Chinese community and the British colonizing authorities over Chinese education. And I will use the Singapore-based tycoon Lee Kong Chien and his endeavor as the prism to view the tension arising from the Chinese community struggle for Chinese schools, funding and autonomy amidst the restrictive British policies. Now, since I focus on the man itself, you need to remember that actually he took a very low profile in the pre-war period, but he plunged into political limelight and played a very executive role as Singapore transited from the British colonial rule to self-governing and finally to full independence. The path of Lee Kong Chin's struggle was far from linear. The shaping of post-war educational policy was in fact one of twists and turns. The eruption of political activism in Chinese school in the post-war period, 1950s or so, posed additional challenges for him. Eventually, the countercurrents proved too strong, with Lee Kong Chien staring at the status quo, defeat and withdrawal. So that's my main argument for this presentation. So let me begin giving you an overview first of the sort of situation of the British decolonization and Chinese education in Singapore. Uh, as you can see from the first presentation, Singapore was colonized since 1819 from British uh, sort of reference landing in Singapore. And then uh, when Malacca was rigged from the Dutch in 1824, they formed the Straits Settlement. So Penang, Malacca and Singapore became sort of uh, the Straits Settlement in 1826 with Penang first as headquarter. In 32, they moved the headquarter to Singapore, recognizing its premium importance even over that of Penang. And then the British, uh, transferred the rule, uh, initially as government from India, then transferred a rule over from India to London as a colonial, uh, colon, crown colony in 1867. And that British colonization process was interrupted during the war itself, 1942 to 45 by the Japanese occupation. When the British came back, they knew it was the end of the day for them. So they put in the process of decolonization. Right? So it started as early as 1945. In fact, even before the war ended, they were doing some pre-planning in London itself. So 45, 46 almost, they came back and started to put in place things. And then the Federation, first a Malayan Union scheme, which didn't work well, and eventually a Federation and Malaya scheme from 48 to 57, giving independence to Malaya. But this time, including Penang and Malacca, but detaching Singapore from the very scheme itself. So Singapore was went on a separate path and was granted self-government only in 1959. And that's when the PAP came into power with uh, Lee Kuan Yew leading the party. And then um, there was a formation in Malaysia, uh, together in Malaya again with Sabah Sarawak, and then forming the Malaysian state in 1963, giving independence to Singapore, but didn't work out well. So we left Paris after two years in 1965. So it bears reminding that this is the sort of uh, colonization process of Singapore and how we struggled for independence. And in terms of population, demographic is very important, right, in many things. So at the point, it's important to remember that, in fact, the Chinese majority is the majority in population as early as 1930s, okay, from about seven, up to about 75%. So Chinese schools are a very important part of our history. And um, what happened is that the British essentially based a priority on Malay vernacular education, giving priority to the indigenous uh, Malays, as well as to promoting a small group of English educated professionals. So that was a focus. As far as Chinese education is concerned, the British adopted a, in a pre-war period, a minimalist laser fair approach to Chinese education. Essentially, you're left very much on your own, relying on mutual help and self-governance of, and self-governance. So a clan, a native, native place, trade associations and all that took over. So there was earlier questions about the role of the clan associations and trade uh, uh, unions and all that. Now, this was before the war. What happened is things changed after the war. There was a sea change and very explosive pressure from that point on. Why? Because of the following number of three factors. First, the schools were damaged, very badly damaged as many other institutions by the war itself. And so the Chinese had to pick up the pieces all over again. And many of the Chinese businessmen actually lost their fortune, a part, substantial part of it during the war itself. 
So very limited financial resources and how to revive those forlorn and broken down school system. So there was a first pressure. Secondly, the Chinese school's resumption not only resumed, but also went on explosive growth, a very vast expansion. Why? Because the war delayed 42 to 45, delayed the entrance of many schools into the education system. So they want to go back to the school system. So the enrollment number went up sky high. And post-war was also a period for baby boomers in Singapore. So population, population, population. And more than that was a layer of political awakening. So this is a post-war period. So the British were decolonizing. And so the idea was to give power of voting to the Chinese community. So the electorate was uh, going through a political awakening process. And together with that was an issue of Cold War fear. Because this is the Churchill making the statement about the Iron Curtain has fallen. Okay, so this is the beginning of Cold War. And so conflation between communism, although Russia is the main culprit, you also got communist China as well, becoming communist part, uh, rule from 1949. So the conflation between Chinese schools and communist influence. So these are the various factors that make the post-war situation very unusual, very explosive. So the next section deals with introducing the man himself before we talk about his struggle. So Li Kongqian and about his trans regional business empire and how he went into the sort of post-war political limelight. He was born in Nan'an a County in Fujian province in uh, 1893, came over to Singapore at the age of 10 with his father in 1903. He studied here for a little while and then get a scholarship, went back to China and studied again and came back again in 1911, entered the workforce. And he worked very well. He was talent scouted by the rubber magnet Tankaki and rose to the top management position within Tankaki's firm. And Tankaki even married his eldest daughter over to him in the year 1920. In 1928, he began to sort of decide to leave the Tankaki company and form his own company called the Lee Rubber, that's Nang Yi in Chinese, okay, in the year 1928. So over the next few decades, this man actually built an extensive regional business empire straddling over the region. So it's a real sense of Southeast Asia in that sense, right? Uh, Singapore, Malaya, Sumatra, South Thailand was his base, all the headquarters in Singapore. Uh, so by 1930s, he was among the wealthiest in Southeast Asia, very much known as a rubber king, as well as a pineapple king. These are the two epithets that applied to him. Not quite a major financier then because the banking sector was dominated by the European bank at that point in time, including Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. Uh, but he was already becoming a major player since OCBC was formed in 1932 or the Great Depression merger. Okay? And OCBC uh, was run partly by him, but also by professional manager, including the most famous one by Tan Chin Tuan, who is actually the foundation is sponsoring today's symposium. Okay? In 1967, Lee Kongjin passed away at the age of 74. So this is a background to him and his soft trans regional subdivision business empire. Now, throughout this early period, although he was already becoming very well known and very wealthy, he actually essentially kept a pretty low profile, okay? With deference partly to his father-in-law, Tan Kaki, who was a leading uh, sort of person in the Chinese community. But if you look into the sources and all the reportings and all that, things changed quite dramatically when the war ended in 1945. In the war, he happened when the war broke out, he was in America uh, attending a rubber conference and he stayed there and gave some lectures in the University of Columbia and all that. But he, well, he actually came back and very much ready to plunge into the thick of things. Because by then, Tangaki has moved onward to China politics and eventually left for China in 1950. So he plunged into the whole forefront of social political activities. And what I have on the screen is a whole list of them. Uh, advisory council to the British admin, which put into place at the immediate war period, post-war period, August 46 to February 47. He also began to took up the presidency of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce again, one of the most important leading Chinese organization. This is second presidency, he had one earlier before the war. Uh, he resumed the chairman of Chinese high school, which was interrupted by the war itself, uh, taking over from Tan Kaki since 1934. He was against, he spoke out very much against the Kuomintang in China, trying to re-exert his influence over the overseas Chinese. He was, he spoke out most importantly against the British Malayan plan, the Malayan Union, okay? And the Federation of Malaya as well, which was forged since 1946, 
So they launched this uh, pan-Malayan association of Chinese Chamber of Commerce against these two major plans of Malayan Union and Federation, and he was the president of the pan-Malayan unit. He even organized, played a very major role in organizing the one-day pan-Malayan general strike called Hatta in the, in the day, in particular day 20th October 1947, to send a signal to the British that these two plans were not welcomed by the Chinese community. Okay, but it did not stop the British from actually going forward, okay? Well, uh, following that, uh, Malayan Federation was formed in 48, and he attended the launch of the Malayan Chinese Association, MCA in Malaya, okay, in the year uh, February 49. He was from Singapore, but Singapore was excluded from that, so we were not part of that, but that association. But he endorsed it, so he went attended the launch. He also endorsed the AMNO launch kind of a multiracial political alliance for independent Malaya in 1957. So you can see the whole series of things that he actually plunged into very active, direct political limelight after the war itself. So he is the leading man to uh, look at this whole picture about Chinese education in the post-war period, how he played a very major role in negotiating the various educational changes. So the, the details are quite uh, daunting, a lot of them, and essentially over this agreement over school land, what land should be given to the Chinese school to set up land, and you've got to pay for the government for the land, the pay for the building, the building of it, the cost of it, how much the government will play a role in it, operational grants, matching salary for teachers, language to be used in the schools, curriculum that should be used, student enrollment, management autonomy, extra, extra. So these are all the very nitty gritty things which they have to go and negotiate with the British government for greater space and autonomy for the Chinese schools. He hated the Pan-Malayan Guidance Committee for resumption of Malayan school, which was formed immediately, as you notice the date, is June 1946. So almost immediately after the war to respond to all this need to negotiate with the British colonial authorities. Initially, it was a very positive response from the British. They launched this thing called the Educational Policy in the Colony of Singapore, a call 10 year educational program in August 1947. Very positive. They adopted this thing about, oh, young children should learn mother tongue and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and at the primary school level. So, this is something to be endorsed. So, equity for all schools of all stream by the British and very ambitious goal of setting up free primary schools with 100 public schools in 10 years. Okay. So, uh, very positive in the point in time when they started off this negotiation. But then British encountered problems because of the stirring uh, issues, money problems, extra, and also because of personnel changes, leadership changes in the Ministry of Education and all that. So uh, very soon, in fact, it turned negative. Okay, it turned negative with the following plan. You can see the name is still the same. The word ten year is there. Ten year program, data and interim policy, September forty nine, and they issue a supplement to the ten year program called data and interim policy of early nineteen fifty. And you look at the two plans, they use the same phrase, 10-year plan, but it was a real backtracking. It turned from positive to negative. The priority is no more equity, it's priority for more English schools, not for Chinese schools. And then another negative thing came from, they issued three reports on Malayan education, about Chinese education in Malaya, because by then, Malaya was sort of become a federation independent. There's a Ban report, there's a Fanu report, there's a, uh, also an education ordinance in 1952. So all these were very pro-Malay, pro-English education, okay? And pretty against the Chinese education. So Lee Gongchen has to be as a chair of the Chinese school coordinate joint committee. They formed in 1951 to counter the British kind of uh, approach to things. But it didn't stop the British from staying on path. They issued another white paper in December 54, which is also very negative. That is called bilingual education and increase aid. Okay. Um, they now say, okay, we believe in bilingual, we believe there's a space for Chinese education. We'll give you some grants. But then they insist on having a new semester system, uh, lesser hours for Chinese, more hours for English and all that, and a restructured curriculum. So again, Lee and his community had to respond. A chair at the Chinese Federation of School Management and Teachers, Dong Jia Hui, launched on the 5th of December 1953. So these are the sort of going forward and backward, but you can see the trend essentially uh, from optimism to uh, pessimism and to negativity. Okay? And I saw things were difficult for him. Things become even more so 
uh, following in the following years because there was an eruption of political student movement in the Chinese school system. Okay, so this complication from a student political activism as a next section, beginning with the awakening in the May 13 movement of 1954, uh, protest against the National Service Ordinance, uh, which was put in place to recruit young people to join the uh, sort of uh, military, the police force and all that, part of the thing about the Malayan Emergency Plan. So they clashed with the police and there were barricades being imposed, hunger strikes as well in Chinese high school. So Li Kongqing was the chairman of Chinese high, if you remember the previous slides. Uh, so he also hated the Chinese Federation of Chinese Schools. Uh, management and teachers, he had to rush back. He was then oversee when this thing took place. He rushed back and he went to approach the students, talk to them uh, numerous times and pleaded with the students to disperse and to return to classes. Okay. Uh, so in a way, uh, this is a very important moment. Uh, the way I sense it, it makes a very profound impact on Li Kongqian because it added to all the pre-1954 negativities that he was already feeling. And I think from this point, I think he can see the writing on the wall that was to his disadvantage. And my reading is that he began to decide that it's about time for him to retreat from a political limelight. But he executed the retreat a little bit uh, over a period of time from 54 to 56, not immediately. So he still shouldered the responsibility for a little while more, which is to do with the following items. The Malayan emergency was still ongoing, but the British felt confident enough to handle the British communist problem. So they commissioned the Render Commission, put in place a Render Constitution in February 55, recommending major changes for the political landscape in Singapore. A legislative general election held in April 55, and then the Labour Front under David Marshall won the election. So his government took place in 55 to 56 period. And this is a period whereby uh, you have got a major uh, outbreak of student activism, labor activism as well, beginning with the April to May 1955, the so-called famous Hockley bus riot. The workers together with student political activism protested against some of the measures. Well, David Marshall's government responded positively. They convened an all-party party report on Chinese education, okay, that we need to solve this problem in Chinese school. And they put out this report. The report was commissioned in May 55. The report came out in February 56. If you read the report, it's an all-party report, which means all party means representative from opposition and all that. And therefore, including Lee Kuan Yew himself was involved in that report. And it was in a way pretty positive, okay? There's a place under the sun for Chinese education. So it was a positive thing with that report by the David Marshall government. But barely two months later, it turned negative, okay? When it went through the government process, away from the all-party thing. So this is a government process. Two months later, in April 56, they put out a white paper on education, which is negative. But this is an important foundational document, okay? It became a document of which the following Prime Minister from David Marshall Chen Yu, Lim Yu took over, launched the 57 Educational Ordinance, which is adopted in a way very negative against Chinese education. And it's adopted and entrenched by the Lee Kuan Yew and its PAP English Educator Elite even after they took power in June 1959. So this whole thing actually signaled the end of the policy struggle and the beginning of the end of Chinese education, because essentially it still recognized the premier importance and the prioritization over English schools. So to conclude, um, I would say that the termination of the sort of Chinese medium school under the Lee Kuan Yew's PAP government in 1987 is a very complex story, okay? A lot of people blame the PAP and the government, which they have to shoulder part of the blame. And of course, together, this is a story of the Nanyang University as well, right? So this thing people remembered for the sort of the end, the closure of the Chinese education. This is the story of China, primary and secondary school. And then the university story, Nanyang University is another part of the story. So the focus is very much on Lee Kuan Yew, PAP, and Chinese education. But the argument I made in this presentation is that it has its beginning point in the post-World War II British decolonization process of the late 1940s and 1950s. The future of the Chinese vernacular school and the granting of citizenship to overseas Chinese settlers had emerged as the two most important interrelated concerns in the post-World War II period and tangled with this whole issue about new nation making. The post-war resumption and the expansion of the Chinese schools amidst the limited community resources 
had led to a reversal of the self-help approach and a very loud demand for direct and urgent government help. But I think it's very important to remember the whole context that if you look into the details, their rallying cry was not for special privileges for Chinese ethnic education. Not that. So the term Chinese privilege is being very much voiced today, right? Amidst all these things about, you know, going back to the Malay world and all that, and uh, against the majority Chinese kind of thing. So the white Malay, Chinese privilege being evoked all the time. But actually in this context of the struggle, important to remember that rallying cry is not for that special privilege for Chinese ethnic, ethnic education. What they were arguing for was a parity, a parity framework of equal funding for all schools of all streams, regardless of where you are, whether it's Chinese, English, or Malay, or Tamil. And yet, while retaining a degree of autonomy so that they can run the schools with the school, school management boards. Now, in the post-war years, Le Kongqian plunged into political limelight as a witness in defense of Chinese education. He was in the forefront of it. And we all learned that his path of struggle was far from linear. Actually, his negotiation for a better educational policy was one full of twists and turns, as you can notice from a timeline that I lay out for you. And it's complicated very much by the eruption of political activism in Singapore, in the, in the Chinese school system. And the countercurrents eventually proved too strong and unfavorable against the Chinese schools. Okay, so this is where he beat a retreat. Okay, so as early as 1954 to 56, Li Kongqian actually saw the writings on the wall and opted to retire from direct business operation and to fade from other social political activities. From then on, he kept a minimalist public profile then after, one of which to be the Chancellor of Singapore University in 62 for a brief two-year period. So which is why in today's University Hall, uh, just further down the road, you have our new University Hall building. One wing is Li Kongqian, the other wing is Tan Chin Tuan, okay, who actually helped him to run the OCBC. So both of them actually associated with this story of mine, all right? So this retreat was arguably very closely tied to his disappointment and anguish in not being able to negotiate a better deal for Chinese school, okay? This is not explicitly stated, not spelled out by him, but this is the way I read the, the, the way the history unfold. So in short, Chinese schools in Singapore have been increasingly locked onto the path of disappearance since the end of World War II by the lack of British support, by Cold War conflation between Chinese and communism, by parental preferences, and by ethnic politics of nation making as framed by the emerging local English educated political elite. Thank you. Okay, now let's uh, invite uh, both Professor Hong and Professor Kwa back to the stage uh, for some Q&A. Another mic microphone. This one. So we've just heard a couple of wonderful talks on the, the history of uh, Chinese education in Singapore, and uh, we have about um, uh, half an hour for uh, for question and answers. So um, maybe we'll should we start with a question from the online audience? Uh, Amberly, do we are we ready for that? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think we can start with just one question from the. Um, the Zoom Q&A. Um, so one question is, um, can Chinese education be revived in some form to preserve the Chinese culture of the modern time? I guess um, this question is open to, um, maybe it applies more to um, Mr. Huang, Professor Huang. Yeah. The question is whether Chinese education can be revived, right? 
so in the context of today's talk is about schools uh, in teaching in Chinese medium, right? Which is called Chinese schools. So in that, putting that question in that context, uh, my answer would be no, okay? Because we have traveled too far down the road, uh, whereby, you know, the school system has really been totally changed. Uh, and so I think uh, schools, uh, Chinese schools teaching in Chinese as a main medium is not likely to be revived, okay? So I think it's, it's about the degree of the mastering of Chinese uh, language, Chinese culture, Chinese history. That is the sort of, the, the sort of heart of the matter. Uh, and in that context, uh, there is a bit of hope for revival. Uh, although we have gone down the path quite precipitously uh, to even to the point that uh, many in the community, especially the Chinese community, feel that uh, we are becoming more and more a monolingual society. Okay? So while the government has been beating the drums of bilingualism throughout all these years, actually it's on a path of decline. And uh, almost they were becoming a monolingual society with uh, Chinese uh, mastery of Chinese really down to a very low point, almost to a terminal point. But uh, I would say maybe there's a way to sort of preserve a bit of the optimism. Uh, and in that sense that, in a way, Chinese bilingualism may have failed with, uh, sorry, uh, bilingualism command of Chinese may have failed with a large number of people, but there's still a, a quite a core group of Singaporean who's able to sort of ride that wagon of bilingualism and maintaining that sort of double mastery over both English and a second language. So, uh, and then with the rise of China, today with the economic opportunities, cultural interaction and everything. So that's also a second source of hope. A third source of optimism would be in terms of the new, new migrants, which is there's a group of migrants that's coming in, uh, some part from other parts of the world, but there's also a substantial portion coming from China. So in that context, I think the mastery of Chinese language, history, culture and everything might be sort of having a possibility of really turning away from the lowest point and picking up again. That would be my response. Thank you. Okay, a uh, question from the audience, sir? Oh yeah, Mr. Lowe, please. Uh, I have two questions, one for each speaker. So for Mr. Kwa, uh, I wanted to find out whether from your research, uh, did you manage to uh, understand whether or not the British colonial officers themselves found uh, the book that you mentioned to be helpful to them in governing the Chinese here in Singapore? And then uh, for Professor Huang, um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about uh, Li Kongqian and why uh, you said that uh, he was actually against uh, two things. Once he, one, he was against the Kuomintang's uh, influence or intervention in local politics here. And why, secondly, uh, he was also against uh, the, the British idea of uh, Malayan Union. Anyway, thanks to we, I just now I forget to mention that the publication of this book is with the support of the uh, SCPC fund. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, anyway, I find that the British government, in fact, they are better than us in knowing the Chinese culture. So there are many, many, many reasons. I, I think always we always say that kaki tai tang bang lai. You know, you, you yourself manage yourself and then actually it's not a good, it's not a good thing. British as outsider, they look at you differently and they can treat you very fairly. So you can see that during the colonial times, the Chinese education, the Chinese school actually is in face booming. That was after when the Second World War, when they tried to fighting for the independence. From then onwards, the Chinese education system go down. I know whether Chendi agree with me. Okay, I think this is my answer. Okay, as for the sort of uh, question with two subparts to me on Lee Kong Chen himself, uh, yes, uh, uh, the context of it is that when you talk about China politics influencing overseas Chinese, the heart of the highest 
drum beat of it started in the 1920s and 30s under the Kuomintang. When the Kuomintang came into power in 1927-28 in Nanjing, uh, with Chiang Kai-shek in power. So that's where they started the drum rolling of really getting all the overseas Chinese mobilizing them. Although there was a part earlier by the late Qing, but really the hype, really drum beat hype was around that period of time. So they were interrupted by the war and then they tried to pick things up after the war itself. So the, um, the part that I talk about is after the immediate, after the war 1945 part. And what happened in, in that period was that there was really a civil war going on between Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party and more, more or less resolving in favor of the Communist Party. And so this is one part of the change in the political landscape in China at a point in time. And also it has an impact on the local context because uh, local context and global context, in a way the world is actually turning left in a way after the war itself, including in Britain, at least government, the Labour government came to power. And so what happened is that in Singapore community, there's a sec major section under the leadership of Tangkaki began to turn in favor of the Communist Party instead of Kuomintang. So he was in a way very much standing on the side of the group together with his father-in-law, together with a substantial group of Chinese community who were beginning to view Chinese Communist Party as a more favorable, viable political party than compared to the Kuomintang. So when the Kuomintang tried to revive all these things, getting Southeast Asian to be elected into the Legislative Council and all those things, he was opposed to that in that sense. But he was different from his father-in-law in the sense that he did not opt to go back to China. He actually preferred very much to be planted within the local context. So this provides the answer to your second question as to why Lee Kong Ching was against the uh, Malayan Union and against the Federation of Malaya. Because as Prof Wang in his speech uh, uh, sort of hinted at, is that what happened is the war, war II and Japanese occupation has really unleashed the feeling about Malayan consciousness about being in this part of the world long enough to be part of this world and separate from that of China. So therefore, uh, tearing Singapore out from the straight settlement from Penang and Malacca and forming Malayan Union and the Federation of Malaya is the wrong thing. We are in fact Malayan as part of the whole thing. See? So the degree of Malayan consciousness is very much reflected in that. In fact, he went even further. He actually wrote a piece in the London Times in 19, for this, uh, before the war ended, or just about the, when the time war ended, to propose a federation of Southeast Asia. So he actually wrote a little piece that recommending formation of the federation of Southeast Asia, inclusive part of Thailand, of which his business empire was, and Indonesia as well. So very much reflecting his kind of trans-regional business empire that he suggested that. So that would be the answer to, my, to your question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Let's uh, take a, another question or two from online. Yes, um, I think I can pose two questions. The first one is a really quick one. Um, many people are asking where they can access the video clip that Mr. Kwa showed just now. And the second question is, um, uh, is it possible to draw a parallel between the Malaysian Chinese school system and the Singapore Chinese school system? Why is it that the Malaysian Chinese schools can survive with minority Chinese population in contrast to Singapore as with its majority Chinese population? So I answer your question first. Uh, they are asking for a video clip, is it? Can we share or not? So I. Actually, I passed the copy to Professor Scott. So let you decide. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, well, we are after all part of the one world, right? The Malayan consciousness and all that. Singapore and Malaya has always been one. So this Chinese education issue is really sort of staring at us, you know, uh, point blank in a way that uh, in the end, we sort of become an independent nation. It's a causeway link, but it's a very tenuous link and really developed into two different worlds altogether. And Chinese education is part of it. And the irony is that here we are in this little island with 70, 75 over percent of Chinese, and yet we could not keep the Chinese school education system going. And yet over there, where they were becoming, um, they were, they were started point in minority, and then the numbers were dwindling and dwindling. And yet today, if you go across to Malaysia, you can see a very festive kind of a struggle going on and they're keeping it alive, you know. They still got the Chinese school teaching system, uh, management board system, the Chinese schools. Uh, in fact, the Chinese school system, 
uh, they have their own set of problems. Of course, it's not really uh, all easy going, but they, they were still alive and well. And sometimes even the Malay's parents decided to opt to send their children to those Chinese schools so that they can really master real bilingual uh, education. In fact, it's more than bilingual. If you look at the Malaysian system they produce, actually they easily beat Singapore anytime. Okay, our bilingual is not real. Their bilingual is more than real because it's trilingual. Okay, they can speak Malay, they can speak English, they can speak Chinese, and you throw in the dialect, it's really multilingual. Okay, so they have been able to do that. So we have not been able to do that. And this is all kind of the historical packages and the way we have, uh, the political leadership has, uh, has charted our path. Uh, unfortunately, I think we've gone down too far now. We are more than 50 years uh, since independence. So it's very difficult to reverse the situation. So in response to the first question to us, uh, I don't see a reversal, but maybe not, not as bad as, uh, as today or so. Hopefully things will be better, but the, the system is really very ironic that in a way we have failed over here, but they have more or less uh, succeeded. They have their own set of problems, not an easy path, but you know, relatively comparatively speaking, they have succeeded more than us in terms of keeping the Chinese education school system alive and well. Okay, yeah, next question here. Your question is very interesting. In fact, uh, I also think, you know, British, we so-called British Empire, in fact, it's not simple. He, British actually is a very small island and he can control the territory which is very much larger than his country. There must be some reason. And when I compare the book with uh, Professor Kwa, Kwa Chong Wan, on the Chinese history, in fact, put it this way, I love Korea government. Uh, there are so many systems in place by the British government and until today, we are still practicing it. A lot of things, they, if they see any wrong ruling, they will come up with certain, certain law. Certain law is actually, you want to play the game with me, I set the rule for you. So this is one thing. Secondly, that they are very, they emphasize on the education. So you, you can see the low civil servants sent to sent from London to Singapore, Maria or Indian, they are all well educated. And they want to emphasize if you want to manage this group of people, you must know their culture, their language, their custom. For Pikini himself, he can speak Hokkien. He can speak Hokkien and then he, he knows Chinese. Like our Professor Scott, his Mandarin is very good, he's better than me. Even the way he, so em emphasize on education, on culture, and make sure that the civil servant understand and immune in the local, so-called local Chinese community. That's very important. Uh, you can see that the British uh, officers, they go around just now the hey, taking a photograph all with the ch local Chinese. I think that makes, makes sense for them to uh, go for a better management of the local Chinese community. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for your question. It's a bit surprising that you you did make a declaration yourself that you come from a country that is more multilingual. 
And then in your experience in Singapore, you actually like the environment, you're better in being more monolingual, right? So I, I find that very surprising. But I suppose there's a logic to what you what you your stand is because um, there's this famous phrase uh, that uh, you, you cannot, it should not be a jack of all trade and master of none, right? So mastery over one language and being very good at it is the way to go forward. So that is the sort of underlying logic in a way to the stand that you have taken. Huh? Yeah. But uh, I, would, I would argue actually in the opposite sense that uh, I think uh, this uh, having bilingualism, mono, uh, multilingualism is very important, uh, more and more so. Uh, because uh, despite the logic of that, I think uh, that language is a key to many things, to history, to culture and all that. In fact, we wouldn't be able to pass a student in graduate study if we do not master a second or a third language. This is also the heart of most American graduate education, right? That wherever country you come from, you got to pick up a second and a third language in order to clear your PhD, right? So this is the whole approach in a way that languages is very important, gets you access to primary and secondary source material. And more importantly, it's about the window to a culture. For culture to be porous, you need to have that language key to unlock it. Of course, you have translation work, but somehow there's something lost in translation, right? the nuances and all that. So having being multilingual, bilingual, being multilingual is very important, uh, especially in this era of globalization. So this era of globalization means the interaction of people from different places. And so all the more having multiple language is a great advantage. And I would add that one more thing would be that if you look at the way the world is being transformed nowadays, I think it turned that idiom that we said earlier about being sort of, uh, you know, do not be a jack of all trade, master of none. Actually, it's the opposite nowadays. In fact, it's about moving away from too narrow, too professional kind of a focus. And actually, we all need to acquire things. It's about multitasking. It's about knowing multi-different contexts and really you know, not doing to be too narrow and to be more wider so that, and even discipline-wise, although we are trained historians, we are always told, you try to be interdisciplinary, okay? So, well, Prof. Wang Gangwu is a leader of that, of which from the early days of his work, he actually tried to transcend beyond just the domain of history, trying to borrow concepts for social economic ideas and all that. So I think that kind of multilingualism uh, is very important still, all right? Okay, Amberly. Okay, um, I have two questions again. Um, so the first question would be, uh, are parental preferences for language mix in the educational system noticeably changing with the rise of China? And my second question is, to what extent is Singapore's current education landscape influenced by British education? And what about by Chinese education? Okay, so, um, well, this issue of parental preference is actually uh, very important, okay? Uh, so when we critique the sort of the path of educational policy, the path of the way education took place, um, it's not just about the political leadership determining certain things. I think they have to shoulder a large part of the blame because the political direction is quite critical. But you also find that if you go back into reading all the sources, the defense put up by the political leadership is always that it's not a totally our fault. You look at the parents, they're opting with their feet, you see, to put their children in English education instead of Chinese education. So if you look at material for the period I, struck, I talk about struggle with Chinese education, one issue that I did not highlight is actually for parental preferences, there was a beginning of a shift towards English education. You see, because they feel that if I'm from a Chinese family, Back to this issue of multilingual and bilingualism. I would like my children to at least, if they are from a Chinese family, to learn English. You see? So they like to send their children for English school. So the enrollment for Chinese school was dropping. So this was one dilemma that they had to grapple with at the point in time. But in the spirit of bilingualism, so why Lee Kong Chen is always held out as a model? Because Lee Kong Chen is able to achieve what he did was because he had mastery over both. He was one of those that was truly bilingual. Not so much of Tan Chin Tuan. Tan Chin is quite good at Hokkien and all that. But in terms of the, the Chinese language per se, it's really Li Kong Chen is the one that's mastery over both. So many of the 
parents, younger parents, actually opted to send their children to Chinese school in the way that. So it boomerang back in a way also to them to say, if you are fighting so hard for Chinese school, why are you not sending your children to Chinese schools? Because many, many leading, including Tang Lak Sai's family, also had their children educated uh, uh, in English schools. So this parental preference thing is very important and it still applies today. Uh, I think, uh, as I said, no reversal because parents, they will still send their children to English schools. With the rise of China being important, I would say the level of the sort of bilingual hours and curriculum thing will become more important because if you want to ride the economic bandwagon, uh, you need to master that. Although you can do it via English as well, right? Getting access to Chinese culture, history, and everything else via the English language. But having the mastery will still help them. So hopefully, this will be another source of optimism that more and more parents will, so will not frown on their children, just ma becoming mastery over English, but at least really paying attention to the English, the Chinese education as well. Next question, uh, anyone in the uh, live audience? Oh, yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you um, both, both professors for your very interesting lectures. I would like to ask um, Prof Huang actually, what, what do you think on uh, SAP schools or Tertian Zhongxue? Like, do you think they have succeeded in doing what Lee Kuan Yew originally envisioned to help preserve Chinese culture uh, and the tradition? Or do you believe that it's just, it's mostly superficial and surface level and doesn't really achieve a deep understanding? You're referring to the SAP schools? Yes. Okay, yeah, this is a very interesting thing uh, that uh, uh, at the point when the political leadership, the Lee Kuan Yew and the PAP and all that moving towards the kind of uh, having, removing all the vernacular schools and putting in a national stream, uh, they actually single about a, a dozen of schools beginning a primary and then later a few selected secondary school called special assisted school, whereby they identify them as schools with stronger uh, Chinese education background and then trying to preserve them, they will not be closed. And so therefore they will keep going. And then they will also have Chinese being taught at a higher level as well. So the whole idea is to have this kind of so-called, some people call it an elite school, whereby it's really uh, trying to put in more resources, helping them to keep the sort of Chinese vernacular education alive and well in this kind of schools, even they have gone national in that sense, right? Uh, well, there are, uh, uh, so there's a two way to read this. One way is that it's out of this whole genuine thing about concern about bilingual education, about preserving part of that legacy. So in a very positive way. The negative way of reading it is this conspiratorial kind of thing that when the political leadership is moving towards sort of shunting this Chinese education apart, they were giving out some concessions. So it's a bit of a political balancing act that when you take away something from a Chinese community, you try to tell them that you're not taking away everything, but you're preserving something. So it's a kind of, from a conspiratorial angle, if it's negative, it would be about trying to do that political balancing act. Uh, just as the way they closed Nanyang University through a numerous steps instead of one single move, okay? So this is the one way of reading it. The second response to your question would be that, Unfortunately, the way it turned out, maybe not unfortunately, a lot of people will say it's predictable because if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's just a balancing act, just a kind of temporary soothing of nerves and all that, in the end, it would not work out well. And that's true enough. So actually, if you go to a lot of SAP school today, you will find that very little of the kind of Chinese heritage and, and interest is being preserved. The principles initially were all from Chinese educator stream but increasingly they were replaced by professional. Some even do not know how to speak English. And there were even the school's population even more so. When they interact in the tuck shops, in the, in, in, in the off hour sports hour, they were all essentially interacting in English and not Chinese. So there were plays being mounted uh, uh, about Tankaki, for example, going back to Chinese high school. And then he was walking around and the students were all speaking in English. You know, and he couldn't hear, understand a part of it, you see, even though he's the one who founded that Chinese high school. So there's kind of irony in a sense that all these SEP schools are really SEP schools in name, but in terms of substance, they are not fulfilling their function. 
and we are still declining precipitously towards the path of being monolingual with English as a main priority. Okay, uh, next, uh, next question from the online audience. Okay, um, I think this question applies to um, Mr. Kwa. So um, Karin asks about the challenges with translating the book for civil servants since translation and punctuation can sometimes change the meaning of words. Um, with regards to the conversion of the book from traditional to modern Chinese and the addition of punctuations, how did you ensure that the meaning was coherent with the original book? This is our main challenge when I edited this book. In the first place, the qualification is that you must be very good in Chinese. So the persons who are helping me uh, is actually a graduate from Taiwan University. So every text or every chapter we go through, we went through many, many times. And we try to argue out whether the punctuation we insert there, whether it's correct or not. Of course, I cannot guarantee 100% is correct, but I can say that it should be over 95% is quite accurate. I hope that if the this, uh, this audience who have my book, I welcome his comments. If you find that any mistakes is spotted by him, can let me know. Thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, maybe, uh, we still have about five minutes or so. Um, so for the questions, yeah, Clay. All right, hello, okay. Uh, thank you both so much for your fascinating presentations. Uh, my question is for Professor Huang. I wonder if you can help us sort of if the 1950s is the beginning of the end for Chinese language schools in Singapore, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the events after the 1950s until 1980? And I wonder if you could tell us particularly more since you mentioned it, uh, the history of Nanyang University, right? If the 1950s is the beginning of the end and that's when this university is founded, how does it fit into this story? Thank you. Okay, um, well, it's a big question. So uh, I've in a way answered part of it in my presentation, but let me just pick up this, the segment that sort of would tie in with what you say, right? Uh, the Nanyang University story is part of this story, okay? Because the first Chinese school is Chinese high school set up in Singapore, it's a secondary school. They set up primary school from a very early days, from around the turn of the century, 20th century, uh, 1905, 1906. Then the first secondary school only took place in 1919 okay and then after that it took a number of years will be that you no know, then how then you have sort of continuing beyond that it's always step by step right aspiring for higher level so in the past many of these graduate from a secondary chinese school will go back to china to study university but then what happened the war interrupted all this and china was turning communist right so there's the path is sort of blocked after that so what happened is they want to set up a university. So Nanyang University was formulated, to, the idea was trial in 53, launched in 55, 56, and then eventually went through a very tedious path. At least there were three committee that were studied what to do with it. And the issue is also over this medium of instruction. Should the university at that level be teaching in English or are you should do teach with Chinese as the main medium of instruction? What kind of curriculum you should have and all that? So that the kind of complications it started right at the beginning of 1950s, 60s, 70s, and eventually uh, it's Lee Kuan Yew's problem. And he, through a number of steps, he decided in a way to close it by merging with the University of Singapore. Okay, so become NUS. So before NUS is SU, Singapore University, combining a Nanta, so it becomes the National University of Singapore. So that's the story of Nanta, part of this story, although my presentation focuses more on the primary and the secondary school level. Now, in terms of events that are the period of time, uh, I've got all the keywords up there. One would be decolonization, okay? So this is a very big issue about decolonization. Uh, and then when you decolonize, then how, what do you, how do you move forward? So part of the moving forward is very much tangled with education. And part of it is about citizenship. Part of it is about politics. 
So to engender the kind of new citizen, what kind of language that you should use in schools in order to have a sense of unity, okay? In order to have a sense of feeling about Southeast Asia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, this whole thing that the colonization was in a way tied up with the issue of citizenship and tied up with the another thing called education, okay? And a fourth element uh, in that landscape will be the word communism, okay? Because it's from Churchill's speech about Iron Curtain has fallen, and then China turning communist in '49, and then the whole world is sort of being polarized. So the Chinese school system sort of uh, being seen as more or less turning towards the left side. In the early years, of course, the British were already concerned as early as the 1930s onwards, because then was the Kuomintang then trying to influence them with the sort of the other part of the China politics. But after the war, is the is the communist element part which bothered the situation much more. So this whole thing, the Chinese school system being conflated with communism and all being influenced by them and how to regulate them became a major issue. So I would say uh, these are the various things: decolonization. Uh, citizenship, education, uh, Cold War. Okay. My sense of thing will be about um, uh, it's about the political transition. Uh, it's about what kind of leadership that took over after the British. That is the main key thing. So there was a tussle. The bigger electorate is actually a Chinese educated electorate purely in terms of numbers, right? But what happened is that the way the election panned out uh, is about the loss of the Chinese business influence in uh, earlier election of 1955 to David Marshall and company. And then in 1959, it was the uh, PEP and the Lee Kuan Yew, which has a segment of the Chinese educated group but eventually, as you know, move further down the road, it is actually riding the tiger and actually coming to a point they will abandon the thing. And they too become, in a way, essentially the core of the PAP leadership is still very English educated. So I will say the turning point is about the political leadership. And it was because the political leadership that decided on education policy at the time were the British, were the David Marshall, Lim Yu Hock government, or the PAP government. And because the leadership was essentially this group of people who were not that well in tune or understand or in empathy with the aspiration of the Chinese community. And that, in a sense, turned against them, in a sense. So I would say, is there a moment of that? If that composition is different, the outcome may be different. Okay, okay well, it's been a long morning. I'm sure our presenters are starting to get uh, quite hungry at this point. So. I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call the a panel at this point. I will, let's uh, thank once again our speakers, uh, Professor Kwa and Professor Huang. So for uh, presenters and invited guests, please join me in the lobby in about five minutes from now. For the rest of you, uh, we'll reconvene at two o'clock and uh, hope to see you have a good lunch and hope to see you back then. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. And uh, welcome to our second full panel of the day. Uh, this one on the theme of exhibition and research of historical Chinese culture. Um, our first speaker of this panel, Mr. Liu Suwei, is presently uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Singapore Chinese Cultural, uh, Chinese Cultural Center. Initially trained as a lawyer, he later graduated with a Master's in History of Art from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He is on secondment to the Center from the National Gallery of Singapore, where he was director curatorial collections and education. In addition to being an award-winning curator with uh, management experience, Mr. Lowe has also been involved in strategic arts planning and in pol uh, policy in Singapore's Ministry of Information, uh, sorry, Ministry of Information, Communications and the Arts. In uh, 2013 through 2014, he was the first Singaporean to be selected as an international fellow at the Clore Fellowship Program, a prestigious London-based program aimed at developing and strengthening leadership potential across the cultural and creative sectors. Uh, the title of Mr. Lowe's talk today is Singaporean, examining Chinese culture, Chinese Singapore culture through the lens of exhibition making. And if you haven't been out uh, down to the Singapore Cultural Center yet uh, to see the Singaporean exhibit firsthand, I highly recommend that you do so. It, it's really a fantastically done and engaging exhibit. 
Um, but now let us first hear what went into its creation. So would you please welcome Mr. Losawe. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for the introduction. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'll be sharing about the content and the considerations behind the curation of our permanent exhibition, Singapore Ren, which opened in February last year. The entire process took about two years, and along the way we benefited from the advice and feedback of many individuals and organizations, some of whom are here with us today. And I would like to take this opportunity to again thank uh, Professor Wang Gongwu and uh, Mr. Kwa Bak Lim uh, for their kind advice. The objective of our exhibition is to highlight what's distinctive about the Chinese Singaporean culture. In other words, we wanted to examine what made the Chinese culture here in Singapore different from what you might find in other Chinese communities around the world. And for this simple objective, the key word for us was Singapore. Singapore is both the name of a geographical location as well as a nation state. Both aspects have an impact on cultural development, but the latter is, I would say, a relatively more complex notion. The European concept of nation state is based on the principle of a group of people, usually with a common origin, language, tradition, inhabiting a defined territory and organized under an independent government. So using this definition, it then becomes clear that Singapore and most of the countries in modern Southeast Asia do not have the usual or conventional attributes of nation states. Mainly carved out of former European colonies, these nations do not have a common language, ethnicity or religion. And Singapore is a case in point. For instance, um, in a study of over 200 countries, in 2014, the Pew Research Center found that Singapore was the most religiously diverse country in the world. So this uh, chart actually shows how Singapore's religious diversity compares uh, with other countries like France, United States, and Iran. So the significance of this diversity means that most governments in Southeast Asia have to constantly pay attention to the task of nation building. This is the promotion of a common national identity so as to unite a country of disparate peoples. As most nations in Southeast Asia are relatively young, uh, most having gained independence after the end of the Second World War, national identity is still very much a work in progress. And in this task of nation building, there are several forces at work. On the one hand, the government needs to build a common national identity. And on the other hand, many have recognized that the ties of ethnicity Language, religion run deep. It is not possible nor desirable to erase such identity markers. Hence, in Singapore, the integration model emphasizing multiculturalism has been adopted rather than the assimilation model. However, I would say that the integration model is not a straightforward one. Firstly, ethnic groups do not remain static. Each group will evolve through interaction with others. Hence, the Chinese in Singapore will become distinct from other Chinese communities elsewhere and develop a distinctive Chinese identity. And the same can also be said for the Malay, Indian, and Eurasian communities in Singapore. Secondly, ethnic groups will develop shared values and norms through common experiences like studying in the same schools or living in the same neighborhoods. And over time, these shared values and norms will also develop into common Singapore identities such as a respect for diversity, the Singaporean accent, uh, the use of Singlish, and also even a love of hawker food. Thirdly, the issue of ethnic identity will become ever more complex with time. Singapore's CMIO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, others framework or method of classification will become increasingly difficult to apply. For instance, due to recent waves of migration to Singapore, there are now rising numbers of Singaporeans who do not fit neatly into the CMIO categories. In 2017, one in five marriages in Singapore were between people of different ethnicities. 
This was more than double the rate in 1997, 20 years earlier. So over time, uh, there will be more Singaporeans with mixed ancestry. So this was then the larger background context against which we developed the curatorial narrative for our exhibition. Before highlighting the distinctiveness of Singapore Chinese culture, we felt that it was important first that the exhibition should begin by examining Singapore in some detail. What are some of the special aspects about Singapore that led the local Chinese community to develop differently? And here we selected five historical, social, geographical factors as being the most significant. Firstly, for about 150 years, Singapore was a British colony. And to develop Singapore into a port city, the colonial authorities imported cheap labor from Asia, particularly China. So within about a short 100 year period, the local population expanded by more than 40 times. And the proportion of Chinese residents grew from about 30% in 1824 to about 75% in 1921. However, as the British had little concern about the social welfare of such migrants, the local Chinese community had to really fend for themselves by setting up clan associations, schools, and temples. And due to such British benign neglect, the Chinese could carry on with their traditions and practices from home without much interference. So paradoxically, this meant that some traditions like the Chong Yuan Jie, the Hungry Ghost Festival, continued to be practiced in places like Singapore long after they had faded out in China for various reasons. And moreover, uh, the Chinese government also had little interest in these migrants. In addition, British colonialism entrenched several key institutions, such as their legal and education systems. These had a deep impact on Singapore's first generation national leaders like Lee Kuan Yew and Go Keng Sui. And the use of English by the colonial government had also led to the borrowing of English loan words by the local Chinese, such as uh, De Shi, for taxi or percent as in 100 percent. This was of course later reinforced by the continuing use of English as the main working language in independent Singapore. The second aspect is being located in Southeast Asia. So being in a tropical region meant that the local Chinese had to make changes to their way of life. The hot and humid climate definitely affected the design of their homes and their clothing. So for example, the Chinese used to live in atap dwellings, very much like the indigenous people. Located far from China also meant that local Chinese did not have easy access to traditional ingredients for their home cuisine. So they started using more locally found spices, fruits, vegetable, meat products in their cooking, such as native pandan, nutmeg, torch ginger, coconut, and banana. Lastly, life in the Malay archipelago also meant that the local Chinese had to interact with the indigenous people who tended to use Malay as the common regional language. This helps to explain the prevalence of Malay in our daily language today. So for example, uh, the local Hokkien's borrowed Malay words like suka for like, kawin for marry, pasat for market, and kopi for coffee. Likewise, the Malays also came to use certain Hokkien terms like mi for noodles, uh, te for tea, tahu for bean curd, and kongsi for to share. The third aspect would be that up until the late 20th century, most Chinese migrants to Singapore came from the southern provinces of Fujian and Guangdong, so only a particular part or region of China. This is why Chinese Singaporean culture has greater influence from southern China and less from places like, say, Henan or Sichuan. Over time, the Hokkien's became the largest dialect group amongst the local Chinese. This explains why the Hokkien dialect, Minnan, played such an important role in the evolution of language in Singapore, such as the popularization of Hokkien words like Kui and Kiasu, and the use of Hokkien syntax in Singlish. These migrants came mainly in two waves. The first wave, smaller in numbers, comprised largely of Chinese traders from southern coastal cities like Xiamen, who traveled to the region from as early as the 12th century. Those who had settled down married local women, and this formed the genesis of the early Peranakan Chinese community in port cities like Malacca. Their descendants tended to adopt local habits and customs due to longer periods of settlement in Southeast Asia. So for instance, the Peranakan Chinese spoke Baba Malay, which is a hybrid language of Malay and Hokkien, 
Some also became fluent in European languages and became a middleman of sorts between Europeans and locals in the region. The second and much larger wave occurred in the 19th century when many poor Chinese from the same coastal cities left China in search of better livelihood. Cheap labor was needed to develop the new British port of Singapore. And later, of course, the rise of the tin and rubber industries in British Malaya further increased this demand for labor. Apart from better employment prospects in Singapore, the Chinese were also, we must remember, fleeing from the famine and unrest in China during this period. Uh, so we know that, for example, the Taiping Rebellion claimed about the lives of 20 million people in China. So initially, these migrants intended to return to China after they had made their money and the situation in China had improved. However, with the outbreak of the Second World War and Singapore's eventual independence, many migrants chose to settle down in Singapore by marrying local Chinese women. So hence, unlike the earlier group of Peranakan Chinese, this group tended to maintain more values and practices from China. Because most of the Chinese migrants came from Southern China, uh, they spoke Southern Chinese dialects like Hokkien, Teochew, Cantonese, Hakka, and Hainanese. So this meant that the different dialect groups in Singapore, living on a small island, had many opportunities to interact with one another, something which they did not have in China. Therefore, the different dialect groups here had access to one another's food customs, such as sampling different types of mooncakes and dumplings for mid-autumn or the Duanwu festivals. And intermarriages between dialect groups in Singapore were also much more common so compared to China in the early days. The fourth aspect would be that due to modern Singapore's origin as a colonial port city, the local population had long been very diverse. Adding to the indigenous Malays, the British colonial government imported cheap labor from India and China. It also encouraged traders from around the world, such as Arabs, Javanese, Armenians, to use Singapore as a base for their operations. And over time, the local population became predominantly Chinese due to the large numbers of workers imported from China. However, there is still a large proportion of non-Chinese minorities. Singapore's proportion of non-Chinese stands at about 25%, which is relatively large compared to other Chinese communities where the non-ethnic Chinese groups account for less than 10% of their total population. So for instance, in terms of the non-Chinese groups, Hong Kong has 8%, Beijing has 4%, and Taipei has 5%. So this means that the Chinese in Singapore have relatively more opportunities to interact with and be influenced by other ethnic communities. Due to the colonial government's hands-off attitude towards the locals, in fact, all ethnic groups were free to continue with their own ways of life in Singapore. And this state of affairs continued into the post-colonial period when the national government adopted various national policies based on multiracialism and multiculturalism. These days, new migrants bring in much needed talent to support Singapore's globalized economy and to make up for the declining birth rate. And such migrants now come from a much broader range of backgrounds. And this has led and created a Singapore that is even more diverse than before. The fifth and the final aspect um, would be that actually Singapore is a very small island with no natural resources. It has, however, a deep harbor and it sits on the crossroads of major shipping trade routes. And today, for example, Singapore is the busiest port in the world in terms of shipping tonnage with more than 130,000 vessels calling at our port annually. So since antiquity, Singapore has been a port city. So this meant that the inhabitants of Singapore has always been exposed to a constant flow of goods, ideas, and peoples from around the world. In fact, Singapore's small size means that it is always affected by larger developments externally and less likely to be insular or resistant to change. Singapore's economic survival depends on it continuing to be a hub for trading of goods and services, and the global economy must find Singapore relevant and useful to them. Hence, Singapore needs to be open to inflows of different ideas, beliefs, and ways of working. And this has, of course, been hastened by the rise of telecommunications, as well as the greater internet connectivity. So these five aspects may be distilled into or summarized into three driving forces. Firstly, what the Chinese brought with them, and these could be categorized as Chinese heritage, which includes values, belief systems, language, 
customs and food dishes that originated from China. Secondly, whom the Chinese encountered here. Chinese migrants interacted with many different peoples in Singapore. These were, they were, there, there were interactions between dialect groups as well as between ethnic groups. These cultural interactions range from the casual, say daily encounters, or deeper engagement such as intermarriages. And all these led to changes and adaptations to the way of life of the Chinese in Singapore. Lastly, how the Chinese responded to local government. Chinese migrants were also affected by how Singapore was governed, whether during the colonial period or post-independence, all governments seek to shape society to achieve certain objectives, and they often do this through public policies and laws. Hence, these three driving forces at play affect the development of local Chinese culture, Chinese heritage, cultural interactions, and public policies. In other words, these are the three underlying ingredients, if you will, that give the Chinese Singaporean's recipe its distinct flavor. These three ingredients found in many overseas Chinese communities were present in the past and continue to exist in Singapore today. The influence of each ingredient varies with time, creating complex outcomes that shape Chinese Singaporean culture. So let me give you an, an example of the three forces at work. The way that we celebrate Chinese New Year in Singapore. The festival is definitely a tradition that originated in China and as such is part of Chinese heritage. That's the first ingredient. But we all love to eat pineapple tarts and love letters for Chinese New Year. Uh, however, these are snacks which did not originate from China. In fact, these were items made popular by the Peranakan Chinese who often adopted Western techniques like the baking oven or Western ingredients like butter in their cuisine. So these types of hybrid foods are an example of cultural interaction at work, the second ingredient. Lastly, during Chinese New Year, all of us uh, have attended or would like to attend uh, mass events like Chingge Parade or River Hong Bao. And these events, if you know, did not originate in China. These are local, large-scale public events organized by the state or state-sponsored organizations. And this is an example of public policies, the third ingredient shaping the way in which Chinese New Year is celebrated here in Singapore. Now I'd like to go a little bit deeper into how we looked at the, our exhibition strategy. For an exhibition to be effective in conveying its narrative, the audience must first be very clearly identified because audiences vary in terms of language proficiency, familiarity with subject matter, and interest levels. So knowing one's audience would determine the writing of texts, the selection of themes, as well as methods of audience engagement. So whilst aiming for the exhibition to be broadly appealing to the general public, the centre eventually focused on schools as its target audience, particularly upper secondary schools, for several reasons. Firstly, schools are strategic partners because teachers in schools can actually use our exhibition for learning journeys. Secondly, we felt that teenage students are mature enough to be able to understand certain abstract concepts like culture and identity. And thirdly, it is important for the centre to be able to help shape perceptions about Chinese Singaporean culture from a young age. So with our target audience in mind, the students, the centre then deliberated on what would be the best entry points into the exhibition. What aspects of Chinese Singaporean culture would best convey the desired ideas? And what examples of Singapore Chinese culture would be of interest and relevance to young people? So the centre eventually focused on three festivals, food and language as the exhibition's thematic entry points. They were chosen because the interplay of the three driving forces I mentioned earlier could be clearly seen in the evolution of festivals, food and language. These are also aspects of daily life which young people are familiar with today. So apart from their immediate relevance, using examples from daily life would also help dispel the notion that culture is something from the past or only of interest to people who are artistically or academically inclined. I'd like now to elaborate a bit more about the thematic entry points into our exhibition. So festivals. Many of the traditional Chinese festivals celebrated in Singapore, like Chinese New Year or Mid-Autumn Festival, were originally based on seasonal changes or the needs of an agrarian society in China. 
However, Singapore is a modern city which does not have the four seasons. Hence, it was important for us in the exhibition to highlight that such festivals continue to have relevance in Singapore today because of the values which they embody rather than their original purpose. And many of these values are in fact based on Confucianism, Taoism and Buddhism, three very influential schools of thought in China which emphasize harmony in society and the universe. And the exhibition in fact focuses on 10 values treasured by the Chinese community, Zhong Xiao Ren Ai Li Yi Lian Shi Jian Yi. And I've listed down uh, what they mean uh, in the slide. Over the years, the Chinese have come to treasure these values, even though they are not unique to any ethnic group. Reflected in popular stories and even stereotypes, uh, these values are passed down through festivals, schools, institutions, and most importantly, within the family. So to emphasize that these values are passed down at home from one generation to the next, the exhibition team designed the zone to be like a home. Old windows and doors were salvaged from soon to be demolished flats in Badok and Red Hill and were repurposed into drawers and cupboards which could be opened by visitors. The drawers and cupboards contain very familiar everyday items that can be found in many homes. The concept was that each everyday item reflected a particular value, be it thrift, or loyalty. So for example, many homes would have a set of national service uniforms, the NS uniform. Uh, more than just an item of clothing, the uniforms in fact reflect that Singapore's security depends on the collective loyalty chung, of its citizens. Values are also promoted by traditional festivals like Chinese New Year, Qingming, as well as Mid-Autumn Festival. These are festivals widely celebrated by the Chinese in Singapore and by Chinese around the world. However, the, the exhibition emphasizes that festivals do not remain static, but evolve over time. So for instance, during Chinese New Year, many Chinese Singaporeans still subscribe to the traditional belief that red is an auspicious color to wear. However, the tossing of the low hei yusheng is a recent development, having been invented or made popular in Singapore uh, in the 1960s. The exhibition further highlights three other very popular festivals in Singapore, Zhongyuan Jie, uh, Jiuang Ye Tan, the Nine Emperor Gods Festival, as well as the Topek Gong Festival in Pulau Ubin. However, these festivals and folk beliefs are much less common in China today, because by the end of the Qing Dynasty, many in China felt that China needed to modernize by breaking with old traditions like Confucianism and folk beliefs, and hence, festivals with more religious associations like Zhong Yuan Jie became less common, especially after the Chinese Communist Party came to power in 1949. However, Chinese migrants in Singapore were unaffected by such developments and continued to maintain these traditional beliefs and practices. So this is a particularly distinctive aspect of Chinese Singaporean culture. The development of language in Singapore also reflects the interplay of the three driving forces here. So for this zone, the exhibition design team wanted to create a space that would resemble a housing estate playground to emphasize that cultural interactions often take place amongst children when they come together to play. And three language categories were selected to highlight how linguistic landscape in Singapore evolved. Firstly, there is the category of borrowed words. So this comes about when one ethnic community or dialect group borrows words from another group in order to facilitate communication. And in the early days, even though the ethnic and dialect groups uh, often lived apart, but their paths would still frequently cross in Singapore. For example, a Hokkien housewife might buy something from a Cantonese shopkeeper. A Teochew trader might need the services of a Malay policeman or British officer. So through these interactions, people learn bits and pieces of each other's languages. So for example, uh, you would have kampang, which is a word bar borrowed from Malay by the Chinese to refer to kampong. And pasien, as I mentioned earlier, a word borrowed from English language for percent. And this borrowing, as I said, also occurred in the other direction. For instance, kiasu, which is a Hokkien word for afraid to lose, is now part of the English language here. And tahu, which is a Hokkien word for being curt, is also used in Malay. Secondly, we have combination words. These came about because there's close and sustained interaction between two ethnic groups in Singapore and their respective languages became then familiar to each other. In early 19th century Singapore, where Malay made up the majority, 
Malay was the common language used in the region. In fact, dictionaries were published to help Chinese in Singapore to learn Malay. However, over time, due to the great influx of Chinese migrants, uh, Singapore eventually had a Chinese majority within which the Hokkien's formed the largest group. Hence, the Hokkien dialect also became commonly used by many communities here. So some, some examples of combination words would include kopi tiam. So kopi is Malay for coffee and tiam being the Hokkien word for shop. And then you could order a drink like kopi ping siu tai. So kopi is Malay for coffee, ping is Hokkien for ice, and siu tai is Cantonese for less space, meaning less condensed milk. So within one drink order, you have three different languages. And thirdly, of course, uh, we have the last category, which are created or invented words. So these are words which are created specifically to cater to unique contexts in Singapore. So for example, our public housing scheme is a big success. And so we have a word referring to HDB flats, Cheng Fu Zu. We also have an invention known as the COE, the Certificate of Entitlement. And for that, we invented a unique Chinese phrase, uh, Yong Che Cheng. So these are again terms that will not be at all familiar with other Chinese communities around the world. Food, the evolution of food also reflects this interplay of the three driving forces in Singapore. And for this zone, the exhibition team designed the space to look like a hawker center to emphasize the fact that hawker centers are again, a different type of space where peoples from different cultures and ethnic backgrounds gather to enjoy each other's cuisines. So two food categories were selected to highlight how certain local food dishes have evolved. Firstly, uh, there are local dishes which reflect interactions between two different dialect groups in Singapore. For instance, the popular Hainanese chicken rice has its origins from the Wenchang chicken dish. This was brought to Singapore by early migrants from Hainan Island. However, the Hainanese in Singapore later incorporated the Cantonese method of dipping freshly boiled meat in ice water in order to create a silky jelly-like skin. So this is an example of interaction happening between two dialect groups. Secondly, there are also local dishes which reflect interactions between two different ethnic groups in Singapore. So for instance, a very common breakfast staple at the local coffee shop is the kaya on toast, coffee, and soft boiled eggs. So this was a breakfast set first made popular by Hainanese run coffee shops. Many early Hainanese had in fact worked in British or Peranakan Chinese homes where Western style fare was eaten. This was where they learned how to cook uh, soft boiled eggs, brew coffee, and also serve toast with jam. Uh, since fruit jam was not easily available in Singapore then, then local cooks replaced it with kaya, which is a local jam uh, made with coconut, milk, eggs, sugar, and pandan leaves. The manner in which the three driving forces influence the evolution of food, language, and festivals is organic and complex. It is the cumulative result of many actions taken by different peoples and groups over many years. So hence, it is difficult, if not impossible, to attribute certain changes to specific individuals or events. So for example, researchers have still not been able to determine the first Hainanese who came up with the idea of using the Cantonese method of cooking chicken rice, or the person who first coined the term kopitiam. However, it is possible to see how the interplay of the three driving forces has had an impact on the creative output of local individuals and organizations because they have all grown up in Singapore and felt the full impact of its multicultural milieu and public policies over the years. So from its migrant beginnings, Singapore has become one of the most diverse societies in the world. And as a city state, Singapore is also one of the most globally connected places in the world. This has resulted in many Singaporeans who are open to different ideas, languages, religions, lifestyles, and points of view. So whether in the arts, in food, in popular culture, they are not bound to a fixed way of looking at the world. And the exhibition highlights a number of such cases. So for example, Kuo Pao Kun and Eric Ku were the earliest to incorporate Singapore's multilingual environments into their plays and films. Over time, it became common to hear Mandarin together with English, Malay, Tamil, and other Chinese dialects, all within one film or theatrical production. Sometimes, characters would switch between languages, a trait exhibited by many Singaporeans today. So this would lead to a genre of multilingual films and theatrical works, which is a distinctive trait of the local art scene. 
Likewise, the works of designers like Go Lai Chan and Hans Tan reflect their cosmopolitan approaches to Chinese heritage. Lai Chan is most well known for making chong sams, the Chinese uh, dress, um, making it more relevant for modern women by using more contemporary cuts as well as unconventional fabrics. Similarly, Hans Tan, a local designer, has taken the form and materials of Chinese porcelain and reinterpreted them in fresh and unusual ways. But in doing so, he provokes us to reflect on how we could relate to Chinese culture today. Lastly, the exhibition also includes individuals and companies who have had a major impact globally or internationally. So for instance, there's the prolific writer, Yu Jin, whose essays are included in textbooks in Singapore and China, and whose books have sold more than a million copies in China. Other household names include the local coffee shop chain, Yakun Kaya Toast, which now has more than 70 outlets all around the world, including the Middle East. So having shared about the exhibition, I thought it might be helpful uh, if we take a look at a video that was produced by, uh, by a local company called The Smart Local, uh, just to give you a taste of what the exhibition is like. So through the examples of festivals, food and language and the creative practice of Singaporeans, the exhibition has sought to examine how the driving forces of Chinese heritage, cultural interaction and public policies can influence Chinese Singaporean culture and identity. However, the exhibition also recognizes that there are many, many other facets like age, gender, which can have an impact on personal identity. Hence, before visitors leave the exhibition, they are asked to choose the three most important elements that make up their own identity. And then the cumulative results are then shared real time on a projection screen at the exhibition exit. In this way, visitors can see how their own personal choices compare with the aggregated results. Interestingly, the top three choices thus far are family, religion, and nationality. In contrast, age, gender, and career were considered the least important in terms of personal identity. So in conclusion, we would like to acknowledge that an exhibition like ours can really never comprehensively cover a wide and complex topic like Chinese Singaporean culture and identity. Rather, the exhibition hopes to provide an introductory framework for us to consider such issues so that the discourse can continue at opportunities like today's symposium. So on that note, I look forward to receiving your feedback on our framework and how it can be further improved. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you, Mr. Lowe, for taking us uh, through and, and behind the scenes of, of your wonderful exhibition. Um, we're going to go on, continue now with our, uh, our second speaker, uh, Professor Kenneth Dean. Uh, Professor Dean is Raffles Professor of Humanities and head of the Chinese Department at Nas National University of Singapore. He's also the research cr cluster leader for religion and globalization at NUS's Asia Research Institute. His recent publications include Epigraphical materials on the history of religion in Fujian, uh, Zhangzhou region in four volumes, uh, sorry, Zhangho region in four volumes, uh, and two co edited works, a secular, Secularism in Southeast and Southeast Asia, a massive uh, two volume work, um, and a massive two volume work, The Chinese Epigraphy of Singapore, 19, uh, 1819 through 1911. He also directed Bored in Heaven, a film about ritual sensation on the celebrations around Chinese New Year's in the city of Putian in uh, China's Fujian province. His other publications include his co-authored Ritual Alliances of the Putian Plain in two volumes, his Lord of the Three in One, The Spread of the Occult in Southeast China, and Taoist Ritual and Popular Cults of Southeast China, uh, these both latter two both published by Princeton University Press, and his uh, co-authored The Absolute State and the Body of the Despot. He's published altogether nine volumes of stone inscriptions gathered in both Fujian and Southeast Asia. His current project is the construction of a pair of interactive multimedia databases, the Singapore Historical GIS and the Singapore Biographical Database. And it is of these databases now that we are about to learn more. Uh, the title of his talk is New, New Approaches to the History of Overseas Chinese in Singapore, Introducing the Singapore Historical, Historical GIS and Singapore Biographical biographical database. Would you please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Kenneth Dean. Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize uh, that I wasn't able to join the symposium this morning uh, due to a class that I had to uh, teach uh, online. Um, so it's a pleasure to see people in person here in the audience and uh, thank all of you uh, in the online community for joining us today. Uh, the uh, This one. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, so this is the title of my talk today, and uh, I'll go right into it because I'd like to uh, discuss a few things. The Singapore Historical GIS has been up and running for a few years now. The Singapore Biographical Database uh, also was launched at the NLB uh, two or three years ago. Each of these continues to expand, and uh, we try to incorporate and add in new materials. And I'll also uh, make some mention of the Chinese epigraphy in Singapore project that we've been working on because we're trying to extract some biographical information from those sources to add to the biographical database. Um, also, I'll mention a fairly new project on Qing tombs of Singapore, which we've, uh, we're well into and hoping to uh, publish a collection of, of uh, tomb inscriptions this year. Uh, and then I'll briefly mention our plans for expanding these uh, uh, online databases uh, through first a Malaysian historical database, and uh, ultimately, of course, uh, we'd love to have a Southeast Asian historical GIS. Okay, what do these things mean? <laughs> this is the cover page for our Sing Singapore historical GIS. Um, all these projects, all such digital humanities projects are team projects involving the collaboration of many, many uh, scholars, uh, students, and uh, graduate and undergraduate students. And that's uh, certainly true about this project as well. Um, we have a, a recent article that's uh, 
in religion. So it's online and downloadable and gives a history of these, these uh, projects for you if you're interested to get more information. Um, I welcome you to look, uh, look up under religions and just download the article. Uh, what this project allows us to do is to show the locations of over 800 Chinese temples, 250 Chinese associations, five or 600 Christian churches, over 100 mosques, uh, 30 Indian temples. Uh, also, because we're able to include historical maps, layers upon layers of historical maps that were digitized and made available to us through the geography department of NUS, we can show the locations of former Kampong villages, former cemeteries, uh, over 500 Chinese schools. Uh, so the, uh, we invite you to go onto this website and see for yourselves what you can, uh, what's interesting to you. We also ask you to use the video, look at the video first, the how to use video, because otherwise there's too much information. Uh, but what the video shows you is that you can take away layers of information and then rebuild your own maps with the uh, layers that are of interest to you. Uh, basically behind this uh, website is a survey that we've done of, of many temples in the community. And I won't have time to go into a great deal detail here, but I would like to mention that the largest piece on this pie uh, it represents the uh, spirit medium altars in individual apartments in HDB blocks, many of whom do not want to be on a map and we have not put them on a map. We've put those on the map that uh, advertise their, their addresses, uh, but they still make up the largest number. Uh, and in a way, it's a very interesting uh, set of uh, temples or altars, I should say, in, in people's apart apartments, often in their living rooms. Many of these uh, uh, spirit mediums would like to have a temple of their own, and many of their followers are urge them on in this aspiration. And as they, so there's a kind of push from below to uh, create a new temple uh, from these kinds of community forces. Now, one feature of our uh, GIS that I think is very interesting is that we've incorporated uh, about 250 reports. Uh, composed by NUS students in the course of the course I was teaching this morning, uh, Everyday Life of Chinese Singaporeans, I ask uh, student groups to go out and interview Chinese temples and associations and to produce a photo essay and a uh, PDF report, all of which is available on our website for those of you who are interested to see what they found out, what, they, what they've learned. Uh, this report allows us to focus in on very interesting areas of Singapore, such as Geylang, which a uh, former red, well, still a red light district, but it's packed with temples. Uh, in very, virtually every Lorong, you can find four or five uh, temples, some churches, uh, some Tibetan monasteries, all kinds of uh, clan associations. So a very rich and complex neighborhood with very interesting historical reasons for the concentration in, in this place. So the, uh, Singapore Historical GIS allows you to zoom in on specific neighborhoods and ask questions about how they came to be the way they are, why the distributions are the way they are. Basically, we can use this as a platform to tell a very simple story about Singapore. This is a map that shows the locations in yellow of former Kampong, almost 200 villages around Singapore, with a number of their cemeteries nearby. So those purple dots are cemeteries that were associated with villages. But uh, with the rise of the HDB and you see the pink coloring behind, a lot of the villages disappeared. By the end of the 90s, there were very few left, if any, on Singapore. And some of these other areas that you see here were taken over for either military uh, or airport or uh, uh, industry. So the, the villages indeed have disappeared. This is a typical image of that process with the HDB block going up in the background and the village being torn down in the foreground. Now, many of these villages had uh, temples of their own, sometimes two or three. On the uh, left hand, right hand corner there, you can see uh, the dots that represent different temples of different villages, all of whom ended up in this joint temple or united temple, each temple being reduced down to a single altar. So the, uh, the gods of their temple would be uh, in front of that altar. Uh, sometimes as many as 13 in a single space. So we have about uh, 70 such 
joint temples in Singapore with over 350 um, temples included in them. And they represent a very interesting part of Singapore's history. Uh, the first one is from 1974, the Wu He Miao. Uh, many of them tell the stories of the movements of their communities from their villages and the effort of those communities to somehow survive to the present day uh, in, these, uh, in these somewhat reduced circumstances. Um, this is one example of one temple that's had to move four times in its history over the past uh, 50 or 60 years due to uh, constantly evolving urban redevelopment plans that has been the fate of many temples. Most temples only get a 30 year lease and so are often forced to uh, contemplate moving. Here's one temple that moved three times before giving up and then sending its gods back to Jinmen, where they had come from many years before. Uh, they gave them some money uh, to uh, set up a retirement account for the gods and uh, asked them to look after them there. Uh, but the opposite trend is the deeper historical trend. Moving from uh, Fujian, which you see here in a linguistic map, um, where you, uh, to um, zooming into the uh, mother temples of the major uh, god cults, regional gods of the uh, Hokkien community, Ma Zhu, Guangzhu Zunwang, Anxi Cheng Huang Miao, Qing Shi Zhu Shi, uh, Sheng Ho Anzhu on Jinmen and Bao Shan Dadi near Xiamen. Now all of these uh, gods have a set of temples here in Singapore and one can trace the generation by generation spread of this uh, division of incense network across Southeast Asia. Uh, as you can see in this uh, one illustration. We'd have to go into much more detail to describe how it really worked locally. Um, another feature we've added recently to our SHGIS are the financial accounts of most of the religious institutions in Singapore that are registered uh, charities. So it's possible to, uh, to download the uh, annual finances for the last three years for several hundred temples, and we can do interesting analysis of the uh, religious economy of Singapore through these uh, resources. So uh, there's lots in this uh, website. I encourage you to uh, look into it and, and see if you find something interesting for yourselves. And also if you find errors to let us know. Now moving on to the biographical database. Uh, this is a uh, web representation of the relationships of, of several hundred key Singaporeans with several hundred more <laughs> Singaporeans. It's a uh, it's uh, based on uh, uh, Dr. Kwa's uh, 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 which includes uh, uh, 1,278 biographies of historical Chinese Singaporeans. We've also drawn on uh, Song Long Xiang's 100 Years of Chinese in Singapore. Uh, and we've worked with the NUS Chinese Library on their collection of the Nanyang Mingren Ji Chuan. Um, which includes many people from the 30s and the 20s and 30s uh, in this region. Um, we're now looking to find ways to incorporate more materials from our epigraphy studies. So we found in our first two volumes over 40,000 individual donor names and over the names of about 10,000 Shang Hao or Chuan Hao uh, that were active in that early period. Meanwhile, we've also digitized the Bukit Brown burial record of 68,000 individuals' names but it's very difficult to move from those English recorded sources to the Chinese uh, tomb inscriptions because there can often be a delay in the burial and uh, the transcriptions reflect many different dialects. So we're still working on trying to uh, connect those kinds of data. Uh, and we're working, also thinking very hard about working with the library further on uh, the collections, there's an incredible collection of uh, regional and clan association commemorative volumes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lee of the library uh, spent years going around to Huiguan to collect these sources of which there are several hundred. There are 1,200 in all Singaporean libraries. And we believe we're now working with uh, groups in Malaysia to try to expand their uh, catalog of those sources to include additional sources found in Malaysian Huiguan. Um, we're very eager to work on genealogies. We know there are about 100 interesting genealogies here in Singapore. Uh, but so far people haven't really done the work to trace them back. Uh, people in Zhangzhou put together a collection of about 600 of their genealogies and found uh, several hundred in Taiwan that they could link directly to those genealogies. Uh, what generation, what person went uh, to Taiwan and what the uh, continued connections and circulations may have been. Uh, 
we believe we can do a great deal of the similar kind of research with uh, Singapore sources in the future. Um, I'm happy to say that Paul Kratowska's index to the colonial archives has now been digitized by the library. And uh, that's a really great resource, which we can uh, look forward on drawing on individuals' names out of there as well. Uh, so the Qing tombstones that I'll introduce in a moment are also another source, uh, and many more sources are available in the National Archives. So all of these projects link together uh, through the types of uh, institutions and archives that you see uh, listed on this slide. So um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. For those of you who are interested, please download the article from Religions, and you can get a lot more information there. These are the inscription volumes that uh, uh, Professor Cook very kindly uh, mentioned just a moment ago. Um, they include about uh, 1,200 inscriptions uh, from uh, uh, the about 70 or 70 odd uh, sites around Singapore. Now, for each of those, what we do is put the text into a computer text. Uh, something called Textual Enhancement Initiative allows us to transfer those texts into a computerized and searchable database. Uh, so we put the text in like that in the original format and then into a computer format. And then we can extract uh, individuals' names and the names of organizations from there. Um, this is just more detail on that. Several of them overlap with those already in our biographical database. And so we're excited to find uh, some uh, such uh, development of frequency counts uh, that tell us something about not only the leading elites, but also the middle men who uh, uh, helped things develop between institutions. Uh, in this case, these are all individuals' names <laughs> centered in various major institutions, but a lot of them intersect in smaller institutions uh, where they also contributed to a, uh, to a smaller type of uh, either huiguan or temple. Okay, this is, these are kinds of graphic representations of a family business, the Xie, Xie Eqin's family business and all of his uh, in, intimate collections. You can see how densely uh, uh, located it is on this screen. This uh, is one for the Tan Tok Seng and the Hokkien communities. Instead of working on a family business model, they worked on a trading model where they work uh, with several groups uh, simultaneously, develop uh, banks and insurance companies and create a kind of a climate of interaction, uh, which uh, well, both of these models have uh, imp impacts on Singapore today, which we could discuss. Uh, this is the next volume. Uh, I was very happy to see Mr. Lowe here today because I can personally thank him for the support of the Singapore <laughs> Center for Chinese Culture, uh, which has helped sponsor this second volume, a second set of volumes that we're working on now starts out with the Singapore Chamber of Commerce and other famous temples uh, that have inscriptions after 1911 uh, or 12. Um, we've found about uh, another 1200 uh, artifacts with inscriptions in these, which we're going through and translating and classifying and, and hope to publish sometime later this year. Uh, Singapore in the early period was clustered around uh, the river and then there were lots of Gambier plantations elsewhere. Uh, the Ten Ho King on Telakoyer Street overlooked the sea. Some of you may not know that, some of the newer visitors to Singapore. Uh, this is the temple today. Uh, and these are some of the inscriptions and the materials that we've worked into our uh, databases um, by first typing them out in this format and then putting them into a computer format. And same with these uh, inscriptions. The Hang Shan Ting is a very interesting story because uh, it was in Tiong Bahru, unfortunately burned down in 1992. Uh, it was very beautiful in its heyday. And it uh, was the, and this was its uh, regulations, which survived, this plaque survived and is in the Nanan Huiguan um, uh, exhibition hall. Uh, this uh, is part of a, this, the, the Heng Shan Ting was the cemetery organization for the Hokkien people. And so they kept, there was a cemetery in Tung Baru, it expanded there, soon it filled in. And uh, as the Singapore General Hospital expanded, they took more and more parts of the cemetery. So the uh, Hang Shan Ting organized a Xin Hang Shan Ting, a new Hang Shan Ting out in what's as close to Bukit Brown. We all know about Bukit Brown, but some people may not realize that there was originally three or four other cemeteries there, the Seon Soa, 
the Lao Sua and the these were and the Hokkien Huiguan Cemetery were all in the area before the colonial government cut out a piece uh, for the establishment of the Bukit Brown in 1922. Um, and in these places, we have found a great many clusters of Qing Dynasty tombs, as you can see from this, this list here. Um, one particular set along Onriat Road, which is a closed off road off of Mount Pleasant, had, had the earliest tombs that we found in Singapore, um, and about 450 of them. Meanwhile, as you know, the highway went through Bukit Brown and, and several thousand tombs had to be exhumed. Amongst that number, th about 336 dated to the Qing Dynasty, but we have at least the photographs and inscriptions that we've been able to take from those. In our own field work, we found almost 200 more in Bukit Brown and uh, almost 200 in Lao Sua. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Mr. Raymond Go, who has gone around and found all these inscriptions and brought many families back to their uh, ancestors' tombs over the past years. His website, which has recently gone up, has uh, over 360 uh, tombs that we don't yet have uh, information on. Uh, David Ching, very earlier on, worked on some inscriptions and we have other scattered tombs. By these, I include the, uh, uh, the tombs of founders such as Tan Tok Seng and Xie uh, Qin. St. Joseph's Christian Cemetery has, has about uh, close to 100, and the Japanese cemetery has the tombs of many Kari uh, uh women forced into prostitution in the early period. So in total, we think we may have close to 2,000 Qing Dynasty tombstones in Singapore, which is a fairly significant part of the material cultural heritage of the island. Um, Tan Tok Seng right here and his tomb. <laughs> this is the tomb of his uh, son, uh, Tan King Ching. In the old days, it was out in Chang'e with beautiful uh, ornamentation in front of it. Uh, later, it was moved uh, into Book Brown and is, this is the way it is now. Uh, this is Xie Qin's tomb some years ago. But more recently, it's grown over and all the moss has completely covered it up. So it really also requires sustained uh, uh, care to uh, turn it into an important monument of national history and heritage. Uh, these are some of the early tombs down in Tiong Baru, Hung Shan Ting down below. And these are the movements over time into the new cemetery. So these are, this is sort of what this, these clusters look like. They're all set in just the tombstone in, in various sectors. We found a bunch in the forest near Onriat Road. This is the earliest tomb we found before Singapore, 1826. Um, we also found the earliest mention of a Buddhist monk in Singapore, a couple, two or three monks actually, uh, from 1847 and his disciple from 1859. <laughs> and we we're able to trace back because of the names on the tombstones, the points of origins for many of these people. A great many of the ones in the Hang Shang Ting, uh, the Xin Hang Shang Ting, uh, Hokkien Huiguan Cemetery, came from one village uh, uh, outside of, uh, it's called Xie Chang, and it's near Haichang in Zhangzhou. So I went to visit. It turns out to be the same village uh, that Tsai Shi Zhang, the Kapidan of Malacca came from. And he had gone back to that same uh, Jia Miao and rebuilt the ancestral hall. And there's an inscription under his name there where he explains he's bringing his father and grandfather's Shenzhou Pai back and then his grandson came back and did the same thing for him. Uh, so there are a couple of inscriptions uh, showing these uh, ties were very uh, connected to that uh, uh, place in, in uh, Haichang. But the ones here in the jungle seem to have very few descendants and may represent a real difference in class and uh, maybe a coolie con contingent out of the same village. It's a very big Thai lineage now covering about 20 or 30,000 people in, in a a dozen villages nearby, uh, side by side. Really an uh, interesting story though. Uh, and we think we can do more with this type of research. Finally, I wanted to say that we're expanding into Malaysia and we've uh, added several thousand points for temples and different sorts of associations in uh, Malaysia. Uh, for example, in uh, uh, Penang and its surroundings, we can zoom down to find different categories of temples and distributions. We can add in uh, materials from uh, field work these green points are added to our by fieldwork, and we hope to include the Xin Sun as one major element in our research moving forward, uh, because they remain uh, very interesting and complex centers of, of Chinese uh, everyday life in in Malaysia. Many are many temples in them moved from other locations. Um, 
This is the last thing I'll show you. This is a, a project on Sinkawang, uh, where we have a lot, located lots of locations of temples around the region. Um, for each of those temples, we can, we've added some photography. Uh, this one includes a shrine to Lo Fang Bo <laughs> uh, amongst the other deities. He's the founder, he's the head of the, one of the great Gong Si that uh, had an independent kingdom in Borneo for about 80 years, uh, uh, run by Hakka gold miners, um, and uh, some architectural plans uh, to show the layout of these temples. So I think my time is up, uh, but uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to share some of our, our recent uh, developments, and uh, we look forward to your comments and suggestions. Thank you. Well, thanks, Professor Dean, for your very uh, detailed and informative introduction. It's incredibly useful resources. Um, we'd like to now in invite you and uh, Mr. Lowe back onto the stage for some uh, question and answers. Um, we have about uh, 20, let's say, maybe 25 minutes for uh, Q&A. Um, and I guess we'll, we'll start with a question from the audience. Or actually, are there any coming in from the Zoom feed yet? Uh, yeah, so uh, this question maybe can be directed at both of you. So um, what, uh, what kind of progress do you think that Chinese Singaporean culture will chart into the future? Um, I guess it's hard to say, but you know, uh, looking at the framework that I spoke about just now, uh, looking at it, you know, quite simplistically, at the three driving forces: Chinese heritage, uh, cultural interactions, and public policies. I would say that in the coming years, it's probably the the latter two driving forces that will become uh, more significant. Uh, the diversity uh, in Singapore is definitely becoming a lot more complex. Uh, even though we maintain, say, the ethnic representation in Singapore with 75% Chinese, uh, but the types of Chinese that are uh, here in Singapore is becoming very diverse. Uh, we have migrants uh, from Northern China now, uh, different parts of China, not just Southern China. So they bring it with, it, with them a different uh, complexity. And of course, the third or the last uh, aspect of public policies uh, would again have a significant impact on how culture develops in Singapore, how Singapore government, how Singapore is governed as a country, and of course, uh, how Singapore government responds to external developments, be it the rise of China or uh, other kind of uh, yeah, global factors. I, I completely agree uh, with Mr. Lowe's uh, statements. I'd like to make a, a pitch for the importance of heritage uh, nonetheless, which may in fact tie into policy. Uh, if there is enough interest amongst younger generations, and I think the center's efforts to educate the young on this topic is a really, very big part of that process. There may be a growing sense that Singapore has reached a kind of a tipping point in its, its progress and that there is no time and space to uh, consider the past uh, and, and heritage issues even more than has perhaps been possible uh, up till now. So uh, there seems to be a growing uh, commitment to this type of thing. And I think the center's establishment is an indication of that. Uh, and the kinds of research that's going on uh, in many sectors is also indicative of growing interest in, in heritage. So I, I do hope that uh, heritage doesn't fall behind in, in the, uh, the three driving factors in, in the future. I would very much agree with Kenneth. I think the, the, the high level of public interest over the fate of Bukit Brown I think signals this. Uh, it's not just you know from a group of historians who are interested, uh, but ordinary Singaporeans have been galvanized by 
uh, the fate of Bukit Brown and how it's been able to, to, to unearth a, a wealth of information about us that we didn't know before. So I, I think uh, it, it speaks, it bodes well uh, for a growing sense of uh, the importance of Chinese heritage in Singapore or heritage in general. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, thanks. So thank you very much for the very interesting and um, what seemed uh, on the surface to be quite different presentations, but I think it kind of ties up quite nicely because of what Dr. Lowe said about, you know, in your kind of survey of people who come in and you ask them what are the sources of um, Chinese identity for them. And I think you named family and religion as the top two. And that ties directly into Ken's talk. <laughs> and so I'm actually really struck by the density of um, the kind of network of Chinese temples, Chinese religious institutions in Singapore. And I, I thought that um, Professor Wang's talk in the beginning, you know, about like what is Chinese identity in Singapore. Um, and it just all made me think that, you know, what is this? deep kind of, um, I mean, I wouldn't say obsession, but, you know, this kind of deep feeling for, for the, uh, you know, for the ancestral kind of, you know, what seems to me like an ancestral link, um, but maybe they're not. And so how do these um, elements of family and religious identities, which are centered in, in, in basically religious practices in Singapore, how do you think that connects really to the sense of identity of being Chinese uh, with the kind of like, you know, the home provinces of Fujian and Teochew. So I'm interested in like the, the provinces, uh, the regions of China where, where most of the Singaporean Chinese come from and the current practices of religion here, which seems to have quite a lot of this kind of heritage identities, uh, but is it really about connections with China? Or is it actually about using um, these um, heritage connections to create new identi identities of Chineseness in Singapore? Um, okay, I can't say I've, we've done much research uh, regarding the importance or significance of religion to the sense of Chineseness amongst uh, local Singaporeans, uh, but one. Thing that we have observed, and this is uh, shown in our exhibition, in the sections where we talk about the popularity of the three festivals, uh, Chong Yuan Jie, Jiu uh, Wang Ye Dan, the Nai Emperor Gods Festival, as well as the Tope Gong Festival on Pulau Ubin, we made the deliberate decision of using video clips as our display materials. And these are all contemporary clips, meaning they were shot or filmed in the last five or 10 years. And then when you look at these clips, these video clips, it's quite surprising. Many of the devotees or worshippers taking part in these ceremonies or practices are young Singaporeans. If you look at their faces uh, and, and you know, uh, what, what they are doing, uh, in fact, uh, there are many younger Singaporeans who, who take part in, 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 in such uh, either folk beliefs or religious practices. And uh, I, I, I believe that you're right to say that a religion uh, plays, still plays an important role uh, in their day-to-day -day life. And in that sense, probably also plays a role in their sense of identity. I think those three uh, rituals are very well chosen uh, because they also uh, display a, a range of practices in which there's been an increasing a localization of Chinese identity. Uh, through the Zhong Yanjie uh traditions here in Singapore, there's really quite something quite unique has taken shape. It's quite uh, extraordinary uh, to see it developing uh, on, into a very big online phenomenon recently too. Uh, the uh, uh, Nine Emperor Gods are very hard to find an origin in China to this tradition. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of whether Thailand or Phuket or somewhere else may have been the first place where these practices uh, took the shape they have now and then spread through Malaysia to Singapore where there are 16 temples on the island. Uh, 
uh, worshiping them in different ways. Uh, so uh, there again, I totally agree with Mr. Lowe that the young people's participation is increasingly interesting. Uh, sometimes I think that people have replaced incense with a, a cell phone, <laughs> but they still show a great deal of attention and, and, and interest in the object of their uh, observation. And through that social media, uh, there's a greater impact to these uh, events even than the, the very increasing numbers of people involved uh, would allow. But this is a kind of a Southeast Asian developed ritual that spread across the Chinese communities here. And that's very interesting. And uh, Pulau Ubin is a fascinating case where there's the Chinese temple, but also the, uh, the karamat of the Islamic holy man and his, his family. And there's uh, inscriptions above it in several languages, uh, which uh, detail the possession of a spirit medium on Rangoon Street here in Singapore by the, the lady of that tomb uh, at a certain point in the 1930s. And it was so, such an interesting phenomenon of transcultural interaction that it was recorded in several languages uh, on inscriptions above the tomb. So again, the intercultural uh, dimension is, is a really interesting develop, possible development for Singapore in the future. Uh, places like Loyang Dabogong include in them a Hindu shrine to Ganesh, uh, a karamat, and uh, various Chinese Tudigong uh, deities, uh, yin and yang. <laughs> so uh, uh, very interesting possibilities for future uh, explorations of Chinese identity within Singapore. I'd just like to share a little bit more about the another layer of diversity or interaction that you see at the Pulau at, at the Topekong Festival in Pulau Ubin. Uh, the Ta Po Gong Miao in Pulau Ubin is actually on Buddha's Hill, Fo Shan. It's called Fo Shan Ta Po Gong Miao. And uh, this particular Topekong, uh, unlike the other Topekongs on the island, uh, on Singapore Island, has chosen a different birthday for itself. Uh, because it's located on Buddha's Hill, so it has decided or it's told its worshippers uh, that its, its, its birthday is actually Visak Day. So it's decided to adopt uh, a Buddhist date as, as its own birthday. So therefore, the Topekong worshippers on Pulau Ubin uh, celebrate Topekong's birthday on Visak Day. So that's another. I, I, I just misspoke. I just realized when you were explaining that. I was thinking of the Gusu Island uh, uh, pilgrimage, which I thought was also very interesting because of this mix. But this is a wonderful uh, example of, of a Dabogong adapting a Vesak day, which is itself a compromise between the Theravadan and Mahayana groups here in Singapore to, to select that day for the Buddhist birthday. Question from the online audience. Uh, so this is a question for Professor Dean. Uh, it's very exciting to learn about the SHGIS digital platform. And are there any plans in the pipeline to expand on these resources and include representations of other ethnicities in Singapore? Yes, thank you. Uh, we do have uh, location information for uh, several uh, 600 churches, uh, uh, 100 mosques, and, and uh, 20 or 30 Indian temples. And we very much look forward to working with uh, communities, uh, students, and uh, members of the public to expand our coverage of those, uh, those sites. Uh, the the uh, Commission of Charities information covers all those sites. So it's now possible, uh, at least at the uh, kind of economic analysis level, to, to compare quite detailed uh, records of these different institutions in recent years and their activities. Uh, but we hope to add uh, more uh, information on the cultural and historical dimensions of these uh, sites. Some of them are very new and very big and growing fast. <laughs> and there is something to watch. Uh, they're very going to play major increasingly important roles in uh, Singapore's future as well. So thank you for the question. Uh, Professor Kwa. different picture will I get about being a Chinese from visiting the Chinese Cultural Center in Waterloo Street? What is the difference between the two? How will you position yourself? Uh, so um, just to share, the organization of the building at Waterloo Street or Queen Street is the China 
cultural center. Uh, so that's really an extension of the Chinese government. It's very much like you know how Goethe Institute is associated with the French government, British Council with the British government. So the China Cultural Center um, doesn't have a permanent exhibition. Uh, it's mainly a programming space. And I think they also have a very good library. And the intent and purpose of the China Cultural Center is really to showcase uh, art and culture from China. So they often bring in groups, uh, exhibits from China, and then uh, share them with the public. Uh, so at my center, which is the Singapore Chinese Cultural Center, Singapore Huazhu Wen Hua Zhongxin, I guess we are doing it in a different manner, in a sense that what we want to show and highlight and promote are Singapore groups, individuals. So the works uh, presented by Singapore arts and cultural groups with a connection uh, to Chinese culture. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we decided that we wanted to set up a permanent exhibition uh, that is open every day and free to the public um, to show that, in fact, the, the Chinese culture in Singapore, although rooted in Chinese heritage, has a very different complexion because it has grown up or evolved in a very different context. And that, that, that context is very much rooted in the very uh, diverse or multi-ethnic, uh, multicultural uh, society that, uh, that has evolved here in Singapore. So I, I believe it should present a very different experience uh, when visitors come uh, to our center. Okay, next question. Okay, Professor Kwa and then... want to uh, get your view, what is your perception on Singapore Chinese? So this question is for Mr. Lo and Mr. Professor Lin. Um, so I guess for us, uh, for me, uh, I would see uh, the issue of Singapore Chinese uh, culture or identity um, being very much bound uh, to both ethnic identity, but more with the whole uh, process of nation building. Uh, so national identity uh, that plays a very important role. So hence um, the the title or the subtitle of our exhibition is, uh, is Singapore Ren, uh, Discovering Chinese Singaporean Culture and not Discovering Singaporean Chinese Culture. So for us, uh, the, it's Singapore culture at the core and Chinese being the adjective to describe uh, this Singapore culture. Uh, so hence, I, I think, uh, to answer your question, uh, the Singapore Chinese culture is one where it's rooted, the core uh, is a national one. And I think it's the ethnic identity that kind of distinguishes uh, uh, fellow citizens uh, from one another. Yeah. I've only had the privilege of visiting Singapore over the past uh, 12 or 15 years. I think I came in the early, late eighties for the first time. Uh, for a Taoist event. Uh, and I've been at NUS for six years. Uh, so I don't consider myself uh, an expert in the way that many in the audience are. Uh, I, I do think it's useful to uh, study Singapore in uh, Chinese uh, culture in relation to uh, the broader Southeast Asian context and the historical uh, developments that have led to the uh, remarkable success of Singapore. Uh, I think success has its prices sometimes, and that's why I, I encourage more research on heritage and, uh, and history and rethinking alternatives uh, to the built environment. Um, and I am deeply impressed uh, by the density of religious activity in a post-secular state. Uh, so I find, uh, I find Singapore uh, fascinating and, and Chinese culture here extraordinarily interesting. I think there are lots of complex issues that Singaporean Chinese will have to uh, work through and resolve in the future. But uh, 
if if there's any way that our work can contribute to building up the historical resources for that uh, process, we're we're happy to to do that, and uh, we're very grateful, as I mentioned, to the Singapore uh, uh, Chinese Cultural Center and uh, various uh, institutions, MOE and other MCCY, HDB, and, and HB of all supported our research. So I think that speaks to uh, a growing interest and a growing need to train even more Singaporean researchers in these fields uh, so that they can uh, further the process of imagining Singapore's future together. Yeah, I think we have time for another question from the online audience. Uh, with the movement of temples and clan associations over time due to land pressures, a lot of artifacts would be lost along the way. So do the Singapore Chinese Cultural Center or NUS have plans to systematically reach out and help collect these items and documents? So maybe I'll start first. Um, I have to answer your question by saying yes and no. Uh, no, in a sense that uh, because we, we the cultural center is not set up to be a museum uh, nor an archive, so we would not be in a position to be able to acquire or to collect uh, such materials. Uh, but we do want to play a facilitative role. Uh, so over the years, uh, we have put in place uh, grants, uh, schemes, uh, either grant schemes for research or publications. Uh, schemes uh, for supporting publications. Um, so that's, I think, the way in which uh, we can play a role uh, in this task. I think NUS is also somewhat limited. Uh, the museum here is excellent, but small. Um, and that's a problem perhaps for the entire museum infrastructure uh, in, in Singapore. Uh, I think we may have to start to get very creative in thinking of alternative ways to uh, rework the material culture of the past into future possibilities. I'm thinking of a, uh, of a cemetery in England that's uh, reworked itself into a kind of a cultural venue that includes a lot of historical information, walks and tours, but also has uh, all kinds of cultural activities, cafes and, and uh, restaurants. Um, also working very closely with environmentalists uh, and architects to design uh, interesting ways to rework uh, material culture of the past into contemporary displays or contemporary uh, interactive spaces. So I do hope that there can be more such creative thinking uh, in the future. Uh, one example might be the Japanese cemetery, uh, which is a public park and is very well kept and is a very interesting place to visit and very peaceful, and beautiful site in Singapore as well. I can imagine some of the cemetery spaces developing in that direction. There's been a great, already a great deal of, of work from grassroots groups. Uh, the the Tung Baru local history groups have included Tan Tok Seng's tomb in their walking tour of Tung Baru and helped uh, repair some of the pathways and, and uh, railings. Uh, there's efforts on the part of the All Things Book at Brown group to uh, identify tombs, create walking tours with apps that you can walk through with your phone and find out uh, as you go uh, what you're seeing. Uh, many more such projects could be done. Uh, but again, it's uh, really quite an urgent question because uh, development is, never stops in Singapore, as we know. And so there uh, are frequently moments of, of where decisions will have to be made uh, for preservation or or not. So I, I do hope there can be more creative thinking in this area. And I thought that one creative solution were in fact offered by the temples here. The 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 idea of united temples, where I know uh, several temples come together uh, to share resources. So that might be a way for clan associations to kind of creatively uh, look for a solution uh, to optimize uh, their own resources. Okay, we're just a couple of minutes over now. I think uh, we'll have to uh, to uh, conclude at this point. So, um, thanks once again, Mr. Lowe and Professor Dean, for uh, for your wonderful talks and um, a round of applause. And um, we'll uh, reconvene in about half an hour at uh, four o'clock for our final panel today. Thank you. <laughs>
panel of today um, on the theme of the articulation of Chinese identities in Singapore. Our first speaker of this panel is Professor Kwa Chong Kwan, of, uh, uh, um, who is a senior fellow at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, RSIS, at Nanyang uh, Technological University, as well as an honor honorary adjunct associate professor in the history department here at NUS. As senior fellow at RSIS, he supports a series of regional security projects with other regional institutions, ranging from maritime security to energy security, cybersecurity, nuclear energy safety and security, and biosecurity. He's also co-chair of the Singapore Member Committee of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific. Um, and in that capacity was elected as the ASEAN co-chair of that council for the years 2011 through 2013. And he is the RSIS board member of the China Southeast Asia Research Center on the South China Sea, which brings together six Southeast Asian policy institutes to work with China's National Institute for South China Sea Studies. In all of his work on security studies and international relations in Southeast Asia, Professor Kwa's research is underpinned by history and a focus on the implicit narratives underlining our framing of regional security. At the History Department of the uh, National University of Singapore and at the Archaeological Institute uh, at the ISEAS uh, Yusuf Ishak Institute, he is interested in issues pertaining to the long cycles and deep history of Southeast Asia. He's author of numerous articles, edited volumes and books, including Singapore Chronicles, Pre-Colonial Singapore, published in 2017, and 700 Years, A History of Singapore, co-authored with uh, Derek Hung, uh, Peter Borsberg, and Tan tai uh, and published in 2019 as an updated version of the work that they had published 10 years earlier. And I'll also mention again that he is, along with uh, Kwa Bak Lim, the co-editor of the English version of A General, a general History of, Chinese in, of the Chinese in Singapore, and a contributor to, contributor to a, of a couple of the original uh, chapters written specifically for that edition. Uh, the title of Professor Kwa's talk today is Shaping Singapore's Chinese Identities. Would you please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Kwa Chong Kwa. Thank you, Rocco. I am sorry you had to read out that very lengthy biography. Uh, I should have shortened it. I didn't know you were going to read out everything. But as I said, it's already there on the screen and you just simply said, I will leave you to read it faster than I can speak it out for you. So I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, contribute to this Yale and US uh, Zoom webinar. It was a surprise, a pleasant surprise, an invitation which I could not turn down. And I'm delighted that you allowed me to speak to this topic that I have uh, agreed to on shaping Uh, on the factors and drivers shaping Singapore's Chinese identities. And basically, I want to make the point that there are four here an evolving local Straits Chinese identity, the base. And I want to argue that there was a push and pull factor of China and the attractions of British colonialism and the imperatives of post World War II decolonization and nation building. In all of this, as the second last speaker, I have nothing new to say. Uh, our keynote speaker, Prof Wang, has already covered all of this, and I'll be adding a few footnotes only to what he has said this morning, and also what my colleague, Prof Wang Jianli, has said. And the last one, so he has already covered in some detail. Yeah. So I'm sorry that I have nothing more new to say. So, first, um, I start with who did Tan Tok Seng think he is? Well, I stand to be corrected by Mark Lin and by Kendine, who have been looking into this in greater detail, but basically the facts that we know of Tan Tok Seng are there, that he was the first of the Malaccan Chinese to respond to Farkas' uh, 
invitation to come down to Singapore. And we know that he started out as an itinerant hawker and he really made his break when he teamed up with the British merchant J.H. Uh, Whitehead to go into land speculation. And then he rose to be the uh, leader of the Malacca Chinese community and rebuilt the Machu Temple, which you all have been looking at on the screen for the whole of today and contributed to what is today the Tan Tok Seng Hospital. What is interesting here is that the, uh, how he signed himself off and that dedication stele. The stele is now in the Tan Tok Seng Hospital Heritage Center. And right at the end there, after all the usual, you know, my compassion has led me to do this and to do that and all that. He says, this is my preface. Uh, he did this in the Qing Dynasty, 25th year of the Taoguan reign or 1845. And he says, Tan Tok Seng, Qing Town, Zhangzhou Province, the Prefecture, Fujian Province. So quite clearly, Tan Tok Seng saw himself in his ancestral village in Fujian and part of a century old extensive network of Chinese trading communities in the Nanhai. He was in effect, as Professor Huang has often reported, the basic pattern of Huashang. He was a migrant trader who maintained his links with his homeland. And in today's language, in the time also, he was basically a comprador linking his uh, Hokkien trading world with that of the colonial trading world. And this world was the dialect group, the Bang, and he was focused on the temple, Tian Hock King, that he contributed, I think, $3,000 to the building of. And we have been looking at this silhouette for the whole of today in the slides there. The Hokkien trading world, I've argued elsewhere, is very well defined in this uh, map, Southern, what has been called the Southern map. Uh, of the British uh, jurist John Selden, dated around 1620. That is a very unusual map. And if you want, we can discuss it a bit more at the question time. It's a very unusual map which shows the trading routes. So the second map in black and white with all those black lines and highlighted are the trading routes of the Hokkien merchants in the 17th century. Tan Tok Seng was very much a member of that Hokkien trading world that extended from Japan right down to Southeast Asia and up the Malacca Straits. So, the Tian Hao King wasn't the only temple. The Wok Ai Cheng Biao in Philip Street is the oldest uh, Teichu temple. And in this photo here, you see the architect, my young colleague, Yeo Kang Shaw, who was largely responsible for the research into the architectural history of the temple, which, as he deduced, was orientated to serve the Teichu Gambia planters in that uh, region there, in the area. As we all know, the Teichu Gambia planters predated the arrival of Raffles. And of course, as I'm discussing during break time, the Heng San Teng Temple on Silat Road, who was, which was constructed by Si Hut Ke, who came to Singapore with Tan Tok Seng, but was already a merchant of standing and could build this cemetery temple in 1827, long before Tan Tok Seng was anybody. And the temple uh, is now a new, Sin Hai King, Sin Hai King Temple at Bukit Brown, Kopi Swan, they call it there. So the color photo here is from a collection taken by the photographer, by the guy, Ronnie Pinsler, way back before 1992. We have very few photographs of this temple, I think. Here. I stand to be corrected by Ken Dean, but very few here. So what we have here, and I go on to the next point, is that we have the push 
China from the 1840s to the 1930s. Uh, Hong Kong diaspora, which was centered around the emergence of the Tianhui, the secret societies, as the British call them, to manage the flow of the Hong Kong to Singapore. And the, to do this through the establishment of Kongsis or trading companies to control the Peace uh, Hong Kong. So, the, what we were taught in our history in primary school, secondary school, the Gihin uh, were a secret society. They were also a uh, Kongsi engaged in business to support their activities there. So what we have here is you can see in the three photos, how we have remembered this uh, Hong Kong diaspora on in a bronze statue on the banks of the Singapore River near the bridge there. And that pattern continued as you can see, as all of us may, some of us may remember in our memories, these uh, Chinese coolies carrying these, unloading these uh, cargoes along the Singapore River. And again, we have seen that in earlier slides that our colleagues showed this morning there. So basically, I think as we can come up in the earlier presentations, these uh, Kongsis, these triads were a challenge to the colonial authority and how the colonial authorities had to react to them, as Bucklin has uh, pointed out again there. It was a challenge also to the first, to the Malacca Chinese who controlled the uh, temples and the banks. The third driver here that I would suggest to you is about the Liu of colonialism that uh, yes, Tan Tok Seng and his colleagues, his generation came as compradors. But by 1840s, 1850s, certainly in the 1860s, they had become collaborators in the British, with the British in the building of the empire. Collaborators to maintain their position with the British of their control of the Chinese communities here. Uh, secondly, to join the British in the opening up of the Malay Peninsula, tin mining, timber, and the other natural products of the peninsula. And finally, the attractions of turning to English education. So here you see the picture of the 1867 uh, Legislative Council. Harry Oat, I think, is the man there in the gown. And you see one of them, I forget who is that uh, person in that Chinese dress uh, costume there. And this other photograph here is the first batch of Queen's scholars that went off to London, to UK for education. And the guy at the corner there sitting down, that's Lim Boon King. And the other guy is Song Ong Xiang. So you see here this turn to collaborating. And of course, in the wider context of empire history, it's nothing new. In India, the Raj turned to collaborate with the British in ruling the country, India. There's a very interesting quote here of this new evolving lifestyle by the British uh, colonial author, born 1879, about the Malacca Babas who can claim no connection with China, but continue to maintain the links, the traditions of China. And yet, basically what he's saying is that outside of those swinging doors, they were very British. They had their clubs, they conform, but once behind the swinging doors, they became entirely retreated to a very Chinese uh, world there. And you can find similar comments by other British commentators of this uh, very divided, divided uh, style of living of the evolving local Chinese community. So all this is builds up to the point that 
Wang was making this morning, that uh, there was a very clear, there was a very clear divide, two worlds between the local born Chinese and the new immigrant Chinese, the Sinkeks, the Hong Kong here. And I would suggest to you that by the turn of the century, Tan Jiak Kim was the quintessential Baba with one foot in the colonial world, one foot in the uh, Baba Chinese world. And these three photos, I think, makes the point there. Uh, you see him in his traditional costume with his family and his house. The house used to stand on River Valley Road, Bang Lima Prang, it was called, just in front of the junction of River Valley and St. Thomas Walk there. And uh, from that, you can see the lifestyle that we're leading. There is now, in fact, a very interesting private museum run by a medical doctor, owned by a medical doctor, where he has re replicated much of this uh, Baba house of the early 20th century. And in the bottom there is the funeral hearse that uh, Tan Jiak Kim was apparently transported for his last journey. When I was assigned to the National Museum, I found in the storeroom this dilapidated, broken down thing, and I asked the curators, what is this? Can it be repaired and restored? No. And I said, if you can't, then why are we keeping this pile of broken down furniture? Throw it out. And they said, no, we were not. And they restored it to this state there where it was on display at the uh, new National Museum there. So that was how Tan Jiak Kim made his last journey on this thing there. And of course here in that tradition of the Anglo increasingly Anglophone world, Sir Song Ong Xiang would be the uh, pinnacle of it where he openly declared that he is the King's Chinese. And you see him here in this portrait, very British, and you look at him with his uh, very direct glaze at you, and you see on the table behind him or next to him there, if you look at the book, one of them is the Holy Bible. The one on the table there is his uh, history of the Chinese. Yeah. So this is Song Ong Xiang, the King's Chinese. So we have then, by the turn of the century, two competing Chinese identities, the Straits Chinese British Association on which Tan Jiak Kim was one of the founding members. And you see that there on that side there, uh, that photo there, dedicated to preserving, furthering the interests of those Straits born Chinese, Anglophone Chinese. And on this side here, the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce, the Association of the China Traders then. And you can see the difference in the uh, costumes where their allegiances are. And I think we've seen this photo from Bob Buckland just now about the powerful, very direct pull of China. And so I think this quote here, this very well-known quote that all of us know, heaven is high and the emperor is far away, applies very well to Tan Tok Sing. He was not bothered about the emperor, about being a subject of the great Ming or the great Qing state. But I think by the time of Tan Jiak Kim, Song Long Xiang and Lim Bun King, that emperor had come very close to them with the appointment of Sao Ping Long as the Council General. And as Park Lin has pointed out, the competition, the claim for the loyalties of the strict Chinese, which the British colonial authorities then had to uh, respond to. So the issue then of the reform of the China where the politics of it, and you have here the visits 
of Kang Yuwei and Sun Yat-sen, both bringing the style of politics and reform to Singapore and the response by Lim Boon King, a re Chinese who studied Chinese. I think he also got to the point where he could translate one of the old Chinese classics and he went back to China and for a while was the uh, chancellor, I think, of uh, Xiamen. And the other guy whom we don't hear too much about, uh, Hu Xiong Wan, who actually went back to China and sat for the, one of the final imperial exams and qualified and passed and qualified to be appointed, but he came back to Singapore. And I think he was the one who hosted Kang Yuwei on his uh, visit to Singapore, where Kang Yuwei stayed for several months. Sun Yat-sen, of course, is better known in the Sun Yat-sen Villa, which we have uh, restored to commemorate his visit. And the Pool of China, again, is seen in the uh, support that Tan Ka Ki gave in leading the uh, Singapore China Relief Fund. He and Obun Hall were the key donors to that fund. So in this photo, you see a younger looking Tan Ka Ki with Sun Yat Sun and Obun Hall all decked out with his British decorations there. So that again gives you the uh, conflicting, diverse loyalties, identities of that generation there. And finally, during the occupation for these two communities, they joined the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army. And this is the photo of a, a post-war parade of that Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army that went on to become the uh, militant arm of the Malayan Communist Party in the emergency here. <clears throat> so let me sum up this by saying that uh, for Lee Kuan Yew then, it was, as he said in his memoirs, a shock that he didn't realize until then that there was a whole group of Chinese educated in Chinese schools who did not acknowledge or unaware of the British and the colonial system. And after the war, he was to learn more about them. So I think this line here, I put it in here to indicate that at least for my generation, right through the 1950s, 60s, we were defined by the schools we went to. So whether you went to that school at the top there, and I put it there simply because that was my school. And whether you went to the other school, fundamentally shaped your worldview. And after that, whether you went to this university or you went to that university, consolidated that very different identities here. And in the post-World War II world, all these identities played out in the politics of the era. So here you see the Progressive Party established after World War II and then the uh, SBCA. What to do? Do we take a point of stand and fight? And the then president, T.W. Hinge, T.W. He, sorry, this man then, he blinked and took the SBCA out of politics. We are Chinese, doesn't appeal to the rest of Singaporeans, but not LKY. Lee Kuan Yew was actually prepared to use the SBCA as his first political platform. And when they didn't rise to the occasion, he went off to form the PAP. But the Chinese Chamber of Commerce was prepared to put their money down and form the uh, Democratic Party. And of course, beneath them both was the Malayan Communist Party with the United Front strategy and the mastermind was Yu Chui, who Prof Wang knew very well when he was brought back to work in the East Asia Institute. And so finally, let me conclude by saying that to hear that 
evolving identity, Anglophone Chinese, China Chinese, had to change as Sophie was discussing with the decolonization with independence and how do you manage a plural society of a colonial port city and meld it into a nation state. And Sophie has worked through all the issues with you. Raja Ratnam thought we could all be put into a cooking pot and become a curry. I think by that George Hill, no, 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 no. Those bits of the curry become a smooth curry. You get that little bits. And I think George Hill thought of it more as a plate of rojak or smosh ball here. And as we have discussed also, it all goes back to the bilingual policies, the Speak Mandarin campaign from 1979 onwards that fundamentally has changed our identities in Singapore here. So where are we today? Are we still evolving? I will contend here, hybrid straight Chinese or Pranakan identity, which is responding to the demands of a colonial state, a city state, or a global city. All three demand different demands on their citizens. And all this in a globalizing Southeast Asia, experiencing renewed push and pulls for dominance from China and the US. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kwa, for a highly informative look at what uh, the various factors that went into shaping uh, different Chinese identities here in Singapore. I'd like to now uh, move on to uh, our today's final speaker, uh, Kui Hui Kian, who is Associate Professor of Chinese at the National University of Singapore. Prior to coming to NUS, uh, Professor Kui was Associate Professor in the Department of Historical Studies of the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto, having previously earned her PhD at the University of Leiden. Her research interests include Southeast Asian history, especially the histories of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, colonialism and imperialism, especially Dutch and British, Chinese ethnicity, migration, religion, and transnationalism and entrepreneurial networks, among others. She's the author of uh, a number of articles in these fields, as well as the author of the book, The Political Economy of Java's Northeast Coast, circa 1740 through 1800, Elite Synergy, published by Brill in 2006. The title of her talk today is uh, Racializing Chinese in Southeast Asia, the case of Singapore at the turn of the 20th century. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor Kui Hui Kian. Thank you. Hello, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, uh, Professor Cook, for inviting me to this uh, symposium. So I'll just get straight to the story. I wonder if I have time to talk about everything. But uh, so title of my talk today is uh, Racializing Chinese in Southeast Asia, case of uh, Singapore at the turn of the 20th century. I'll start by talking about the field, state of the field. Uh, here I refer to the field of Chinese overseas, especially um, the Chinese in Southeast Asia, and especially the subfield of uh, history. So in terms of the historical methodology, I think in general, uh, not just the uh, history of the Chinese in uh, Singapore, is that we can see that there's actually quite an insufficient interrogation of the sources. Uh, so if we just think about it, the bulk of the sources that we, historical sources that we use for the period before late 19th century, the whole of Southeast Asia, whether it's relating to the Chinese or not, would be the European sources. Uh, 
And uh, from the late 19th to the around mid uh, 20th century, we are added with sources. I mean, here I'm talking about history before the mid 20th century. Uh, we added some Chinese language sources produced by Chinese diplomats, politicians, and traveling cultural intelligentsia in the form of official records, reports, Chinese newspapers, etc. And also some sources, mainly in European and some local languages, produced by local born, so called local born Chinese and also local people. Uh, last but not least, there will be like very few. Uh, when we are actually talking about the Chinese in Southeast Asia, there are actually very few writings, especially before mid 20th century. Very few of the migrants actually um, write down records and even then it will be the elite members. So I think uh, just now there are a few presentations before this shows this very sufficiently well. Uh, and there's also in terms of the historical me methodology, a tendency of stacking materials mentioning Chinese or Chinese sounding names and also to extrapolate from several cases to it conclude as activities uh, or characteristics of all Chinese. So there's actually an analytic jump if you think about it. The general treatment is that these were unfiltered objective truths about Chinese persons generally in history without much consideration of the authorship. And uh, here, second thing I think with regards to the state of the field is that there are some historical tropes that are very standard when we are looking at the Chinese in Southeast Asia, especially. Uh, so some of these standard tropes uh, are these standard images about the Chinese as colonial intermediaries, uh, Chinese as uh, patriotic Chinese or Ai Guo Hua Chiao, Chinese as so, so somewhat economic animals, uh, you know, like, uh, and, and so of course, among major scholars, the deconstructing of the image of uh, Ai Guo Hua Chiao, overseas Chinese nationalism, has been take, undertaken to some part. So everybody realized that this is more or less a sort of propaganda from China and, you know, yeah, really trying to draw from their uh, subjects. Uh, so, I mean, recognizing the, the so called overseas Chinese as subjects of China is a kind of political move. But there is not really a sort of like, analysis and deconstruction of the image of Chinese as, colon as colonial intermediaries uh, or as, uh, oops, as um, economic animals. And well, I, I can explain why this is the case, but just to say that these are the kinds of historical tropes of the Chinese in Southeast Asia. The third uh, feature of the, in the field of Chinese in Southeast Asia in the field is that, that there is a tendency to preserve race. So ultimately race is kept and promoted. That's what I'm trying to point at. And here I, I especially draw on two major texts, uh, especially uh, by Professor Wang on the Chinese overseas, his 2000 book and also Philip Kuhn 2008. These are synthesis works, but they, they tell you what is uh, generally in the field. That is, um, there's often discussion in these, these texts that uh, reference to Chinese trade, Chinese business. These are all in inverted commas for me. Uh, Chinese capital, uh, discussion of how Chinese uh, encountered violence, massacres, so very famous ones on the Spanish Manila, five to six massacres in the 16th and 17th century. And of course the famous one, Dutch massacre of the Chinese in Batavia in 1740. So, but these are gloss over as Chinese, Chinese sufferings, Chinese exploitation, Chinese massacres, etc., etc. And as well, there are also tendency to subsume different groups, right? Distinct social groups such as uh, Hainanese, Teochew, Cantonese, Hakka, Hokkien, Henghua, you name it. And also, Ranakan versus Totok, so the so-called local Chinese versus the China-born Chinese, the Baba versus the Sinkat. So all these actually quite distinct uh, social differences are uh, kind of put under Chinese racial umbrella and turn into variants of uh, Chinese as their dialects, place of birth, rather than recognition as distinct social groups in their own right. 
And of course, uh, here we can elaborate also further for those who are familiar with Philip Kohn's book, Chinese, Chinese among others, his discussion of the four basic affinities, compatriotism, kinship, co-rituality, brotherhood. Again, as a kind of, as he puts it, Chinese organizational genius, in spite of the very fact, the fact that the very specific membership not open to every Chinese, right? I mean, here, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of examples indicating this. I'll, I'll talk about one example later. And so in the process of these types of history writing, um, you kind of see that uh, these very distinct groups become variants of the same. Very similar to the uh, problem of dialect versus language. When do we call Hokkien a dialect? When do we call it a language? Why is it being called a dialect, right? I mean, these are, these are linguist experts and then we are actually learning from them, but I'm saying that the tendency that we do is subsume these very distinct groups under a, a very broad racial umbrella. And also I think when we do that, we also cut the comparison, the comparative possibilities of very similar dynamics, for instance, what Philip Kuhn talks about in terms of compatriotism, kinship, co-rituality, brotherhood. These are also very similar if we look at other Asian diasporas such as the Chetias, the Sindhuokis, Bugis, and even the Tamil Koli gangs, which were described by Barbara and Daya in her 1978 book on uh, uh, Perak. So by and large in the field, there's a treatment of Chinese as a positivist identity category. And, and that when you actually do that and you uh, generate uh, histories based on this kind of uh, assumption, uh, you, you tend to create a kind of forever Chinese uh, image in, in, in when, you, when you're doing such. And in terms of the historiography of uh, Singapore, specifically relating to the Chinese. I think here we know all the very standard works. Uh, there are a lot of uh, Kao Chokki, Mary Turnbull, Yan Qing Huang, Yong Qing, but a lot of the also many Chinese language works as well has all the above uh, characteristics that there is a lack of interrogation of the sources and the authorship and the intentions of the authors. And also that the three tropes that I mentioned just now about uh, Chinese as colonial, intermediaries as Ai Guo Hua Qiao or as um, a, a, a kind of economic animals uh, tends to be also perpetuated in the, you know, in the works on Singapore history. Of course, this is not, not, not really that much of a problem compared to other, you know, other studies of the Chinese in other Southeast Asian countries when Chinese were minorities because a lot of these images become turned into uh, very negative ones like uh, colonial intermediaries, uh, are they co-colonizers, uh, economic animals, are they economic predators? And these this have been very fruitfully uh, used by colonial regimes against the Chinese at very strategic political timings, as we all know. So I'm just saying, especially for uh, uh, Singapore, Chinese studies, I mean, Chinese um, historiography, the historiography on the Chinese in, in Singapore uh, has this, all these tendencies. And also, I think especially how it's been, uh, been uh, promoted into a kind of forever Chinese image is very clearly done. For instance, there's of course a lot of works on the Bang formation, right? Occupational specialization. And, and this is very particularly ironic since, you know, the biggest riots in Singapore history it's actually not the 1960s racial riots as we know it, right? I mean, it is the intra-racial riots, so to speak, between the Hokkien's and the Teochews in the 1950s. And, and also the, the Tian Fu Gong example that a few presenters were pointing out in the earlier presentations. It's not really, I mean, it's been named a Hokkien temple, but it is really at its point of founding and for a very long time, uh, a coalition of Malacca Babas and wealthy Chinese junk owners, not open to any Hokkien or Chinese as it's being suggested today when it's being referred to as a Hokkien temple. Of course, with decolonization, as we understand, um, Singapore so-called Chinese become citizens 
normal migrants become hyphenated Singaporeans. And as we know it, especially from the works of uh, Nirmala Purushottam in her book in, published in 2000, Negotiating Multiculturalism, um, there's um, certainly especially striking when we compare to other Southeast Asian countries in Singapore, where, where, where race is not spelled out. I mean, they, it, it might be part of the strategy of the government, but in Singapore, it is clearly spelled out in everything that's related to the government. I mean, now you just fill in any form. You want to apply for HDB flat, you know, definitely a race category, your I, I, identity card, a uh, race category. I mean, Namala Furoshodan writes this much better than I, I can speak as well. Uh, defer you to her uh, to her work, and uh, so here, if we think about, I mean, there. Are, uh, before I go into the uh, topic proper, I'll just talk a little bit about the theoretical considerations. All right, which uh, um, that I draw on when I'm doing this rereading on the uh, Chinese, the uh, rereading the sources on the Chinese at the turn of the 20th century. I think there's uh, a lot to draw from, from the Black and Native American histories uh, when they talk about racial capitalism. So very famous writers and activists uh, like uh, Dubois, C.L.R. James, Franz Fanon, and also Native American writers, uh, uh, Anibal Quijano, Jody Bright, they have critiqued Marxist theories for Eurocentrism and omitting the study of race and racism in the analysis of uh, capitalism. And uh, here, especially, they discuss focusing on the Black, especially on the Blacks and Native Americans in the, uh, uh, the New World, so to speak. They argued that race and racism, racialism was the epistemology, ordering principle, organizing structure of modern capitalist domination. And in other words, in, in, the, uh, in their arguments, Racial categorization was used to justify the dehumanization and different labor exploitation of people in different parts of the world since the founding of the, since the birth of the modern world system in the 16th century. I can go on with this, but I'll just uh, cut it sort of there. So in, in, I think a very good quotes will be racialization and colonization have worked simultaneously to other and abject entire people so that they can be enslaved, excluded, removed, and killed in the name of progress and capitalism. Another body of works that I draw on uh, is the discussion on strategic essentialism and subjectlessness among Asian American experts and also comparative literary experts. These are people like Lisa Lowe, Candice Chu, uh, Gayatri Spivak, and here, uh, especially we, uh, to take notes from Lowe, who champions Gayatri Spivak's notion of strategic essentialism, uh, she argues that we, uh, there should be a treatment on the Chinese and Asian America, uh, these are the topics of her study, not as a natural or static category, but a socially constructed unity and a situationally specific position, which is assumed for political reasons. And here, uh, Chu, Candice Chu, uh, rejects Chinese as a positivist identity category, proposing subjectlessness as a conceptual tool to manufacture Asian American and other ethnic identities in varying spatial and temporal contexts. Here, I quote her, uh, if we accept a priori that Asian American studies is subjectlessness, is subjectless, then rather than looking to complete the category of Asian American, to actualize it by such methods as enumerating various components of differences such as gender, class, sexuality, religion, and so on, we are positioned to critique, to critique the effects of the various configurations of power and knowledge through which the term comes to have meaning, all right? And here, I, I think it, what she's suggesting here is that when we are actually doing, uh, how I draw it from her is that we're actually doing the, reading the historical sources instead of treating the, the, the descriptions on Chinese as realities about the Chinese in the source, uh, in history, we should actually ask ourselves, what is it that the author by portraying Chinese in such a way at that time was trying to achieve? 
And last but not least would be a very important scholar in the uh, field on post-colonial studies, colonial post-colonial studies would be Anne Stoller's, uh, many of her, her books are very important, but here I quote especially a 2009 book along the archival grain. And as she has cogently argued, I think documents in the colonial archives were not dead matter that simply accounted the actions or records of what people thought happened. They were an arsenal of sorts that were utilized and reactivated to suit new governing strategies in pursuit of imperial projects from efforts to mold the sub colonial subjects, effective states to the monitoring of the parameters of racial ontologies. However, as we can see, uh, many, many historians, uh, especially in the field of uh, Chinese in Southeast Asia, uh, tend to treat them as unfiltered truths rather than analyze the logic that drive, drove these uh, racial naming and characterization. In any case, I'll be drawing on these theories uh, to look at the corpus on the Chinese in the turn of the 20th century uh, Singapore. I might be running out of time, so here yeah, I'm just going to flash to you four main corpus. I'm, I'm here plundering from my MA thesis, which I wrote 20 years ago, but uh, only this section, right? But just to say uh, that, in fact, there's, uh, especially when we're talking about turn of the 20th century, from here I'm referring especially from the period 1880s until around 1910s. There are four major corpus, which I'm sure all the historians in our group are very, very familiar with. Uh, so firstly, the British colonial archives and their sources. Secondly, uh, the Straits Chinese writings, especially the Straits Chinese magazine, which was published from 1897 to 1907, led especially by Lin Boon King, Song Ong Xiang, and Bellas. And uh, also third major source would be the Qing official source. And this is the time, of course, when Qing starts to realize that this um, overseas uh, so-called Chinese looking people who wears a pigtail, right, can be actually quite rich and uh, resourceful for their Fu uh, Qiang Yun Dong, which is uh, to make China rich and uh, rich and strong. <laughs> okay. And uh, last but not least would be, uh, I, I look very closely at the Chinese newspapers. The oldest one in Singapore is Le Bao. Uh, and this is uh, as, uh, by Chinese cultural intelligentsia who are on their surgeons and especially from the newspaper men. So uh, I, I'm just going to flash a few quotes, but to uh, here are quotes which indicates uh, a draw, draw, drawing from British colonial uh, officials. Very, uh, and first one would be uh, by Crawford, John Crawford, who was the third, second, third, one of those after raffles. <laughs> uh, that the, the Chinese have an intimate knowledge of the markets and uh, a skill in assume, I don't know what that, and laying in their cargoes, they display a rigid economy and give an attention to details they have over and above peculiar advantages in the ports of their country. Some of them such as afford the most favorable materials of uh, commerce with the Indian islands, the uh, European merchant being altogether excluded from. Second one is drawn from uh, Francis Light. He is, of course, the so-called founder, uh, EIC East India Company um, in uh, Penang. And uh, he says the Chinese constitute the most valuable part of our inhabitants. They possess the different traits of carpenters, masons, and smith and uh, traders, shopkeepers and planters, and they employ small vessels and prowls and sand adventures to the surrounding countries. And again, Crawford, I entertain so high an opinion of the industry, skill and capacity of uh, consumption of the Chinese that I consider one China man equal to the value of to the state of two natives of the Coromandel Coast. But this is of course, Southeast India and to uh, four Malays at least. What you basically see from this, uh, you know, there are many quotes that I provide in my uh, uh, if, you, if, if you want further details on discussion. But just based on these few quotes, you can see very clearly that uh, in, in the eyes of the uh, British colonial um, 
masters, uh, the, the, the Chinese were an object of helping them facilitate economy. All right? Here, of course, in this period of time, one major trade was uh, exchanging Indian opium for China's tea, but a lot of the straits produced were very important as supplements to Indian opium as well. And basically, the British colonial regime and the, uh, and the European merchants, especially the British, were relying on the uh, so-called Chinese to help them with uh, gathering the straits produced produce in the uh, archipelago to be brought to China. And so here, uh, economic value was the most important thing, as we can see when, when the British were talking about the, the, the Chinese. Not to say, uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this later. With regards to the Straits Chinese uh, writings, and here I'm referring especially to the writings that we find in the Straits Chinese magazine, which was published from 1897 to 1907, is that these were, uh, 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 I'll just quote here, all right? Uh, uh, no, I'll just say a few backgrounds before I go to the quote. These are basically very wealthy and powerful, well-educated King's Chinese, as uh, uh, Professor Kua puts it, Queen scholars, all right? So in the British eyes, they are the most educated and civilized among the, the, the Chinese. But uh, when you actually go through every article of this uh, Straits Chinese magazine, what you tend to see and it, a conclusion you can draw from is that they felt that they have encountered a kind of colonial glass ceiling. That is, they may be regarded as higher than the natives as the quote of Crawford indicates that one Chinaman is equal to what, four native Malays, etc. But they were uh, always not put under, below the whites. They were, uh, and this is, of course, the classic colonial racial hierarchy. And so if the, the, the way they were write, the, many of the writings that they reflect in Straits Chinese uh, magazine, as well as other individual writings by some of these elite uh, King's Chinese, is they tend to try to talk about themselves as how uh, Chinese heritage, all right, uh, especially uh, Confucianism, has actually higher morality compared to the European uh, Christianity, and as well as how, if, even if they may lose to the Western science, uh, which is of course one of the major things in the uh, justifying the European colonial hierarchy, they, they, they would justify that if we don't have as good Western science, we can learn it, and uh, definitely our Confucianism puts us on a higher moral scale compared to the, to the European. So the long and short of it is how they actually try to prop themselves uh, to be the eligible leaders of the, uh, 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 of the uh, uh, colonial regime, meaning that they don't want to be put under the white people in the colonial administration. And so here I quote, the Straits Chinese people have a great future before them. Under the auspices of the British government, they may confidently aspire to be the most useful and most important positions in the empire if they will prepare themselves for the positions which they hope to fill. Uh, let us never forget that we are the descendants of a great people. If we do, then surely there will be no hope for us uh, if we pay no heed to them. Uh, we, will all, we shall always be an important element in the population of these islands. And, and let us not look, look around and see how the descendants of some civilized nations, by here that he means the Europeans, oops, uh, and that they have succumbed to the effects of the tropical environment. Okay, I can discuss further, but time is running out. So I'm just going to, uh, uh, I mean, here is a discussion on the, how the Qing officials, especially when they are writing about the Chinese, what is it that they are aiming for? Here, we have very good discussions uh, indicating that they turn Chinese into Hua Qiao uh, as sojourners of over, temporary sojourners overseas, basically reclaim them as part of the Chinese nation, and ultimately trying to urge them to uh, contribute, donate, invest in the, to enable China to become strong and, and uh, able to compete against uh, the West. And also, uh, this is from the Le Pao one. Uh, again, I, I shall not elaborate further. What I do want to talk a little bit further about before time runs out is to talk about how uh, that 
when we actually analyze these four corpus of works, which are the standard works of, uh, on the Chinese in Singapore at the turn of the 20th century, what we basically see is that every one of them talk about Chinese as a collective, and all of them has a certain aim. I mean, it wasn't just uh, objectively or you know, purely recording, but they were recording for a certain interests that fits their own uh, objectives and aims, whether it is, like I said, straight Chinese to prop themselves as potential leaders in, the, in a decolonized world or the Qing regime trying to get them to uh, invest more in, in China. And what, when we coming to this topic on the race crop is that what uh, we basically see that it is not really so much uh, objective description of the past, but these racialized narratives of the Chinese in Singapore and Southeast Asia more generally, uh, they did not just remain a kind of interest among academics and professional historians having debates in such symposiums, but there are also active sponsorship by the current PRC state and the Singapore state. Just very quickly, one very, uh, uh, the PRC state is now actively circulating these historical narratives of the Chinese as uh, colonial intermediaries, Ai Guo Hua Chiao, economic animals, and a kind of, a sense of the uh, Chinese overseas as a kind of forever cultural Chinese. And it was really towards supporting its current uh, capitalist interests in the Asia Pacific today to promote a kind of Hua Chiao Hua Ren trope or narrative and uh, ultimately trying to draw them to, to argue that now China may not be the political motherland of this Chinese overseas of this Hua Chiao Hua Ren, but they will forever be the cultural motherland. So please continue to invest and contribute and donate whatever you do. Uh, but what two very important recent projects that they are engaging in, uh, uh, touching on history, is the Xia Nanyang um, historical documentary, which was produced and released uh, in 2013. And uh, another one would be uh, Long Deng Gao's uh, Hua Chiao Hua Ren Shi Hua Xilie. Uh, and uh, actually, I can't see the time. <laughs> but, uh, so it's just to say that there is a uh, uh, a very vested interest by contemporary political interests, political economic interests to continue propping these types of historical narratives of uh, unified Chinese. As for the uh, Singapore state, I think it's, uh, this, this is uh, very common already for many, many people, but I'll just state a few things for the record. 1983 Institute of uh, East Asian Philosophy, now EAI, but it's reminiscent, as many scholars have argued, of Lim Boon King's uh, and Straits Chinese Confucianism, promotion of the Confucianism project, trying to uh, basically jump on the Chinese economic bandwagon, especially after 1978. And also, of course, uh, starting from 1990s, Singapore state, very active promotion of the Wan Qing Yuan. I think Huang Zhenli uh, wrote a an article on that, but just uh, really drawing to that period of Singapore history, talking about the Chinese, how they actually con has much contribution to modern China, uh, etc. And of course, one of the tenets of the founding history of Singapore is the vulnerability and how the Chinese, uh, Singapore as a Chinese island was surrounded by this Islamic Muslim archipelago. Uh, really, you know, Malaysia and Indonesia's cases are often the boogeyman to tell Chinese to remain within the group, you know, very much like Night Shalaman, the village. But uh, I'm going, I, I just say, please refer to Lili, Lili, Lili Zubaida Rahim's uh, 2009 book on the Singapore in the Malay world, how Singapore state or often treat itself with a regional outs outsider complex and always playing up the racialization uh, as a form of divide and rule. And um, here, I, I do want to end, do I have one more minute? No. Oh, okay. So I'll just end here. But I, I think what I want to talk about is that there are actually, if we talk, think about race craft, and this is not my terminology, but term, terminology by um, uh, Black, his, Black uh, American Studies 
um, experts as Barbara Fields and Karen Fields, that if race crop is about making race a commonsensical um, object a, a, into a kind of natural category, uh, then it is necessary to explore how it becomes, how such racial, racialized imagining, imaginings are crafted into the common sense and how they can, uh, here we are here looking at three layers, multiple layers of racialization and in multiple temporalities, uh, whether it's by uh, the moment of the turn of the 20th century historic players, whether it's by historians themselves, and how it's uh, being played up again by contemporary powerful state interests is something we need to explore. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Quay, for another uh, highly informative and highly nuanced uh, uh, examination of issues pertaining to Chinese identities in, here in Singapore. Um, I'll invite you, you and also Professor Kwa back up to the stage now for uh, some Q&A. Uh, any questions from the live audience? Or should we start then with, when, with the, uh, the Zoom question? Uh, yeah, so there's a question from Shirin Chua. Uh, how did the difference in identity between Chinese Peranakans and the Sinke uh, Chinese-born Chinese develop? It doesn't seem to consistently be class or about straits versus foreign birth because there weren't many Chinese families who stayed in Singapore for generations. So yeah, she's basically asking about the difference in identity between these two groups. Who's, who's, who's been the question being directed to? Uh, to both professors. Okay. Yeah. Did you, you need that repeated again? Or? I, I, don't, I don't think uh, I got all of it. So you want to repeat it one more time? Sorry. Yeah, so uh, how did the difference in identity between the Chinese Peranakans and the Sinke Chinese develop? Well, here again, I invite my other co-panelists earlier today to jump in, but my understanding is that the uh, Sinke newcomer is a terminology from the 1840s onwards when you got these new wave of migrants coming in as uh, fully contract laborers. And that was how they were labeled by the old established Malaccan Chinese uh, community. So it was literally an othering of by the Malaccan Chinese of the other. But I don't know here, I mean, maybe Buckley, you want to say something or not? About sink cakes. Uh, actually, as I know, this is a differentiate between the local born Chinese and the newcomer from China. Uh, because they think that the local born Chinese is street born Chinese, they find that they are more or less is a high class people because they, they are King's Chinese. And those in case basically they are Kuri and, and then they come here to work. Uh, this is, I think it's only the terminology. This, I don't know whether Professor Kwai agree with me. If I understand that question correctly, the distinction between the two, am I right? Yes, so that is the distinction that the old Malaccan Chinese wanted to maintain their difference, their identity, and that you are all newcomers. Um, I don't know whether my other co-panelists early in the day would want to say something more than that distinction. The issue here being today, of course, whether from our point of view, the recent mi uh, visitors, migrants from China can also be considered a new wave of Sinke. I think Prof Wang, you are alluding or hinting at that. 
Thank you. I, I'm not sure whether the term Xinke was actually first used by the Straits Chinese or by the Baba. It could have been because there were also other Chinese here who were not from the Baba Malacca groups who came from the Riaolinga or in, from Borneo, from Java and so on, who were here. So I, I don't know who started using the phrase, but I think it, you're correct to say that it, it described primarily those people who came after the 1840s and mostly were working class people. But, but it, it doesn't necessarily apply just to the Baba Malacca a Pranakan to, to, to search them, because there were other Chinese who were also doing quite well, who came from other parts of uh, Southeast Asia, who also thought these newcomers were, were definitely of a lower class, and they, they did not know how to behave, and they had to be treated very differently. I think that that was the overall impression. But who exactly used the phrase first, I haven't been able to determine. Uh, Professor Kui, do you have anything to add to that? Or okay, um, more questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Kui. So uh, thank you so much for um, bringing in these uh, critical, fresh um, perspectives on the um, Chinese race, quote unquote. Um, so with regards to the um, racializing project. Um, where would you situate the, um, the early ethnographic and anthropologic texts? So, um, you know, by the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, those uh, um, uh, Western colonialist scholars began to compose those texts in, uh, in more and more abundance on uh, all the ethnicities that they encounter. And uh, I, for me, um, they somehow represent the earliest attempts to deconstruct and um, break apart, or at least to challenge these um, uh, racialized categories um, that, um, that um, you, you, you presented about, right? That, um, that were uh, perpetuating these, um, these boundaries. So um, well, they are for sure still um, in continuity with the uh, rest of the colonial texts uh, in reinforcing and constructing racial categories. Um, yet, um, I, I would say oftentimes they were written for a more humanitarian um, cause than what Stoller said um, in the quote that, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an arsenal, a, a storage of weapons, right? So uh, would you consider those threads of thoughts, um, you know, the early uh, ethnographies and anthropological texts as perpetuating the a racializing project, or would you situate it as something um, um, other than that? Thank you. I suppose you are referring to the horot. Uh, yeah, would you? Would you? Is that what you are thinking, or um, if you have yes. a specific text uh, in mind? Yeah, I guess uh, another question would be since I. I I'm more familiar with those texts about other parts of Southeast Asia than, you know, British um, Malaya and Straits, uh, Straits colonies, I guess. Um, the other question will be, um, have you encountered many texts like that about this part of Southeast Asia as compared to like the Holt and, and, and the Dutch, um, you know, schools? Okay, perhaps first things first is that when we, when, at least when I think, even when, whether I'm talking about racialization project or whether Anne Stoller is talking about um, this um, racialization project, uh, it's not necessary with reference to uh, self-professed uh, ethnographic texts. I mean, a lot of uh, what we know very much about uh, history, uh, they are written by colonial officials who are, who are not necessarily, I mean, they were usually trying to fight for some of their uh, policies, like uh, the Croat was certainly trying to stop the Dutch regime from abolishing the Kongsi system, right? And, but the, the text that I use, uh, which is very similar, uh, I mean, going along very similar lines will be written by people like um, in, in the context of uh, Singapore history, since this is a symposium on, on, on Singapore. I mean, we can talk more about Southeast Asia later. It's J.D. Vaughan, 
who was actually a police inspector in Penang. Uh, and then he, because he comes across so many uh, so-called Chinese subjects, he start to record about their burial customs, their marriage customs and things like that on the site. And then also, of course, Pickering, W.A. Pickering, again, many scholars in, in, in this room would be very familiar with. He's the first Chinese, so-called Chinese protector in um, the British, in British Singapore. Uh, and he was really, when you, when you analyze what he was writing about the Chinese, he, he was really, uh, and, and aiming, especially at the so-called secret societies, he was really aiming to appeal to the colonial uh, the, uh, government in the metropole to give money in order for him to set up a Chinese protectorate. And he became the first Chinese protector. Oh, never mind the, the politics behind, but just to say that these are uh, uh, texts which were not necessarily written by uh, ethnographers, but they are really written to promote certain policies on the side. And, and, and sometimes they are just, but. The, the thing that we should be looking at is how these become transformed into standard historical documents to talk about the so-called Chinese in Singapore at, in the late 19th century. Right? And this is where I'm aiming at. Like how is, are these writings, if we analyze them in their own right, uh, these are political documents, become turned into uh, unproblematic objective descriptions of Chinese in the past. All right, so, so I hope it answers your question. I don't think it does, but just. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ashley, do you have another question for us from the online audience? Uh, yeah, so this question is asked by Gyok Kun Pue to any of the panelists. Uh, to what extent does the religion of Islam, it being the predominant religion of the majority of the population in the Malay archipelago and the current trend of is Islamization in the region, influence the Chinese ethnic and cultural identity in Singapore today? Uh, so to what extent does Islam, being the predominant religion of the majority of the population in the Malay archipelago, influence the Chinese cultural and ethnic identity in Singapore today? Muslims and Islam versus Chinese? Uh, Islam has affected Chinese identities in Singapore. Um, I mean, your, your mark is very difficult to understand, sorry. Okay, do you want to? Okay. Uh, I suppose to the, to, the, to the person who asked the question, I think, I think it's a long-standing, um, I wouldn't call it myth, but it would be uh, something that in Singapore, we keep telling ourselves uh, that uh, we are surrounded, we are a Chinese island surrounded by, uh, you know, Muslim archipelago, and so we must uh, uh, enhance the vulnerability. Of course, these are state narratives which are drummed into us from the time we attend school and, and you know talking about the vulnerability of Singapore, the smallness, the fact that it's Chinese. And, and I'm here, uh, what I'm actually trying to appeal uh, when I'm doing this talk is really to say, in the first place, we should consider how, uh, how, uh, how, how is racialization taking place in Singapore? How are certain myths of, uh, or maybe not myths, but imaginings of threat being imagined in, in Singapore, how do we come to think of these as commonsensical knowledge? Is, is, is there truth to this or, or is, is it? I mean, yeah, we always like to point how Malaysia is much bigger, how Indonesia is much bigger. But the fact is that uh, in terms of militarization, we are the best. I mean, we supply arms to Burma, we supply, we, we have some of the top most best, I think probably Professor Kua can talk about this even better. Uh, we have very good uh, military, what do you call it, R&D, uh, which we test out in South Africa and other Australia, is it trapped, other places. So really, where's the threat here besides confrontation lasting for two years uh, and, and after that separation from Malaysia? Seems that for all these years, more than 50 years, uh, we certainly didn't see any possible threat uh, that any of our Islamic neighbors is going to uh, 
actually will against us, but it's something we keep telling ourselves, which is why I, just now I talk about Night Sha 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 Malan's um, wonderful film, The Village. I don't know if everybody has watched it, but I love the movie. <laughs> you know, basically thinking that we are threatened by an imagined enemy and keeping the people in inside the village. So I'm just uh, really turning the question back to the one who's asking question, how is it that you think that Islam is a threat to Singapore uh, just because we are supposedly majoritarian Chinese? Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure it was, it was posed as necessarily a threat to Singapore, but rather, rather just in terms of general influence, if I understood the question correctly with it. Um, but I don't, does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Uh, or should we move on to the next question? Oh, yeah, Professor, Professor Kwa. Let me add here to say that all these statements have to be put in their historical context. So whether Islam, Malays were or are a threat, have to be seen in what point of time, who said what, for what reason. So if you put it in the context of 1965, yes, it's quite clear that at that point of time, Lee Kuan Yew did see a threat from the surrounding countries. Malaysia, Indonesia was confronting Malaysia. We had Indonesian saboteurs in Singapore. So that memory there is fixed in the, founding, in the memories of our founding fathers. And then again, how that memory of that threat then evolves. So I think here, in that historical context, you have to follow how that initial event is then remembered and transformed over time. It's very easy from today, or oh, LKY was making it up uh, to defend uh, the hegemony of the PAP party. You can say that, but in the postmodern language, this is crypto normativism, I would say. Uh, Professor Kwa? Uh, this question is for both uh, to respond. Uh, in 1900, when the Boxing uprising happened in China, and there's a local born Singapore Chinese uh, who tried to appear to the street born Chinese, you know, uh, to to organize a volunteer troop, go back to China, helping British to fight against China. 40 years later, when China was invaded by Japan and Tan Ka Ken also gathered the whole Southeast Asia China, Chinese to help China to fight against Japanese. These are the two different identities and two different uh, historical events. So I just want to see your view and whether such thing will repeat again no, in, in future history. Well, Baklin, the answer, of course, is the future is very difficult to foresee. So here, it's speculative. We, yes, certainly, how those memories of being asked to support the motherland, whether in 1937 by Tan Kaki or earlier, you know, uh, will depend on who's the leader in China who's making those appeals or who in Singapore is suggesting that. So it's very easy to say that in today's situation, yes, you can read, you can read Xi Jinping's appeal, watch out, come back home to support the motherland as in line with that earlier appeals to support the of Tan Ka Ki. Yeah. Whether we respond, again, depends on how we read that here. So here, if you look at the record, there is that action reaction, there is that how we respond. So I think the challenge for the policy maker here is Singapore is that as for the British government, what is our position? What does the Singapore government respond when Xi Jinping makes that direct appeal? Who in Singapore is responding to that appeal? That's a policy issue here. 
Well, I, I will refrain from using we, we, we all the time. <laughs> I say no. I, I, I totally agree with uh, um, Professor Kwa on the point of. Uh, you have identity for web series. You can even on behalf of identity as Singaporean is a bit sort Yeah, yeah. Well, well uh, our understanding of being a Singaporean might differ. <laughs> but anyway, just to, uh, to say, I mean, it's very good that. Professor Kuo brings in on uh, Xi Jinping, and if Xi Jinping now says that okay, Hua Jia Huaren, please uh, donate and save China or whatever, you know, and and Professor Kuo I think rightly points out that how is it that we are going to respond, right? I, I, and 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 that he also suggests that the response will be probably very different from what happens uh, maybe in 1937 when Tan Kaki make similar appeal. I I would, I would, uh, I would urge us to consider that maybe what we are thinking now, we, is very similar to what the Chinese in the 1930s are also thinking, the so-called Chinese, in, 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 whether in Singapore or in Southeast Asia, when Tan Kaki made the appeal. I mean, Tan Kaki being Tan Kaki, I mean, if you go and read Tan Kaki's memo, as you will see, he talks about a lot of pains about how he tried to unite the Chinese, right? Trying to get them to donate. Nobody wants to donate. They only donate this. So I would really strongly encourage you to go pick up uh, his memoirs and see the pains he had to go to. Of course, nowadays we tend to gloss it over and say that, wow, that was the peak of the overseas Chinese nationalism. But I really wonder because we simply don't know what people are thinking. So even if they go back and become Hua Chiao Ji Gong, what was it that they are thinking? We assume that they are patriotic, but what is it they are thinking? Maybe they want adventure. When they donate money, maybe they think that they are just saving Fujian, their village, rather than the whole of China. So I'm more of that sort who uh, likes to imagine that maybe we are just assuming too much when we think and assume that simply because Tan Kaki uh, obtain several millions of US dollars equivalent at that time. That means that Chinese in Southeast Asia at that time were patriotic to China. I mean, I would definitely put a big question mark and, and say, uh, how do we know what they are thinking? How do we derive and think that we know what they are thinking? It's just like how we would, I mean, now Xi Jinping may appeal, some Chinese may go back. I mean, very similar 2008 when the Beijing Olympic happened. There are also many uh, advertisements on how uh, there are many Chinese uh, overseas, especially those in Southeast Asia, you know, uh, paid one or two million dollars just to hold the Olympic torch. And, and does this hence equate to Hua Jiao Hua Ren continuing patriotism? Or maybe something else. Uh, they just want to tell their friends that, hey, I hold the Olympic torch. <laughs> but if we make the analytic jump and say, hence they are, patriotic to China, even when they are Indonesian citizens, then I think we are actually uh, over-assuming. I would say here, this is where it is the challenge of being a historian. To put in context what the subject you are studying, Tan Kah Ki, has said, it is there in writing, it is indisputable. What you today are reading interpreting Tan Kaki. You've got to put it as it is. My reading today of what he said. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, another generation might have a very different reading of what Tan Kaki intended. 10 years ago, Tan Lak had a very different reading of what Tan Kaki said. So our readings of what those who went before us will change. And that's what being a historian is about. Putting in context, what your actor, your studying said, and this is my interpretation at this point of time, in my context, I interpret it to be saying, and I accept that it's different from what my predecessor said and what those who come after me will say. Well, we, we in the audience here have time for um, one or maybe two more questions. So let's take one from online. Okay, this question is asked by Jun Hong to both of the panelists. Uh, what is the role of Southern dialects, for example, Hokkien and Teochew, in defining Singaporean identity in the future? And is there value in preserving these dialects amongst the younger generation? And will the imminent loss of dialects represent a major shift in the Singaporean Chinese identity? 
a, a, a sort of a repeat question from earlier, but it, we can get a couple of new views on, on this issue. Professor Kwa? I think Zoe, you have really dealt with that question just now about the future of dialect in determining Singapore's identity already. It's a question that our previous speaker is best qualified and has said, and whether you have to say more in response to this. Okay, let's let's go with one more question then. If you have, uh, I don't think there are any more questions. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, oh well, let me. Is it Claudine back there? Let's go. Go ahead, and uh, uh, we'll get one from Claudine, and we'll see if we have more time for more. I uh, I have a perhaps slightly provocative question for Professor Kui. Um, what did do you think a Chinese would ever stop being Chinese? Uh, I ask this because you are precisely, you know, questioning the category of Chinese itself, right? And we often look at that very, with sort of racial, ethnic, ambiguous uh, traits, but you're looking very much at the power structures behind the construction of the category. So would a rejection of those power structures suggest its dissolution of the category? That's a wonderful question. And, and of course, you are absolutely right to point out that, in fact, uh, I'm only dealing with the larger power structures. Uh, and, and there are, I think if we, if we look, uh, and of course, I can get away with this because we are dealing with turn of the 20th century, right? I mean, there's not really much other sources we could, we could draw on. But I think one thing that we, just from snippets of uh, historical materials that um, here I'm especially thinking of Wang Da Hai, Hai Dao Yi Zhi, which was written about Java in the 1780s, and also Gong, Gong An Bu, which is the Bada Wei of Gong An Bu. The Jakarta, the today's Jakarta Batavia Chinese Council, we have records of what, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, common everyday so-called Chinese people were encountering within the um, Chinese council or the under the administration of the Chinese Kapitan uh, in, Chica in Batavia during the late 18th, 19th century until the early 20th century. And I think based on these very snippets, right, of uh, historical documents that happen to uh, <laughs> be preserved, uh, what we do know is, is this is certainly not just you know, I'm here, I'm especially uh, bringing attention to uh, imperial structures like European imperialism and even um, Chinese uh, imperial state trying to appeal to the Chinese who are, who are overseas and also some of the elite groups of Chinese, uh, meaning the Le Bao or the cultural intelligentsia as well as the Straits Chinese were basically very, very educated elite few amongst uh, uh, local born Chinese. But if we actually look at many of these sources, we see that there's also this intra-Chinese, for me, a kind of patrilineal male control, trying to assert also a certain Tang Ren identity, a certain, uh, I wouldn't just translate it as Chinese, but there is a, also definitely intra-group tendency to try to impose a certain identity as a form of social control over the lesser groups, the, the, whether it's the lower economic class or whether it's the, the females in the group, you know. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that this is probably why uh, when we compare the studies of the Chinese in Southeast Asia, I mean, the Chinese overseas is a very huge study, right? But when I am looking through the literature, I, I feel that those who are in, uh, who are working on the Chinese in America has gone far ahead. I mean, Lisa Low, um, Candice Chu, these are people who work on Chinese American literature. And they have gone far ahead to propose that, let's just see that this Chinese category is the imagined category. Something that has long been done by cultural studies experts like Stuart Hall, like all the Dubois, these people that I'm talking about, and, and probably because they were the most discriminated against group, uh, social group in, in the entire human history. But 
I, I would say uh, the experts in the Chinese American field has fared much better than us, uh, than <laughs> us. Here I use us, all right, as in the, the histor historical experts in, in Southeast Asia who are dealing with the subject of Chinese. We are still trapped very much on the Chinese as a positivist identity category. And I'm really trying to propose that is there any way, right, that we can think of getting out of this box and try to look at the dynamics, power dynamics, you know, whether it's from the colonial state or whether it's from the Qing state whether it's from internal, like these straight Chinese groups, as well as the Le Bao group, or even day-to-day uh, -day groups, like uh, we see in the case of the Batavia Capitan, how they try to exert patrilineal control over female bodies in uh, 18th century, 19th century Batavia. But we can have a longer conversation after this. I, I just think that this, this is probably why Chinese category can, cannot really be displaced in uh, Southeast Asian Chinese studies. We'll probably have to end the, uh, uh, this panel at, at this point. A um, couple of things before we close today. First, let me thank once again, uh, Professor Kwa and, and Professor Kui for uh, their talks and for a very lively discussion. Um, so one, one more round of applause. <laughs> And um, uh, before we depart, though, I'd like to uh, thank, uh, say thanks to a few of the people that helped to put the symposium together uh, very quickly, if I, if I may. Let me first start by thanking everyone in the arts team uh, for managing all the logistics in the performance hall and ensuring that everything ran smoothly today. Next, let me thank uh, the student assistants, uh, Amberly, Ashley, Xiti, Jin Hong, Hongjin, and Song Han for all their help especially with the Q&A sessions for both the in-person and online audience. Uh, let me also thank uh, Rachel, Jen, and Nahyan in the development office for their assistance in promoting the event. Um, thanks to Jolene in the faculty affairs office for all her help with uh, uh, making things run smoothly today. And um, finally, three people in particular, I think uh, deserve special thanks, uh, Kevin Lowe and Ali Rosales on the events team, and uh, Jade Co from the faculty affairs office, all three put in a tremendous amount of time and effort and to, to ensure that all of the logistical and technical details were met for what proved to be, I think, a relatively uh, complicated hybrid event. Um, but uh, with their help, we were able to make everything today run, uh, I think, quite smoothly. And so they, they all deserve a well-earned uh, round of applause as well. Um, so. <laughs> Finally, thank you. Our, uh, both our in-person and online audience for coming out today to listen. And of course, I want to thank our seven speakers, uh, Professor Wang Gongwu and, and everyone else who, who each spared their invaluable time to come out here today uh, to share their uh, learning and wisdom with the rest of us. And so with that, uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, so long and see you next time.